Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, athletes, spectators, and coaches. Welcome to day three of the San Diego Crew Classic here on beautiful Mission Bay, Crown Point Shores. Today we are going to see a day of finals and petite level finals in all categories, masters, collegiate, and juniors. Sure to be an amazing day of racing. But first, will you please rise for the national anthem? All right, good morning, everybody. We have the kickoff of our first race here. That is the Women's Masters B8. That is ages 36 to 42. And I would like to set lanes for you here. In lane one on the shore here, we have Texas Rowing Center. Lane two, we have Vancouver. Lane three, Long Beach, Newport Sea Base Rowing, a little uh, community rowing there up in Long Beach. Lane four will be Endeavor Racing Alliance, coxed by Leslie Wright there. Lane five, College Club, Seattle Lake, Washington. Lane six, Boulder, and lane seven, Bayak. Now, I think this is gonna be quite a fun race here. What do you think? Oh yeah, I mean, these the, the quality of the rowing is going to be excellent, but what we are really looking at with this Masters category is the athletes in the boat. We have a wide cross section of Masters athletes that have picked up the sport later in life, but then we've got some Olympians peppered in there. I know one who will be back here later on on the mic with me who may or may not be in lane four right now. Um, but yeah, the quality of the athletes and the, you know, the number of, um, of 
high quality athletes <laughs> is is pretty astounding at the masters level these days Absolutely. And this B category is always a really fun category because like you said, there is a huge mix of people that come into it a little bit later, but also people that are kind of either getting back into rowing or have been rowing for a long time, but don't necessarily have a particular place or club that they want to go. So they start kind of rowing with friends and local clubs again and are really getting back into it, but have a lot of previous experience. All right, so little placement update from the course. In the first place position, we are going to look right down into that center lane. It was lane four, Endeavor Racing Alliance. They look to have about a five-seat advantage over lane one. That's Texas Rowing Center. Last year, Texas was the winner of this event, but they are just a little bit behind that Endeavor Racing Alliance, that first place boat. Just behind Texas, it will be... Lane five, that's College Club Seattle, Lake Washington. A lot of these boats are composite boats. It's a group of friends that have decided to get together to race here at San Diego, and sometimes it's a mix of clubs. And then, again, remember that we do have these handicaps to factor in. So once the boats cross the line, those are factored in, and then you'll get your final results. In the fourth place spot, we're going to move out to lane seven. That's Bayak, Bayak, a Bay Area uh, club right around the port of Redwood City over near where Stanford is they're in the fourth place position in fifth it's going to be Boulder and then and then moving on to the inside it will be Long Beach Newport sea base rowing again another one of those composite boats and then in the seventh place spot it will be Vancouver we'll come back in just a second with an update from the course This is a great race here coming out of lane four, Endeavor Racing Alliance. They are holding off the charge from Texas Rowing Center. Texas wanting to defend and keep that trophy when they head back to Austin. But Endeavor doing a nice job just holding a little bit ahead of Texas as we come into the halfway point. So we'll keep following those two crews as they come down the course. College Club Seattle, Lake Washington still in the third place position. Now, the fun thing, too, about some of, these, um, some of these handicaps when it comes to masters is you have to be really strategic about some of the ages that you are actually putting in your boat because it does make a difference how much time uh, you actually get sort of added on or knocked off you know, to, your, to your time when you were doing this. And there are um, a, a few different ways that they actually do handicaps as well. They used to actually keep you at the starting line for a certain number of seconds. And I don't know about you, but I've had races myself where I've had to sit on the starting line for about 90 seconds after some of these other crews have started. And that you have to go right. chase them down. I completely forgot about that back in, back in the, the early days of Masters Racing. That's right. They used to start you actually at your handicap. So it could be 90 seconds behind that first place boat. And then you had to play catch up. So a little bit of a different strategy. But here it's much more of a mental piece, right? Because if you know that you've got 20 seconds to make up on another crew, well, that has to be factored in. So that's that interesting intrinsic motivation and definitely the information coming from the coxswain. But right now I am going to give that advantage to the lead position back to Texas Rowing Center. Texas looks like they have about a five to six seat advantage over Endeavor. As we come into the shoreline past that second bridge, they are just coming across their last 500. So we'll look for them along the shoreline. But it does look like now open water for Texas coming into these final strokes.
All right, and as they come into view in the spectator area it is Texas Rowing Center walking away from Endeavor. Endeavor in the second place position, but very close by College Club Seattle, Lake Washington there in lane five. And in the fourth place spot, it will continue to be Bayak, followed by Boulder, and then Long Beach, Newport, Sea Base, Vancouver in the seven, seventh place position. A lot of spread here between these crews. Again, a lot of different levels of experience. We've got Olympic athletes peppered in with masters athletes that may have an athletic background, but maybe taken up rowing later in life. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this water is absolutely spectacular. We have pretty much a dead tide right now, but as these boats are coming in, like, look at this. It looks like they're actually catching up a little bit. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Beautiful rowing here by Texas Rowing Center for the win. <laughs> Endeavor Racing. Holding the lead for the first half, but then watching that shrink as Texas just took that lead and walked away. College Club Seattle doing a really nice job here in the third place spot. And now here comes Bayak. Bayak crossing now. And now Boulder. And then here comes Long Beach, Newport, Sea Base, and Vancouver. So Vancouver overtaking Long Beach, Newport for that sixth place position. A little bit of a switch up. And Long Beach, Newport in seventh. All right, we have race number two underway. That is the Men's Masters B8, the President's Trophy Final. Um, this is kind of a cool race. We have a lot of neat athletes in, uh, in this race. In lane one here, we have San Diego Rowing Club. In lane two, Club Nautico de San Juan, which is a little bit of a composite crew here, but a lot of talent in these two boats. So it is a duel, but we also have a slack tide, perfect conditions, I mean, look at this. Look at this water. I, as a coxswain, I could not be happier about what is happening on the water here. I would be excited to race right now and oh, look at these two boats. It's I mean the best of the best. This is why we come to the Crew Classic, right, is to see this glassy water. And look at this race. These two crews side by side. This is a duel. And the mentality is a little bit different than an eight-boat race, right? So racing a duel side by side. These two crews, obviously, very well matched. Absolutely, and you know why? Because there's a lot of talent in both of these lineups. I have to say we are stroked here uh, by Tom Peshek, who has a lot of national team experience. Um, also in that boat in the four seat, uh, Shane Farmer of Dark Horse Rowing. Some of you YouTubers may know him. Um, who else do we have here? I mean, look at this. Club Nautico de, um, de San Juan. Sorry, that one's a little bit of a tongue twister there. In the seven seat, Johan Kui, who I actually coxed back in 2007, 2008 at Penn AC. He's been around a long time, a lot of experience there. Um, sitting right behind him, Matt Wheeler, lots of national team experience. Taylor Brown in there in the three seat. I mean, the list goes on and on. So a lot of national team guys, guys with high levels of experience, and then just buddies, you know, guys that have stayed in shape. They're from their college crews, high school crews, and, you know, they, they probably stay motivated throughout the year knowing that they're going to be here on the shores of Mission Bay racing as hard as they can for pride and for friendship. And just past 750 meters, it is Club Nautico de San Juan that has the lead full boat length for them. It's about a stern advantage for Club Nautico over San Diego Rowing Club. And this is a race for a trophy. This is the President's Trophy in the Men's Masters B8. 
it's important to recognize the leadership of the Crew Classic, and that's what this trophy is named for. It is the effective leadership enabling the Crew Classic to continue to progress into its 50th year. So this trophy was commissioned to honor the leadership and service of the presidents of the Crew Classic. Now, it looks like we still have contact here as we're going to come into the last 500 or so. Uh, about a stern, it looks like. And you know what? These races are always really exciting as a coxswain, but also a little bit stressful because you're battling. Um, you know, oh, it looks like. Actually, we do, uh, with our new picture here, we have a little bit of open water. So it looks like San Diego is going to have to make a little bit of a push. They haven't totally lost it yet. They're not out of it, but they are going to have to make a move pretty soon because they are running out of water as Club Nautico starts to kind of walk away with it, and that coxswain is probably going to be looking back and telling her crew, like, you guys can see him. You guys can see him start to walk away, and these duels can get pretty exciting at the finish here. And you can see that crew start to wind up both boats moving into their higher stroke rate sequences for that sprint. So again, rowing is so difficult, this 2,000 meter length. You sprint at the beginning, and then you sprint at the end. Physiologically, just such a high demand on the body. And you're really seeing that come into play here, that Club Nautica boat, they're looking pretty sharp. You know, I was going to say the same thing, too. And you know that when these crews make rowing look easy, that you know that they're very experienced and they're yep. really, they're working very hard, but they make it look so easy. Yeah, and San Diego as well, just a super sharp, good blade work, lots of swing, just maybe a little bit more horsepower coming out of that Club Nautico boat. So as we come into the final strokes here, it will be that composite boat Club Nautico de San Juan. Sounds like they're from Puerto Rico. I don't think they train in Puerto Rico. I don't think they are. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll leave that as a mystery. But they are the ones that will be bringing home that President's Trophy. Well done. And our next race coming up is the Women's Masters C8. That is ages 43 to 49. Uh, let me set the lanes for you here. I think we have a pretty good lineup here. Seven lanes across. In lane one, we have Long Beach. Lane two, Texas Rowing Center again. Lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane four, Zlack and Capital. Lane five, Sac Willamette. Uh, Salem Lake, Oswego, Community Rowing. Ooh, that is a tongue twister. We have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, clubs involved in that, that one. That's a composite boat there. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Lane 6, Sammamish Rowing Association, and Lane 7, Pacific. And this is a trophy race as well. This is the Margie Fetter Graham Trophy. Margie was an athlete that competed on the junior national team and went on to become the captain of Stanford's women's crew. During her senior year, she was selected as the Outstanding Oarsman of the Year at Stanford, and her parents commissioned this trophy in her honor. So really quite some stories behind these trophies. 
and I hope that a lot of the athletes appreciate the stories that go into uh, the memories that they take with them. So getting ready for the Women's Masters C8, again, ages 43 through 49. We've got some amazing firepower and, again, another great display of athleticism. Sure to come down. And here we go. We've got to start. All right, and as we are watching the first couple strokes here of this Women's Masters C8 race, it is clear lane one is got a lot of firepower in that boat. They just kind of shot out of the blocks, and they have already taken about a half a boat length on the rest of the field. So Long Beach right now with a commanding lead just very early on. Just behind them, it will be Texas Rowing Center in second, followed by San Diego Rowing Club, Zlack Capital, and then SAC Willamette. Salem, Lake Oswego, Community Rowing. I'm just going to call them Sacramento Aquatic Center because uh, that's probably going to be a little bit easier. And even just as I said that, there's a little bit of a switch up in that placement. Long Beach still with the lead, but Zlat Capital in the second place position, very close to Texas Rowing Center. So those two boats just side by side, deadlocked for that second or third place position. In fourth, it will be San Diego Rowing Club. They have about a five-seat advantage over Sammamish Rowing Association. And then Sac, uh, the, the Sacramento composite boat is in six with Pacific in lane seven in the seventh place position. It did look like Pacific had a little bit of a problem right after the start. Um, their boat kind of came to a stop, but then they picked it back up again. They're back in it, but I think they lost a little bit of ground that's going to be difficult to try and recover. As a coxswain, when that happens, Whitney, what, you know, I'm sure that that's happened. There's, there's been, you know, some sort of a technical error, some sort of a, an equipment issue. What do you tell your crew to recover so that they can still have a good race? Now, that's a really good question because it can be a little bit tricky because everybody's a little bit on edge when something like that happens and really your first job is to kind of get your crew focused again and kind of get them to regroup and tell them it's going to be okay it's time for us to just execute a good race and get back in it and then we can kind of start to move on these other boats so you kind of need to get your get your crew's mentality collected and calmed down just a little bit before you actually start fighting again so that's really what I would do. And um, I mean, look at this, look at this race too. I mean, this is so exciting. This Long Beach crew out in front here, we've got, you know, Susan Francia, we've got Shannon Kaplan, we've got some, some well-known names here in some of these boats. And then what are you seeing here, a three boat race? And then right in the center, yeah, we, had, we did have a pretty good lead here by Zlat Capital, but they have watched that shrink as Texas Rowing Center and San Diego Rowing Center have kind of gone after each other and pushed into that lead that Zlat had for the second place position. So as we come a little bit farther into the course, a little bit half past the halfway point, we're gonna keep our eye on lanes two, three, and four to try and solidify getting into you know one of those metal positions. In fifth, it continues to be Sammamish. They are in lane five on the outside. Inside of them, it's that Sacramento crew. That's a composite crew, and they are in the sixth place spot with Pacific on the far shore in seventh. Now, one of the things that we see with Masters Rowing and these crews where you've got athletes that come in from all across the country, well, 
they haven't practiced together. They might have gone out for a little bit of a swing row, maybe a practice on, on Thursday um, and maybe another one on Friday, not really sure. But sometimes it's just the level of experience that you have coming into uh, a race like this really carries itself in making that boat feel good. I know that some of these women with this Long Beach crew, they've raced consistently over the years. Um, this is like a reunion row for them. So I'm sure the, f the feeling of working together is familiar and they are displaying that right now with just a commanding walk away lead coming into the spectator area. So Long Beach well ahead, but still Texas Rowing Center, San Diego and Zlat Capital just bow ball to bow ball as we come across trying to find that second, third or fourth place position. Now that is a fun race. It really is. And you know, this Long Beach crew um, is is very, very experienced with masters. I mean, they really spend a lot of time focused on their masters. They're very, very dedicated, very loyal, have a long history of masters rowing. Um, you know, Texas Rowing Center too, very deep program. They have a lot of athletes out there. And I think this category, this ma the women's masters C category in general is very, very competitive. You get some very, very um, aggressively competitive women here in this group. And it's very exciting to see them kind of come back. And like you said, row together even if they only have three or four days to kind of come from all over the country or come back together but this category in particular always seems to be pretty exciting to race and look at how this race is shaping up yeah i mean you know we're looking at women that are in their uh, late 40s these are directly benefited from title nine um, i know myself as a early 50s woman um, same thing you know i benefited from a strong athletic program in college and in high school and um, I think that's what we're seeing here is this, you know, amazing level of, of athleticism and experience. We've got Olympic athletes peppered in there with, um, with just all around good athletes and friends. And here they come, though. Long Beach just, you know, what a walk away lead for them. That is super fun. And now still really tight here for that second place position between Texas Rowing Center and San Diego. It's going to come all the way down to the tape for those. Zlat Capital has fallen off to that fourth place position. Long Beach just crossing there with the first place spot. But between Texas and San Diego, I'm going to give that slight advantage to Texas as they're coming into the final strokes. Remember, the finish line is just shy of those orange buoys. And Texas has it for second, followed by... San Diego, and now here is Lat Capital. Sac Willamette, Lake Oswego Community Rowing, coming into that fifth place position with Sammamish in sixth, and then Pacific Rowing Club in seventh. And I'm going to make a quick correction there. We were looking at something a little bit different on our, on our heat sheet. So that was not Texas Rowing Center in the second place spot. That was Lack Capital, followed by San Diego, and then Texas Rowing Center. So apologies on that incorrect call if you were listening um, online or watching from the shore. So that was Zlack in second, Long Beach definitely for that win. Third place was San Diego, and then Texas Rowing Center in fourth. We've set records in Wintech. We really felt the King was the most efficient, effective, and fastest shell out on the water for us. Wintech King is the perfect boat to rep. All hail the King! Yeah!
All right, and we have a start for the men's Master C8. And this is always a really fun race, too, here. Lane one, we have unaffi unaffiliated, excuse me, USA and Riverside. Um, lane two, we have Pacific. Lane three, we have a did not start. So we're going to go right to lane four, Sammamish Rowing Association, and lane five, Pacific. And I'm actually pretty excited to see this race myself, knowing some of these guys here. Um, in lane one, we have a pretty strong... Uh, contingent here. Matt Muffelman in the stroke seat here. I don't know if you guys know Matt Muffelman working for Hudson there. In the seven seat right behind him, Sean Wolf. Um, seat two is Greg Kaplan, whose wife Shannon actually just raced in uh, the last race here. And this should be a pretty exciting race. And look at already we are shaping up with uh, three boats across here. Is that kind of, that's kind of what you're seeing too? Yeah, we're looking at a pretty good challenge here between lanes one, two, and four. So that is Riverside, the Riverside Palm Beach composite crew. Closest to them is going to be lane four, Sammamish Rowing Association. That is a true community program, top to bottom. They've got a very strong master's program. They've got a very strong juniors program. Lots of history, lots of victories and just a really deep overall community program. So great to see them here putting themselves up against a composite crew with a lot of really strong strong guys there in that uh, Riverside Palm Beach boat. Just behind them, bow to stern, it's going to be Pacific. So it looks like Pacific with two entries here. So Pacific in lane two, they are in the third place position. And then uh, out of our screen and out of our vision right now is that B boat from Pacific out of lane five. So as we come into the final strokes here in this men's master C8, I do want to call out again, this is a trophy and this cup is the coach Del Bleakley volunteer club, Del Beakley volunteer cup. Del was a coxswain on San Diego Bay in the early 1900s. He coxed at Cal in the early uh, 20s. Cox during the 28 Olympic trials, so there's a long history there. His dream was to have a regatta like this in San Diego, and we are envisioning that right now. So this trophy is dedicated to Delt Bleakley. And the Masters C8, it will be Riverside right now, looking to take home that trophy with a very commanding lead, a bit of open water for them as they come through their final stroke. So that's Riverside Palm Beach with the win. They are followed by Sammamish Rowing Association out of lane four. Pacific A in lane two. They will be finishing up. And then Pacific B in lane five. And I do want to call out that the winner for that event, um, it, even though it was a composite boat, Riverside Palm Beach, it does look like Palm Beach took home this trophy last year. So looks like uh, whether they're going to keep it in Boston or Florida, we'll, we'll find out.
through the active and fit pro American Specialty Health congratulates the Crew Classic on its 50th anniversary and we're proud to sponsor the Men's Varsity Collegiate Active and Fit Cal Cup. New this year, American Specialty Health is sponsoring the Active and Fit Recovery Lounge. The lounge will feature massage chairs, spin bikes, stretching mats, foam roller sets, and guided stretching videos. For race fans and rowers, American Specialty Health invites you to participate in the Pitch for Prizes game at the Active and Fit exhibit tent for a chance to win a prize. Through the Active and Fit programs, fitness enthusiasts can enjoy low-cost access to thousands of gyms nationwide. Learn more at activeandfitnow.com. Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. Find out more at concept2.com slash comp. Concept 2 is the proud sponsor of the Women's Youth Quad Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. All right, and we are already underway in event number 77. This is the Women's Masters E8. Age range here is between 55 and 59. This is the Kearney Johnson Cup final. And last year, Endeavor Racing took home the trophy. This cup is named after the longtime San Diego Rowing Club member. Kearney joined San Diego Rowing Club as a 20-year-old and rowed, coached, and competed until the age of 92. Really a testament to the fact that rowing is a lifelong sport. And right now, lane four, Toronto Sculling is holding on to a very tight lead over lane one, Endeavor Racing Alliance. So Toronto looks to have about a two-seat lead over lane one, Endeavor. On the inside, we're going to look at lane two, Long Beach. Long Beach in the third place position. Bow to stern over Anchorage. So looking at a crew here from Canada, crew from Alaska. Then we've got Long Beach, and then we've got Endeavor. They're from all over the country. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, you were talking about that cup and how this woman rode until she was 92. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly hope that I am rowing at age 92. Uh, maybe coxing, but we'll see. Um, this Endeavor Racing Alliance is a really cool project that Leslie Wright has put together, sort of an offshoot of Chinook, and she has done a lot of work to bring some incredible athletes together. And it's really shown here on the course. It looks like they also won this, uh, this trophy last year. And it has been really exciting to see her kind of build that program throughout the year and really get some incredible athletes excited about getting back out there again. And what's cool is that it's drawn attention from across uh, across the world here as we have an international um, competitor with Toronto Sculling, a Canadian crew. Um, but yeah, this E8 category, I'm going to, I tell you as, um, as an older woman that it does not get easier in masters rowing. I mean, it's not that anyone necessarily, it may be a little bit slower on, um, on the books, but it doesn't feel any slower. It doesn't get any easier. The competitiveness stays just as high and just as intense. So it's super cool here to see this tide of a race. And again, you know, remember masters generally will race just a thousand meters. So coming out to an event like the crew classic, it's one of the few opportunities throughout the year to race a full 2000 meter course. So right now the racing between Endeavor and Toronto is going to be pretty tight. We're keeping our eyes on those outside lanes. And as a coxswain, Whitney, when you're in a very far outside lane and your closest competitor is three, four, five lanes across from you, how do you, you know, how do you strategize that with your crew? Yeah, you know, that is a great 
question. Um, you give them a lot of side eye. You're oftentimes, uh, you know, looking over a few lanes, and you really have to be careful that you don't let those people kind of slip out of your sight because it's very, very easy to get stuck on your own lane and kind of what is going on in your boat and kind of lose sight of what's happening on those outside lanes while, you know, while they start to kind of crawl away. So you really have to keep an eye. You know, this coxswain is going to have to be looking over again and again just to make sure that they aren't taking another move. And, and that can be a little bit uh, distracting sometimes, you know, when you're trying to focus on your own boat. So you kind of just have to glance over every once in a while. Is that kind of what you feel as an athlete? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm relying on the coxswain to tell me what's going on so that I don't have to look out of the boat, which I is hope so. to do. That's but, what know. we want to hear. Right, right. Yes. Keep your eyes in the boat. <laughs> always. <laughs> I always did that. Uh, but you can see the coxswain. You can see the coxswain in Endeavor Racing looking across at Toronto. And that Toronto boat, that is a great sprint. They are already winding it up. And even though Endeavor has taken over that lead, Toronto, it looks like they are taking inches as we come towards the finish line. So really not letting Endeavor slip away anymore. We've still got the inside crews between Anchorage and Long Beach coming in for third or fourth. But coming down to the wire, it is, it's pretty tight here still between Endeavor and Toronto. You know, I was going to say the same thing, too. This is a battle of wills at this point. Those coxswains are looking across at each other like who's going to make the first move because this could be anybody's race here. And you're looking all the way across. The tide is almost perfectly slack. Conditions are perfect. So it's really anybody's game here. Great racing here as they come into view from the shoreline. Look at that. That is really, really tight between those two bow balls. It is going to be Endeavor Racing that's going to take the lead here, moving into that first place position. But still contact between the Toronto boat. What a great wind-up and sprint from Toronto. As at one point, they were down by about a length or so. And they really came back to challenge Endeavor but ending up taking that second place position and just really leaving Long Beach and Anchorage well behind. So we're still looking for them to come into view, but it does look like Long Beach in the third place spot. They have a bit of open water over Anchorage, so Anchorage coming into that fourth place position. All right, wrapping it up there in the Women's Masters E8. Again, ages 55 to 59. That was the Kearney Johnson Cup. And it looks like Endeavor Racing will retain that trophy. Moving over to the same age category for the men. They should be lining up, if not already taken off. This is the Men's Masters E8 Stewards Cup. This is a trophy final. In lane one, Kent Mitchell. Lane two, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane three, unaffiliated, and looks like it's a Canadian, uh, Canadian entry. In lane five, Wimble Ball, they are from England. Lane six, Anchorage. And lane seven, Texas Rowing Center. If you want to stay active and fit these days, you need flexibility. We get it. Active and Fit Now is a new fitness program that gives you options. For one low price per month, you get access to thousands of fitness centers and studios nationwide, so you can easily find your perfect fit. 
With no long-term contracts, you can switch your gym or cancel anytime. And stay active at home with thousands of workout videos included in your membership. It's super easy to enroll online. Just get active and fit now by going to activeandfitnow.com. Get it? It's in the name. Okay, and we have a start here in the men's Masters 8 again. Quick lane uh, lane assignments, Kent Mitchell in lane 1, San Diego Rowing Club in lane 2, San Diego in lane 3, unaffiliated or a Canadian crew in lane 4, Wimble Ball in lane 5, Anchorage lane 6, and lane 7 is Texas Rowing Center. So a lot of action here out on the water. But what is clear is in that first 250 meters, Kent Mitchell just really having a good start here. They already have about a boat length advantage over the rest of the field. And we'll come back and take a look at the overhead shot. And it does look like lane five, Wimble Ball. They are from England. Uh, that's in Somerset, I believe. Um, again, coming all the way over here, they're sure to want to have a great race, really make a statement and put down the best piece that they can here at the San Diego Crew Classic. So Wimble Ball in the fifth place or second place spot. They are followed right next to them by the Canadian crew. They are in the third place position. And then moving to the outside lane, that's Texas Rowing Center in fourth. Very close to them for fourth or fifth, it is going to be San Diego. So we've got two San Diego entries, and it does look like it might be an alumni boat from the University of San Diego in terms of looking at their blades. It is that baby blue and dark blue, so that is my guess. So University of San Diego alum. Next to them, it is San Diego Rowing Club. And then in the final position, it will be Anchorage rowing out of lane six. Yeah, and look at this performance here by Kent Mitchell. And they also, kind of like Leslie Wright with Endeavor Racing, have a very long history of getting some very good athletes in their boat. Kent Mitchell has been putting these boats together for years and years and is a very, very experienced coxswain, I believe, himself, and has really been um, getting these athletes together at some of the biggest races around the country for a very long time. And it's really showing now because look at this performance along the shore here. I mean, perfect conditions, excellent athletes. Look at their rowing too. They are so calm and cool and collected. They know that they have commanded this race along the shore here and they're just waiting. They're coming through these tents now. They are ready to finish this race and look at them. I mean, they're making this look easy. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, again, the quality of, um, of rowing is quite high. The level of athlete in this boat, in this Kent Mitchell boat, um, definitely some high level athletes there. And then, you know, Cox by Kent Mitchell, he was a coxswain in the 60 and 64 Olympics and just perpetually putting together these crews that really come off with some great races. So finishing up, it is going to be Kent Mitchell with a commanding lead in this men's E8 Stewards Cup final. Again, this trophy dedicated to the stewards of the San Diego Crew Classic. And then here we come with Wimble Ball. They are rowing out of lane five. Great racing here for them as they continue to have water on either side of them. Kent Mitchell here for the win, but Wimble Ball, again, open water for them over the next closest crew, which is going to be the Texas Rowing Center and then San Diego also close by. So between Texas and San Diego for that third or fourth place position. We're taking a look across. We got a little bit of glare coming off of the water. So hard to tell exactly what's going to happen there for that third or fourth place spot. You heard it. It was pretty close. And now San Diego Rowing Club. San Diego Rowing Club finishing. Yeah. 
All right, so that was the Canadian crew coming across in fourth. And now here comes San Diego. This is San Diego Rowing Club. And finishing out there, that is the crew from Anchorage. All right, and the racing does not stop here at the San Diego Crew Classic as we turn our attention back up to the start. We are now into some junior events. This is the Women's Concept 2 Youth Quad Final. We have some very fast crews out there. Let me give you the lineup. It will be in lane one, Redwood Scullers. Lane two, Y Quad Cities. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane 5, Maritime Rowing Club, and Lane 6, NorCal Crew. So as we had the very first shot here within the first 250 meters, there was no one that had really broken free yet. So a lot of really fast starts. Sure to shake out here in the second 500. So we'll wait and get a little bit better placement and come back with the race call. Really nice footage there from the launch as these ladies move into their second 500. Almost at the halfway point. Looks to be really close here between Redwood Scholars, Y Quad Cities, and Los Gatos. That was to be expected. These are all very, very fast crews. But then there's Long Beach Juniors again right there, right there with them. So this is going to be a great race all the way down to the tape. Redwood Scholars. Uh, having taken the gold medal at the Youth National Championship. So they've got a very deep history of performing well in this boat, as well as Y Quad Cities. Also, lots of medals, lots of trophies for them. Los Gatos coming up in the world of sculling with some really successful boats. So we're looking at them 
with some early season speed. Maritime from Connecticut, also very, very quick crew. And then NorCal, not as much of an emphasis on sculling for them with a really, really large program, but doing super, super well. And it's great to see um, with the bigger clubs that they are putting their, their athletes in all disciplines. So it's whether they're in a double, a single, quads, um, and performing really well. Yeah, and with Redwood out in front here, again, like you said, um, a lot of sculling here going on in these crews. And these women are, again, making this look really easy. It takes a lot of composure and, um, you know, to get three, uh, excuse me, four, four of these athletes all together uh, rowing like this. Um, and especially, you know, the, the youth four finals, like they, they are really, really looking good here. Redwood coming out in front and um, they are just making this look easy. I mean, look at this. And what would you say as a coach here coming in, um, you have this history that you are trying to defend, you know, with these Redwood Scholars and you are sending them out here, this beautiful water, but you know what you're coming up against. Well, you know, the thing is that San Diego is just, um, it's, a rega it's a regatta, it's not a championship. So in some ways, especially with water like this, we're going to see how fast our time can be. We're going to look at our splits, we're going to analyze, and then see how we can move forward with the season. So Redwood Scholars there, they've got a pretty strong lead looking at about a two length of open water um, lead over the rest of the field. Los Gatos is the next closest competitor. They are in a second place spot sitting just a couple of seats over Y Quad Cities. So Y Quad Cities and Los Gatos, that is going to be really fun to watch as they battle it out in these final strokes coming into the final 500 meters. Now over off of their starboard side, it's pretty tight between Maritime and Long Beach. So too close to call for me between those two crews, Maritime and Long Beach Juniors for that fourth or fifth place spot and then NorCal rounding out this final in six but look at Redwood it is all about them that clean and composed lots of swing and just really great blade placement they just uh, have have swept the sculling world and you know last year went all the way to Henley um, so lots of history there lots of victories behind them and so kind of a legacy to uphold no pressure guys but um, but you are uh, the standard for for, for women sculling yeah. so here they come Redwood Scullers along the shoreline lane one and then looking at that battle between Y Quad Cities and Los Gatos. It looks as if Los Gatos has a slight lead over Y Quad Cities, but it is super, super close here. Coming all the way down to the tape, I believe it will be Los Gatos to hold on to second. There's Y Quad Cities. And now Long Beach Juniors coming in for fourth, followed by Maritime. And then here is NorCal wrapping up this Women's Concept 2 Youth Quad Final.
All right, and we have a start to the Men's Youth Joan Ward Cup. That is the quad final here. In lane one along the shore here, we have Maritime Rowing Club. In lane two, Texas Rowing Club. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, Redwood Scholars again. Lane five, Oakland Strokes. Lane six, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane seven, Brophy. And lane eight, Y Quad Cities. And with an eight lane race here, this is going to be a pretty exciting race. And I was going to say, too, in the last race, it's really exciting to actually see some blind boats coming to the San Diego Crew Classic here. This is a race that we oftentimes see eights where we have coxswains, and, um, you know, it can get uh, pretty exciting with eights across here. But now that we have sculling involved, it's really cool to see a lot more junior races, um, you know, all the way across the men, the women. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. You remember back in the day when it was mostly eights. So what do you think about having more of these quads and sculling involved? Well, I think it's reflective of the rowing world at large. And especially with junior rowing, there is a huge emphasis on sculling um, for a variety of reasons, but also just opening up different, um, you know, different opportunities for kids. So we're now looking at the different age categories. We're looking at um, the juniors focusing um, quite a lot on sculling in the earlier stages of athlete development. So so I think it's just reflective of what's happening in the junior rowing world. The quad is one of the most competitive um, events. So it's not just about the eights anymore. It's great. It's just more opportunity. That's the way that I look at it. Um, and, you know, these athletes performing at such a high level when they go on to college. You know, the other thing is we know that it's still kind of all about the eights and the fours. But, hey, I can row port side and I can row starboard side. So, you know, that's that's the way that I look at it. So update from the race course. Again, we've got eight boats on the course. So we're going to try to do the best we can to keep track of what exactly is happening in terms of boat placement. And it does look like Lane 1 Maritime Rowing Club has taken a lead, but there's still quite a bit of overlap uh, between all boats. So we'll come back and we get a little better um, understanding of exactly what that placement is. But right now it does look like Maritime with the lead. All right, and it looks like I was correct. It does look like Maritime with that lead. It is really tight here between Texas Rowing Center and Los Gatos for the second or third place position. They are just pacing each other side by side, but Maritime along the shoreline in lane one. Again, they earned that, that lane, um, that top seating here. So they already have open water over the rest of the field. And then tightly grouped together, it's Texas Rowing Center and Los Gatos. Those two crews side by side. Back to them in the fourth place position, it's going to be Redwood Scholars. Redwood Scholars sitting about bow to stern over Oakland Strokes. All right, so again, Redwood Scholars sitting in that fourth place spot, bow to stern over Oakland Strokes, but Oakland and Long Beach Juniors very close to each other. Looks like Redwood Scholars actually does have a challenge coming out of uh, Brophy Crew and Y Quad Cities on the far outside lane. So we'll keep an eye on them. But what is sure is that Maritime has really extended their lead now, about two boat lengths of open water for them as they wrap up this grand final, the Joan Ward Cup, and then still between Texas and Los Gatos, super, super tight. I'm going to get the slight advantage right now to Texas rowing for the second place position, but just barely. But look at these quads coming in. It is a lot of overlap, very tight. And this is exactly what it's like when we get to the youth nationals level. It is tight racing all the way down the course, but Maritime doing a great job here holding off Texas Rowing Center. And then here comes Los Gatos. 
followed by Redwood Scholars, Long Beach Juniors, It looks like Y Quad Cities. Yeah. Looks like a, a little bit of lane swapping might have happened out there. A little hard to keep, uh, a little harder to keep track of, but it did look like Los Gatos in that third place position, followed by Oakland Strokes, and then Long Beach Juniors in the fifth place. Uh, We're looking at what I'm looking at. It was a little bit harder to keep track of exactly what was happening, but Oakland Strokes in fourth, followed by Brophy, and then Y Quad Cities and Long Beach Junior Crew in seventh. Campland is celebrating 46 years Those on Mission Those are unofficial Day. results. Um, I do think that we need to take a look at, um, at that placement. So, um, Keep your eye on the official, uh, the official times and placement finishes online. Campland is celebrating 46 years on Mission Bay. Campland has a full marina and a complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th All right, and again, we have eight boats on the course. A lot to keep track of here. In the women's under-17 quad, we have already had a start. We have lane one, Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Maritime Rowing Club. Lane three, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane four, Los Gatos. Lane five, Utah. Lane six, Redwood Scholars B. Lane seven, Long Beach Junior Crew and Lane 8, Holy Names.
All right, we're uh, challenged a little bit with the um, with the footage, so we're going to do the best we can here to give you an update from the course. But it does look like lanes one, Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos, rowing out of lane four, are your top two boats. Very closely uh, packed behind them, it will be Maritime Rowing and Marina Aquatic Center. So top four boats well out in front. Behind them, we have the next four crews, which will be Utah, Redwood Scholars, Long Beach Junior Crew, and then Holy Names. So for the advantage, though, for that lead position, I am going to go over to lane one. That's Redwood Scholars sitting with their next closest competitor out of lane four, which will be Los Gatos. All right, the closest competition right now is going to be between those top two boats, Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos. Um, again, like Whitney had been talking about, there's no coxswain in this boat. So the athletes, and it's usually the bow person, has to be very savvy to make sure that she keeps her crew apprised of what's happening out on the race course. Right now, Redwood has a bit of open water over the rest of the field. Los Gatos definitely in that second place position and looking really tight between Maritime and Marina. Advantage is going to go to Maritime for the third place position. And Redwood Scholars there on that inside, you can see that they were lengthening out there in that red hull there on the inside lane in lane one. And Los Gatos, right toward the middle of the race, looked like they wanted to make a push and see if they could vie for one of those top two, top three spots uh, along with Maritime. Between Maritime is Marina Aquatic Center. They've dropped back just a little bit on the pace, but certainly in that middle thousand, Los Gatos really came through with the strong middle thousand, especially from that lane four, um, to really put some pressure on Maritime, certainly. Uh, and they've actually taken a little bit away from Redwood Scholars as well, but Redwood Scholars is still open water ahead of the rest of the field, and they've been in a position that's kind of allowed them to comfortably get into their rhythm, which has helped them focus on themselves, which has helped them conserve some energy and keep them out in front for now. But certainly Los Gatos in the middle there. It was quite tight between them and Maritime for second, but Los Gatos asserted themselves in the middle of the race, and they've put themselves in great position as they rev it up for the final strokes. That's right. Really, really tight here uh, between Los Gatos and Maritime. And Los Gatos just kind of took off, though, for uh, making sure that we've got, you know, we've got a good, strong finish and does look like there's a little bit of a problem in that Maritime boat right now. They just came to a dead stop and uh, unfortunate in these final strokes. They were really on quite a tear. So as we look out from the spectator area, we wish those boats to get back into racing, racing pace, recover and finish strong. But right now it's Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos for the line. They will be taking the top two positions. And then we're going to look at Marina Aquatic Center to occupy the third place position. Unfortunate uh, for that maritime crew, um, but Marina taking advantage of that and finishing strongly here in the third place position. And certainly that was a close call with, between Maritime and Marina Aquatic Center. So good for Mar Marina Aquatic Center not to get knocked off their game and just exactly. that powering through. You could see the bow and stern just about overlap. So there was not any interference there. Really hard they to were not able get to, frazzled. Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. They stayed right like in that it and kept on going. Yeah. And then it does look like Redwood Scholars B. Coming in now, followed by Utah, and then Long Beach Junior Crew and Holy Names.
and we're back up this at back up at the start with the start of the men's U17 quad. This is the first level final, and we'll set the field here as they get underway. In lane one is Newport Sea Base, lane two River City, lane three Maritime, lane four Artemis, lane five Brophy, lane six NorCal, lane seven is River City. And in lane eight of the rounding out this eight boat field is Casitas Rowing. A couple of nice shots there as these uh, these quads get, collect themselves out of their starts, just finding their rhythms as they take, you know, potentially a first five to get out of the blocks, and then a nice 20 to maybe 40 strokes even, depending on what their race plan is, to keep the rate a little bit higher before they shift and lengthen out to their just bang and bass rhythm that is going to give them that efficiency to carry them all the way down the course. Really nice shot here of Newport Sea Base, looking very calm, upright, relaxed. They are in that lane one for a reason. So with this eight boat uh, field, there's a lot of action out there. And again, without a coxswain, the athletes, uh, uh, usually the person in the bow who is in charge of steering the boat, um, keeping everyone apprised of what exactly is going on on the course. And there's a lot to, t lot to keep track of. This is Artemis, you, you see in the screen. They are a uh, fairly young and small program that rose on the o Oakland Estuary. I've been told that in this boat, there are three novices. There's a novice that's stroking the boat. So man, that is a really good sign for for the future of this program. Right next to them, it's Maritime Rowing Club out of Connecticut. Artemis looks to have a slight lead over Maritime, so we'll keep an eye on those two. Um, and as we get a little bit better look at the field, uh, we'll come back with the race call. You know, the beautiful thing about racing these quads is you could row a you could row a single, you could row a double, you could row an eight, but they're just so quick. They're so fast, and your hands have to really move pretty quickly to make sure that you stay clean out of the back end. So that's you know another reason why it's really important to find yourselves through that leg drive, through the push, so that the blades can extract, can come out of the water cleanly together. Yeah, a quad is a, a quad is a really quick boat. It's almost as fast as an eight, right? Yeah, in yeah, terms just of relative speed. The same number of oars, half the people no coxswain it creates less load in the boat and right. so it, it can be very close the eight is still faster um and if you're matching for skill level a little more horsepower too yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but the quad is up there and it certainly can could potentially beat an eight off the line just because of the the quickness and the lightness of the boat itself And through this middle portion of the race, we have a couple of clusters uh, occurring here where it's almost like two boats and two boats and four boats. And so Newport Sea Base and River City are on those inside lanes, lanes one and lane two. They're kind of clustered together, giving each other, putting a little pressure on one another. Followed by lanes three and four, you have Maritime and Artemis. Maritime does have the edge on Artemis, but Artemis is still there close within within calling con calling card contact, and then it kind of staggers down uh, toward the outside lanes from there across the field where Artemis and then Brophy, NorCal, River City, and Casitas rowing. But still on the insides, extending their lead that they took, pushed each other off of the start, and then lengthened out to their rhythms and then found their base and then have just steadily moved away from the rest of the field. Uh, our Newport Sea Base and River City closest to the shore in lanes one and two. Yeah, really close to each other. Um, great to see River City out here with a really strong quad. Um, again, one of the, it, it's not a small program, but it's not a huge program. So oftentimes um, some of these junior crews, they will prioritize a boat like the quad if they can't feel the super competitive eight. Um, not that the eight necessarily has to be the priority, um, but with 
junior rowing, like I said earlier, the quad is one of the most competitive boat classes um, on the national level. So my guess is, is that that's exactly what River City has done. And look at them. I mean, that is bow ball to bow ball between River City and Newport Sea Base. Newport Sea Base really becoming a powerhouse in sculling, um, rowing out of um, out of Newport, um, the back bay there. And River, C- River City has two entries in this event, and it looks like they're out in lane seven as well. And yeah. the boat, the crew that's out there seems like they have a you know similar training program. So the second half of the race, they're both able to kind of pick up speed because that boat on the outside lane is also starting to move, not off of, not into the leaders per se, but has nudged ahead of NorCal crew out in the, uh, in, who is in lane six right now. And so both River City boats are having a, a great second half here, it seems. That's right. And then let's not forget about Maritime. They've got open water um, in front of them. They've got open water behind them. So again, that's a challenge to race where you kind of feel like you're all by yourself and you don't have someone side by side. They did pull away from Artemis. So Artemis occupying the fourth place position, but looking at a challenge from Brophy, looking at a challenge also from that River City B-boat. Um, so as we come into the final 250 meters or so for these crews, again, keep your eye on lanes one and two between River City and Newport Sea Base. It does look like River City has pulled up to a full boat length advantage over Newport Sea Base, but then also Maritime right there looking to come up and challenge Newport Sea Base. Great racing here. I love that this has really changed around as we've moved further into the race um, with a lot of boats on the course sometimes there's just a lot of action and Newport Sea Base has taken back the lead they felt the pressure happening from River City River City looked like it had a little bit of steering and at this point you got to keep it together stay clean and stay in your lane because when you rev it up maybe one side gets a little bit longer than the other it throws you off a little bit you might have to change your power but as they're getting straight again they're finding themselves they are just going for it as they're hunting the line there's no one else out there as far as the rules are concerned as long as they don't interfere and waver too far from their lane it it is neck and neck, and River City was able to come back and overtake Newport. There were several trades right of position there, first to second, first to second, in the last couple of strokes. There is a lot of drama that happens out on the race course that we don't see. And you saw the River City crew as they came across the line to take this trophy. And that's a big win. That's a big win for River City. You saw the arms up in the air. That's got to feel good. And look at this water. I mean, this is just as good as it gets. But River City with the win by a little bit less than a second over Newport Sea Base. They are followed by Maritime Rowing Club. And then Artemis just behind Maritime. Brophy came across in fifth, and then there was a battle out there in the outside lanes between NorCal and the other River City crew. It looked like River City pushed up over them, and then they battled it out to make it a very close, close finish at the end. We'll leave that unofficially. Again, everything that we say up here is unofficial. unofficial. <laughs> there it's are more rules. <laughs> there are more rules out there on the course than what we can see and draw. That's why we have these fantastic referees out there. That's Do right. that for us. <laughs>
And we are already off on the start of the Women's Youth B Quad Final. This is the first level final in this event, and it is a four-boat final. In lane one, we have Los Gatos. In lane two, Redwood Scullers. Lane three, Redwood Scullers again. And in lane four, NorCal Crew. You know, I love seeing some of the redundancy of names. You can really see where... You know, a sculling emphasis is applied in a lot of these programs, and especially at the youth level, sculling is incredibly important. A, it's much easier to make the transition from skull to sweep than vice versa, at least in my own experience and with everyone that I know who does it. Yeah. It tends to be the easier transition. It's also much better for your body in terms of longevity to be able to have more skills and uh, have that stability and also understanding how to really move the boat by rowing. Absolutely. Small boat, smaller a boats. Absolutely. Smaller boats. <laughs> <laughs> smaller boats. And, you know, all of these athletes row singles. I know Redwood Scullers you know they get out there on the port of redwood city with just a fleet of um, mm. of boats it's the you know the mosquito fleet they're single single singles doubles doubles quads you know a lot of different action going on and they are all adept at rowing any boat any seat any time with redwood scholars here with their two entries um, we are looking at again that's a lot of depth in that program we already saw their under 17 boat we saw their youth boat so you know this is a third and a fourth boat probably some novices mixed in there and really just doing quite a good job. Looks like a tight race out in front between lanes one and two with Los Gatos and Redwood Scholars uh, on those two inside lanes. This is a nice tight shot here, very tidy. You can see how all those oars are moving together. The handles in particular, you know, are they releasing when the legs are done? When your legs are done, you're done. Push the boat along down the course. It makes it much easier for the blades to come out of the water. So being able to find each other like that at a young age, then you can just get stronger and stronger through your capacity and and uh, really see what kind of good things you can create through the course of your career. So as you can see coming into the picture, it does look like Los Gatos has an edge over Redwood Scholars right now, but it is still very tight, and there still is a lot of course or enough course left to be rowed that anything can happen. You know, as we've seen in some of the other races this morning, you know, little little hazard, little bobbles here and there can kind of create some things that cause the steering to go off a little bit. Uh, so you got to really just stay clean. That's really one of the things here coming into the finish. Before you ask for more, stay clean first. That's right. Up. And we have, you know, over the course of the morning, even though this water is just absolute glass, we have seen mm -hmm. some issues with steering. We've seen some blade work issues because, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline and sometimes the lack of experience, I think, can lead to, um, you know, some steering issues. It's, these are hard boats to steer. There's a lot of horsepower. There's a lot of speed. Um, but at this level, you know, our crews at this point doing pretty well. Um, but you will occasionally see the flag go up from the referee's launch saying, hey, you got to get back in into your lane um, and you know steer back on course but as we come in uh, to the final 250 meters it does look like Los Gatos will hold on to the lead spot here they are opening up with a bit of open yeah, water yeah. over Redwood Scullers and then back to them by quite a bit of open water it will be the next redwood scholars boat followed by norcal so and a lot of open water between all crews and it looked like there was a push you know redwood scholars uh, in lane two the crew that's in lane two looked like they wanted to go for it they maybe sprinted a little bit early to see if they could take put a little pressure on los gatos and los gatos answered they they the blades went straight to the water you could see them pick up a little bit of quickness and they pushed back out to the lead and they have pushed back out to some open water clearance over lane two lane two redwood scholars as they come towards the finish line. Yeah, that's a really explosive sprint that Los Gatos has. That's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to keep an eye on that crew throughout the rest of the season, but what a great way to start the official racing season here at the Crew Classic with a commanding win in this under, this uh, Youth B quad. And coming across in third in lane three, that's the other Redwood Scholars entry. And so rounding out our field of four here in the women's youth B quad first level final will be NorCal Crew unofficially. Love that word, unofficially.
Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. Find out more at concept2.com slash comp. Concept 2 is the proud sponsor of the Women's Youth Quad Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Sponsored by the James S. Copley family, the Copley Cup is considered one of the marquee races of the Crew Classic. This coveted prize recognizes the longtime support of the Copley family since the first Crew Classic in 1973. Since 1975, the Copley Cup has been presented to the winner of the Invitational Race for Top Men's Collegiate Varsity Crews. The San Diego Crew Classic is grateful for 50 years of support from the James S. Copley Family Fund. And we are off. We are already set for the start of the men's Youth B Quad Final. This is the first level final, and we have a six-boat field. So six boats without coxswains will be coming down the course. Eight oars, four people in the boat. In lane one on that inside lane is Los Gatos. Lane two, Maritime Rowing. Lane three, Texas Center. Lane four, Redwood Scholars. Lane five is Maritime, again, Maritime's second entry in this final here. And in lane six, Redwood Scholars, also again, second entry in this event here. And as you can see, we're already into the first 500 of the race, and those two inside lanes, Los Gatos and Maritime Rowing, are already taking off from the rest of the field. Still very much tons of overlap, just a seat or two between the two of them, but they have a, a little bit of a margin on the rest of the field. I don't want to say control. At this point, there is so much course left to be rowed that no one has control over anything right now but we'll see what happens as they start to shake out the jitters some of that adrenaline and really let those butterflies fly and guide them down the course from here that's right so top four boats actually top three boats now pushing themselves out in with Texas. a bit of open water over the over the rest of the field in first it will be Los Gatos they are very close to Texas Rowing Center with Maritime right there in third and then in fourth, it will be Redwood Scholars right down the center of the field. So we've got two Redwood Scholars boats. We have two maritime boats. So to be clear, the third place, uh, third or second place position, um, actually it will be that third place position belongs to Maritime A. And then Redwood Scholars A is in fourth followed by Redwood Scholars B and then Maritime B. Boy, Texas had a, a Texas Center there had a, good, a great kind of second half of that first 500, uh, put themselves, they were a little bit short off of the start sequence itself, but then that lengthening out there, just the more strokes they took, it really started to put them uh, a little bit ahead of Maritime potentially there, certainly, and, and certainly vying for the lead with Los Gatos right now with the more strokes that they take. We're looking at some really great shots here of just kind of a close-up of the crew. Uh, I believe this is mar one of the maritime boats and nice upright uh, posture, good blade work, really sharp blade work coming from the maritime boats and again coming all the way out from Connecticut with several boats. They are here um, to say hey, we are competitive nationally. That's one of the things about being able to come out to San Diego is to say that you have raced cross-regionally, nationally, and that gears you up for a great season. You kind of know where the bar is set. And just coming into view here, they're certainly about to get into the last 500, if not already. They're seeking that 250, and then once they hit the 250, they know they have those red buoys, and they're going to count it down from there. Whether it's 10 strokes at a time, 7 strokes at a time, they're going to go, 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 go. And you can see on the inside lane there, Los Gatos regained control from Texas's early surge and, and challenge. And you can also see a couple of these boats are taking an early sprint, definitely beginning to see some blades pick up the stroke rates well ahead of 250 meters because they want to hunt that finish line they want to take down they want to put some more pressure on our early leaders out of Los Gatos that is lane two that is putting on the most pressure there for out of Maritime they're the ones who started to sprint early and as they do that they're leaving the rest of the field behind putting some open water clearance behind them and as we saw in Los Gatos's earlier female crew that was out there they had a quick solid sprint so as you can see 
Los Gatos felt the pressure and they answered. They also have a quick solid sprint, which is giving them open water again over Maritime, who put the pressure on them early by sprinting early. That's right, uh, Lindsay. That Los Gatos crew looks very mature. Re you know, remember, this is a B crew, um, so they've got another boat that's likely above them and a little bit faster. So they've got some good training partners out there on Lexington Reservoir. But this is a sharp looking boat as they come into the finish. Los Gatos winding it up with a nice sprint and an open water lead for the win over Maritime. Maritime also looking quite sharp with about two lengths of open water over Texas. Texas Rowing Center here right down the middle, followed by Redwood Scholars. So that's Redwood Scholars A. And then next on the field will be Redwood Scholars B. And then finally Maritime Rowing Club B. And we are back awaiting the start of the eights, switching from quads to eights. So back to some coxed boats here with the women's under 16 eight first level final. So everyone in these four crews that we have set to start, and we do have four crews at the line right now, are 16 years old or under. So a lot of, you know, we get to hop in these boats, get to have the coxswain, you get to join your teammates, make the boats go fast. And you have a few more years under to uh, get a little bit better at the skill set. So in lane one, we have Marin. Saw Marin come out with some strong performances yesterday. So we'll see what we can uh, see have shake out here in this first level final. Lane two is Capital. Lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. And in lane four is NorCal. That's right. And um, we did talk a lot about Marin yesterday. But when I take a look back, I... I I knew that this was true, but I just wanted to make sure Marin won all of their heats. Um, Newport was the next, um, I would say, most successful uh, program, winning seven of their eight heats. Um, but Marin won all of them. So we are looking um, looking to see, and, and by sizable margins. So a little bit of a target on their back, but that's a good place to be. It's better to be... Um, hunted maybe then <laughs> so here we go they have a start and uh, we will come back with the race call as they progress down the course All right, and just past 250 meters in, we see this race play out um, exactly the way that it was seated. So we've got Marin occupying the first place position already with about a length over the next closest crew, which is going to be Capital Crew, Capital from Sacramento area, and then Capital looking at a six to seven seat advantage over San Diego Rowing Club, and San Diego Club, uh, San Diego Rowing Club having pulled free of NorCal Crew. So San Diego in third, NorCal in fourth all crews just past 500 meters you know when you're out there in, in in the boats like this i was out in an eight this morning it's always those mind games you know you, you can never be far enough ahead so no matter what you've taken early on in the race you have no idea what else anyone else is doing and you know that there is a lot of race to be rode so you you stick to your plan you stay internal but no matter what it's okay yes i have more i have more there is more to give there is more race to be had well, and yesterday, you know, some of these boats um, pro progressed from a heat where it 
there, there was only the one heat, so they were racing for lanes. Yes. And so the mentality is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different. You know, you want to get good placement, but between each race, between yesterday and between, and, and then today, you kind of go back, you talk to your coach, you talk to your team and figure out what is it that we can do better? How can we go faster? How do we fine tune? And again, this is still really early on in the season. There's a lot of racing yet to be had. And even just for right now, there are a lot of strokes to be taken just in this race. So how much better can we get every stroke? You know, and as, as we're watching, Capital is taking the, you know, they're, with every stroke they take, they are just inching away from San Diego Rowing Club. But for every stroke that they're taking, inching away from San Diego, Marin is just it, taking feet per stroke more than more than inches per stroke and so they're really just you know uh, finding their speed finding themselves I can imagine they're having a good time out there going okay this is this is working whatever this is this is working let's see if we can find a little bit more if I've never been a coxswain if I were a coxswain <laughs> I would be asking them I would give them a technical cue and then I then I would be asking them for a little bit more open your eyes a smile and have some fun with this because this is going to be something that's great practice to set them up for the rest of the season one quarter of the race at a time one eighth of the race at a time one stroke at a time. I think that you should try to sit in the coxswain seat one of these yeah, days. Yeah. I mean, you got to put some padding and stuff around you. Boat manufacturers, <laughs> make it a little wider. There's nothing wrong with the six-foot tall A little coxswain. wider or longer, please. <laughs> but Boat. it does give a good perspective. So, uh, But no, to that point, <laughs> the, the coxswains have a very different job. You know, when you have a race like this where it's such a walk-away lead, you know, the strategy that you're providing to your crew, it's almost as if you have to provide the vision of having boats on either side of you, right? So what that coxswain is doing is keeping everyone engaged so that they can keep pushing and that's exactly what we're seeing here with that marin boat they are continuing to extend their lead they're not sitting same thing for capital capital has open water on either side of that boat they have to stay motivated to see exactly how fast of a time they can put down how they can hold off san diego keep them at bay san diego also keeping norcal off of their stern deck you know, it's these kinds of races where, you know, you know you weren't where you want to be by the end of the season. And this is where keeping a training log really helps. So that in December, when you're training by yourself, away from your team, or in January or something like that, you can remember these moments of like, this is why we do that. Because it's going to help us when we go to the start line in the spring. This X by whatever that we're doing right now, and these minutes on the bike by yourself, whatever it happens to be that's when you can connect those dots of how do I get faster because sometimes it's a small technical thing that you can make as a crew on the in the moment on race day but sometimes it's just make sure you stay consistent through your winter training well and consistency is key because the crews that we're looking at out here on the water right now this is an under 16 boat so um, that could be anywhere between I don't know 12 13 years old um, up to 16 so you might have a wide variety of athletes you got mm -hmm. some different sizes in there some different athletic backgrounds um, and time on the water. My mm -hmm. guess is that there's definitely some novices um, in those boats, although I probably shouldn't guess because uh, some <laughs> of these programs, they have middle school programs, you know, and by the time you get to be a sophomore in high school, you've what already if you're got a four old years novice. under your belt. Or 50 year old novice. <laughs> I that's still feel true. like a novice. Those I mean, are real. Yeah, I still yeah. feel like a novice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still learning every day, right? But that's the sport of rowing. That's why it's a lifelong sport because it continues to give those lessons. Yeah. Um, yeah. But man, what what's happening right now is that Marin is giving everybody a lesson on excellence and speed. This is um, just really quite a substantial margin. Um, and to see something like this, it's, this is not something that um, that they will experience throughout the rest of the season. Things should get tighter. It should get a little bit closer as, as things tune up towards that yes. um, postseason racing. So we will keep an eye on the progression of these younger crews mm -hmm. as they as they go through their season. But man, what a way to what a way to start out. Yeah. Stay clean, stay tidy, and get ready for your sprint because it's coming. You know they're they're into the last 500. Once you see this black flag in front of the tent, that's the last 200. 50 meters. There are orange flags out on the course. Those are your 500s. There are black flags on the course to mark the 250 meter mark. So as the sun changes, if you can catch an eye, if you're watching at home, you can see the black flag right there. As soon as the coxswain sees that, that's 250 to go. Uh, you'll only see it in the outside lanes, though, and it's it's quite possible that some of these crews will sprint early to practice those special teams that we talked a bit about yesterday. That's right. So practicing the sprint, that is about execution. That is something that these crews will practice, um, you know, for 
every single day you practice how do you have a, a great start, a better start, a more effect, effective start? How do you have a, a more effective sprint? But it's also tactical, yeah. right? So yep. depending on what is happening on the water, you want to, uh, you know, the, say that with this Marine crew yeah. is not necessarily being pushed, but they want to execute. So they yeah. are going to bring up the stroke rate. They're going to see how much quicker. And they've got the equipment in their boat to see their splits. So they want to see those splits drop to make sure they have an effective sprint. And as you'd imagine... Marin will be the first crew that you'll see here on the on the inside closest to shore. And right now, if I'm capital, I'm thinking, how much distance can I put between me and San Diego? If I'm San Diego, how much distance can we put between us and NorCal? What can you get for the rest of this race? Yeah, and San Diego and capital, the, the, the distance between those two crews has actually has shrunk a little bit. So uh, capital has maintained that second place position, but San Diego um, has come up or, um, or maybe San Diego had a, a little bit of a slower uh, third 500, but the distance between between those two crews has tightened up a little bit um, and then NorCal finishing in the fourth place position so um, big wide difference here between um, all crews on the water in this women's under 16-8. And coming across the line, rounding out our field of four in this women's U16-8 first level final is NorCal Crew. So in first, unofficially, Marin, followed by Capital, followed by San Diego, followed by NorCal. And up next, we are back up to the start with the men's U16 eights. This is the Rose Cup final, first level final here, a three boat final. And in lane one is Marin, lane two, NorCal, and lane three, Newport Sea Base. And it's still pretty tight as we come through that first bridge. There are two bridges on the course. One is a little longer, one is a little shorter. First and second works for me. <laughs> but when you see those bridges, it kind of gives you a little bit of an, a perspective on where the boats are on the course. You see that one big long one there in the first 500, no bridge. Second 500, you see another bridge. You're somewhere toward the middle of the race, and then it clears up to some trees and beach. And then when you see those tents at the end, it's last 300 meters or so. And as I speak, Marin is edging themselves out as they cross that first 250 meter mark, uh, edging themselves out just a little bit over NorCal crew as they lengthen out who has nudged a little bit ahead it's kind of like a half a boat length stagger from boat to boat to boat over Newport Sea Base so lane one two three Marin NorCal Newport Sea Base at this moment yeah, you know, it's really neat to see Newport Sea Base really stepping up over the last few years. Um, under coaching of uh, James Longlerno, who actually started at Orange Coast College, which also, also has a very, very long history of success here at this race, um, it's very cool to see him building this program over the last few years and really competing well here with programs like Marin, who obviously has a very long history of success at national championships, at this race. I mean, they are all over the map from juniors to masters. And look here they're all still connected. Is that kind of what you're seeing here? Definitely. There are still connections, certainly. Um, 
between first and third place no longer has connection, but the stair step from one, two, three, they're all connected with one another. And you know, you never know what's going to happen down the course. And sometimes what you'll start to see is that there is a little bit of a slingshot effect. So even if there are eight boats across and there's overlap, at least from a rowing, a rower standpoint, it kind of does give you that confidence that you can kind of use them as a stepping stone. Just kind of mow them one at a time, make sure that you maintain that contact at this point in the race. Yeah, absolutely. And as a coxswain, I know that we are always trying to kind of reel those boats in just one seat at a time. You know, we're kind of tossing the line and trying to reel them in just a little bit at a time there and kind of keep our crews excited and in the race, even if you are in that third place finish, because as you know, it could really be anybody's game. Anything could happen coming into that last 500. And we have seen some things happen this morning. So, you know, and, and part of it too, the confidence builder isn't just take a seat back. It's okay. If a crew is moving on you, stop the advance. Cool. Now we know that we're going the same speed again. Okay. So now can we shift that? Can we get an inch now at this point and just take it one little bit? You can see there in the tents there, we're already into the last 300 meters or so. You'll see a black flag. There it is. Marin has just now passed that black flag. They know that they are into the last 250 meters. So again, from a rower standpoint, you're okay. I'm counting my tens. I'm counting my sevens. I'm counting my fives. Whatever it is, breathe, sit up, open your eyes, support the person in front and behind you because you know and you trust that that person is going. So you must go. And that's really is the beauty of creating a tight knit unit is I see you. I'm supporting you because I know what you are laying on the line right now. And Marin, from start to finish, has just continued to edge from re edge out from the rest of the field, performing very similarly as the women's U16-8 did in the heat right before this. Absolutely. And look at them coming up on the shore here. They are calm, cool, collected, sitting up a little bit taller here in those last few strokes as they cross the line. But this is a pretty commanding finish from Marin. You know, gaining a little confidence like this early in the season will only inject energy into your coming training sessions. And again, that's where you want to remember this when the training gets really hard throughout the fall and winter. That's the coach's challenge. How do you keep them dialed in, feeling this way, and knowing why they're doing what they're doing? So as we come second, that is NorCal Crew, followed by a Newport Sea Base. There was a little bit of open water, well, a few lengths of open water there for uh, NorCal over Newport Sea Base. So each of those crews and coxswains had an opportunity to practice staying a bit more internal. How do we continue to goad each other along, uh, even though we aren't still in contact? It's definitely a very different race than if you have two boats side by side, stroke for stroke. And we are back up to the start for our next race, the Women's U16 Ulster Challenge Cup. This is a coxed quad. So now we have the quads, the four athletes, the eight oars, plus a driver in the front. So that takes a little bit of responsibility off of these under 16 athletes. Uh, in lane one, I'll set the field for you so you know who is coming at you is NorCal Crew. Lane two is Maritime. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane 5, Casitas Rowing. Lane 6, Pacific. 
And lane seven, rounding out our seven boat field here is Long Beach Junior Crew, and we do have all seven crews off to the start and it looks like lanes two and four maritime and marina aquatic got a little quicker off of the start than the other crews but still the top five inside lanes norcal maritime los gatos marina aquatic center casitas rowing those five lanes are in sort of a, a stepping stone stagger up and down up and down um, almost like a w shape right almost like the olympic ring shape as they go down the course uh, but they are all still in contact it's only pacific and long beach juniors who have dropped back just a little bit but we've seen through the middle of the race some crews make up a lot of ground or take even more ground. So we'll see as the race unfolds, especially through that middle portion where each of these crews goes from there. Yeah, and actually this is a really cool uh, part of the race here where we come across this first bridge. It's about the 400 meter mark or so, very, very roughly that you can kind of start to feel the wind pushing you a little bit uh, to that starboard side. Um, right now though, we have absolutely no wind, which really makes it nice for these quads. I mean, I, we have a little bit of an outgoing tide, but not much wind coxswain so these athletes can really just focus on what they do best rowing yeah. and putting their blades in the water and have beautiful water to do i mean look at these blades flashing across the water here pretty close race like you said a little w shape um w I mean, that's ex that was <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> olympic rings we'll take it i was like what is I'll this guys yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but really, really nice here. I mean, this is this could really be anybody's race because the water is just so beautiful here, and you just don't always get that here yeah, in Mission yeah, Bay. Yeah, I was I was out there this morning, and it has just I thought for sure as soon as the sun rose and convection currents occurred that it would kick up some chop, and it certainly has not. It's been beautiful out there. So to be able to not have those distractions and practice your skills on flat water is nice every now and again. Keep that in mind when the water is all over the place because inevitably, a quota coach said to me. It's an outdoor sport, Choop. I'm like, oh, right, yes. But these are the moments when you go out in the shop and then you come back and have these where you realize, oh, I learned something. And it makes it a little bit easier and you realize that your skill has advanced. And talking about skill advancing in lanes two and four, Maritime and Marina Aquatic Center look like they are still commanding. They're fighting for first place. I, I won't give any calls of who is where. It does even look like Marina Aquatic Center might be the crew that is nudging out. But they have done a nice job of just staying consistent. They've maintained position jockeying for who's going to be first. Is it Maritime? Is it Marina Aquatic? NorCal on the inside lane in lane one is maintaining a little bit better contact with our still leaders between those two lead crews of Maritime and Marina Aquatic Center. Los Gatos has dropped back a little bit, but not much. They're still well in contact. And Casitas Rowing is the other crew who is among those top five right now.
And through that third 500, it looks like Maritime might have extended just a hair of a lead over Marina Aquatic Center. Question is, is did NorCal, was NorCal able to stay with them and move up a little bit with them on that inside lane in lane one? But both Maritime and Marina Aquatic Center having great rows thus far relative to the rest of the field being the two that kind of jumped out from this, well, I shouldn't say jumped out, moved out one stroke at a time from the start. Uh, and then went on from there. And yes, it, it is. It does look like Marina Aquatic Center did have a, also had a great second, uh, third 500 because they are currently our leaders, maybe just a hair over Maritime. So it's going to come down to this sprint. NorCal crew on that inside lane looks to be in third place as Casitas has dropped back, or uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, Los Gatos has dropped back just a hair from our Early leaders and still leaders, Mar uh, Marina Aquatic Center, and now Maritime in second. And as you can see, there's a bit of open water um, extended for Marina Aquatic Center. So to be out there in the middle of the course, not necessarily directly next to the crew that is the next fastest on the field, is a great performance to be in the middle of the course there, performing as they are, but also not next to a crew that, it, that, that is pushing them necessarily. Yeah, and you know, Marina has really shown up in some of these small sculling boats. Um, they're up in Los Angeles, and they share their water with UCLA and Loyola Marymount, and they have a, a really, really nice waterway up there, um, both a 2K that is a little bit title dependent, so they have to get out there and really tough it out sometimes. Uh, you know, when there's some rough surf, you have to actually row out into the ocean a little bit to get onto the 2K course. But, um, you know, they, they have really shown up quite a few times, um, you know, in these smaller boats and, and are really clearly uh, commanding this lead today. And it's it's good to keep in mind that this is an under 16 coxed quad. So here we are developing the skull the sculling skill set, but also at you know 16 or fewer years old. I know that athletes that I know personally are you know sometimes 14 racing these events. So you never know what's going to happen. We just know that they aren't over 16 years old. And Marina Aquatic Center has they took you know some open water, but they haven't continued to extend for the last 500 meters or so from Maritime. They're kind of sticking to that lead that they had, which is a decent amount of open water at this point as they close in on their final 10-15 strokes here before the finish line. Uh, second behind them currently is still Maritime rowing and between NorCal, Los Gatos, and Casitas those seem to be the crews that are flanking them in that still much bigger stranger W shape but it's still a W. <laughs> we'll call it the Olympic rings. <laughs> <I'll take it. laughs> a very pointy one also known as a W. <laughs> And so that was Maritime crossing in second unofficially. You can see some of these coxswains here popping up out of their seats, getting excited here, uh, finishing up this race really, really close. Um, that, was a, that was a pretty nice race. I mean, U16, these athletes really showed up to race today. That looked really nice. So Los Gatos here in third, I believe. Am I seeing that correctly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a half, of, half a boat length over NorCal crew. Followed by Casitas out in lane five, crossing the line, giving each other a little high five, maybe congratulating the other four crews ahead of them. And then in those outside lanes, we have Pacific and Long Beach Juniors rounding out our field of seven.
And we are already underway in the men's U16 a coxed quad final. Again, this is an under 16 event, and now it is a quad, but we have the coxswain in there as well. And I will set the, cur set the field here for you as we take it off. In lane one, our early leaders is Maritime Rowing. They've got about a half a length on the rest of the field, just these first few hundred meters into the race. Lane two is Los Gatos. Lane three, Long Beach Juniors. Lane four, Redwood Scholars. Lane five is Lake Las Vegas. Lane six, Cathedral Catholic. Lane seven, NorCal. And lane eight in this eight boat first level final is Utah. It is only NorCal crew in lane seven that seems to be dropping back from the rest of the field. So far, everyone pretty clean, relatively maintaining contact, and it does seem to be a little bit of taper, um, not quite perfect taper across the lanes one through eight, but Maritime, Los Gatos, Long Beach Juniors, Redwood, Scullers, those are your uh, lead crews right now. Those three inside lanes are starting to break away from the pack a little bit as they get past that first bridge with Redwood, Scullers, and Lake Las Vegas. Very close, almost trading bow ball. It is Redwood Scholars with a few feet maybe over Lake Las Vegas as they cross that next buoy line. And then in that red hole, Cathedral Catholic is looking to s maintain contact with those two to see if maybe they can make sure that they don't get dropped by the rest of the field as the race unfolds. And lane one, Maritime is extending their lead. They want to take open water over current second place, Long Beach Juniors. It's very tight between Los Gatos and Long Beach right now, but Long Beach seems to have a tiny edge, if a few inches, over Los Gatos, but it's still too close to call. They will likely trade. We've seen Los Gatos have great sprints here today. That, you know, it's, and it's not just the sprint itself, but that they are able to take and have another gear, take another step, make another step toward the end of the race, which maybe shows that um, you have the fitness to do so. These athletes are quite young, so they haven't had the years of training to get a ton of fitness under their belt necessarily but again you don't want to guess those things maybe some of them have been rowing since eighth grade I <laughs> but right now those got us in long beach juniors i can only imagine what it feels like as those two crews are side by side and they have to make sure they stay tidy and clean that is a lot of pressure that's go ahead Absolutely. And with an eight boat race here, it is a little bit of advantage, I would think, um, having a coxswain and kind of being able to, you know, you can see those little heads peeking out over across the lanes there and looking across the water. And it may be a little bit harder for some of these coxswains in lane one that have to look into the sun and kind of keep an eye on, mm -hmm. you know, lane seven, eight, you know, some of these crews that can kind of sneak up on you a little bit. Yeah. Um, but what do you think about uh, blind boats, you know, versus huh. cox boats in, in conditions like this where you're, you have a lot of these little races going on that are pretty tight you know what what are you kind of thinking as an athlete uh, in a boat like this I mean it's completely internal and and you know you have the cox and the person usually that depends if you're in a, a pair or a double or something like that it's usually the bow person making the calls because then you can hear it uh, but if it's a call it's literally go now <laughs> arm <laughs> like whatever your call is you break it down into like this monosyllabic thing and uh, you, you've practiced it enough times that it's second nature at that point because really there is nothing else there's nothing you can do about lane eight you can't throw oil slicks you can't drop you know debris in their lane you are only in control of what's happening in your lane and any tiny distraction a peek out of the boat takes away even the tiniest iota of speed that you can apply to your hole because at the end of the day it's your hole that matters and maritime is showing i believe they have nine entries here sculling events coming all the way from the east coast they're definitely a strong rowing program i know some of the coaches that have gone there over the years you can see how the program has developed the very experienced coaching you can see it um, showing up in these young athletes here maritime has taken control early stayed patient in the first half of the race and extended their lead either through efficiency or fitness or both probably both in this case uh, all the way down to have several boat lengths of open water over now second place los gatos who has control over Long Beach Juniors by nearly a length, not quite. There's still a little bit of overlap, just maybe broken to open water, just barely as that horn uh, blared. So Maritime, followed by Los Gatos, followed by Long, Long Beach Juniors right now. That was a great race with Los Gatos and Long Beach Juniors maintaining their cool side by side. Redwood Scholars coming across in lane four. Next to them in lane five is Lake Las Vegas. Those two crews battled it out early on, staying pretty side by side as well. So the second half, truth told there, uh, where there was some separation that Redwood Scholars was able to slide away from them in the second half of the race. 
absolutely. And it really takes a lot of composure not to get too overly excited when you are bow ball to bow ball or connected, you know, you, when you are this close coming across the finish line, um, especially for these younger athletes, it really speaks a lot to their coaching and their experience as they start to, you know, come across the line here again. And they're just so tight, but they're so composed. Like these athletes really show a lot of maturity out here. That was followed by Utah and Cathedral Catholic with NorCal rounding out our field of eight. You know, you, you talk about the composure and the maturity of the athletes. And I mentioned this yesterday that having in conversation about, you know, race sport coaches and game sport coaches. And just from a safety standpoint, if you really think about it, here we are as coaches have this piece of very expensive equipment. Take the four, five, eight, nine. How many of you? And I'll see you in an hour. That's <laughs> you know that's that's a lot of responsibility that these young athletes are are proving that they can have the maturity to maintain and take care of and have a ton of fun with, which is just a really uh, cool concept. If rowing you, can you really be think fun. About it. Yeah, <laughs> rowing should always be fun. The harder it gets, the more fun it has to be because that is how you deal with the world of hurt that you're putting yourself through. You Couldn't know, agree more. Sometimes people say, "Oh, you know, the, you get more serious." It, well, yes, it's very serious, but you find a way to decompress, enjoy at all levels because when you are pushing yourself that hard you need to be able to walk away from it and laugh and just be like oh my gosh look at this amazing thing that we're doing that is just so hard at the same time exactly if you don't have keep a sense of humor doing it all you know it, it, you really need to keep it light keep it fun because yeah. everybody is just going to the bottom of the well so often and, yeah. and working so so hard that you know you really have to kind of step be able to step away from that yeah. and kind of you know, release yes. before you get back on yes. the on the water again. I think so. that's, that's some of the bind the bind that ties a, the ties that bind us <laughs> the ties that bind us both. The two K brain here, yeah. <laughs> the ties that bind us throughout life. You know, you go through all of these. The, you, you go through the trenches together, having experiences that only you and your teammates could ever know. <laughs> and, and you can stand back when you walk into the boathouse in the morning and just look at the sky and go, Oh my gosh, look what I get to do today. It's going to be really hard might feel like my teeth are about to fall out, but <laughs> look what I get to do today. <laughs> and as we gab away here talking about the amazing experiences that rowing are, is to each and every one of us, we are off on the course with our next race, the Women's Concept to Youth Quad. This is the second level final in this event, and it is a five-boat field in lane one is Utah. In lane two is Marina Aquatic. Lane three, River City. We heard River City with several entries and events already this morning. In lane four, Zlack. And lane five, Cathedral Catholic. Rounding out our field of five. Again, already on the course. Still quite early in the race, a little bit of a or a little bit of a, a taper as you go across the course, but very tight between River City and Marina Aquatic. We've seen good sculling out of both of those crews already this morning, so we are back to the Cox less. So we don't have a coxswain in this quad. This is a quad minus, <laughs> um, but Utah is out early. They are early leaders in lane one, and Marina Aquatic and River City are in second and third place. And as the race goes, you can see that River City earlier on was looking like they were trying to push with Marina, and we'll see if that has allowed them to push up into the lead and vie for first with Utah, which is quite possible here. Utah in the red hall at the top of the screen, and in those outside lanes, lanes four and five, Zlack there in that yellow yellow hole. That's your local crew. Certainly the oldest, correct me if I'm wrong, please everyone out here probably knows the oldest club for, that women have rode in in the world, in the country, in the world. I believe so. Yeah, and one of the original uh, uh, clubs to be involved here at the San Diego Crew Classic. Obviously local, tons of history there. I need to go read some more books. I believe actually back in the day they were even rowing in dresses. I, I think yeah. really, really far back when they first started, they were, it's unbelievable to see some of these historic photos yeah, of yeah. women's rowing. Yeah, talk about speed gains just by changing what you're wearing. Just by yeah. taking off your skirt. Yeah. It's and practicing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your wool skirt <laughs> that you're rowing in. <laughs> no, it's um, amazing. Amazing. Oh, God, I love rowing history. Uh, speaking of history, so River City in lane three, having a good show in the middle there. And it uh, looks like they have either um, attained control of this race, taken control of this race Two through what brain. they're doing. Yeah, to, to, uh, by what they're doing in their lane. Marina Aquatic Sandwich between them and Utah. Um, <laughs> 
and you might be able to see them coming into your picture in the red hull. It is it is Utah who was able to answer the call of the two crews next to them uh, between Maritime and uh, between Marina Aquatic Center and, and River City, and they've been able to retake control, clear control over this race, and have some open water between them and the rest of the field. Um, it is a taper as you go across the lanes. Utah, Marina, River City, Zlack, Cathedral Catholic, uh, Zlack ahead of Cathedral Catholic, and with River City and Marina Aquatic Center, those are the two, what can they do with the last 500 meters or so, um, but it will likely not be enough time, barring discombobulation, to overtake Utah, who has, is kind of not sitting pretty, but like, you know, you never want to say that because you can never be far enough ahead, but sitting out in front with a good van point of view over the rest of the field at this point. Yeah, I mean, we are not seeing anybody else in the picture here in this drone shot that is absolutely beautiful, and we can see Utah in that red hole. And it is so cool to see these crews coming all the way out here from Hawaii, from Anchorage, from mm -hmm. Utah. I mean, what a spread of locations that we have mm -hmm. at this regatta. And looking at Utah here, they are, I don't want to say calm, cool, and collected, kind of like you said, you know, they are still pushing, they are still focused, but again, they do look, we keep using that word composed, but they really do look composed here because I think they know that they are in a fairly commanding lead and um, we'll see kind of what they decide to make their finish look like. Are they going to sprint at all? Are they going to keep rowing, you know, like this? But I mean, they're making this look easy. And again, this is the Women's Concept 2 Youth Quad. This is the second level final, so we'll have the first level final coming up later today. Uh, with some of these programs, if they have more than one entry in here, perhaps they'll take it take it back to the garage and reshuffle some things, depending on what the speed looks like. Uh, it's, it's still pretty early in the season. We do have some regional races, local and regional races coming up as the stepping stones toward youth nationals. Will we see some of these crews there later on, some of the same teams most likely <laughs> absolutely as they say you know the rowing season starts here and that really is true so you you see a lot of these crews with some of these commanding leads here but there are a lot of crews that will really step up you know as the season progresses and that's what makes this so exciting that you really never know where people are going to end up so mm -hmm. uh, speaking of ending up um, what are we seeing here with this pretty close finish we still have some connected boats here we've got Utah across the line in from lane one they've come across the line uh, unofficially, uh, first in this field of five, followed by Marina Aquatic, and next to them we're going to have River City. Marina Aquatic was able to regain control over River City, who made a good push in the second 500 of the race. You hear the horn there. That's the second horn of the Women's Concept 2 Youth Quad Final. This is the second level final. You heard the third horn there with River City. with Zlack coming into their final 10 to 15 strokes or so here toward the finish line. And all five boats are across the line here in the Concept 2, in the Women's Concept 2 Youth Quad Final. This is our second level final, and we will be back with the next race here shortly. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. 
Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to... And we are already on the course with the next race, our men's youth Joan Ward Cup. This is the second level final in the men's quad. The Joan Ward Cup in lane one is Utah. Lane two, Maritime Rowing. Lane three, Community Rowing San Diego. Lane four, Casitas Rowing. And lane five, the crew out of Hawaii, Kaika. I'm doing my best on pronunciation. I don't speak Hawaiian. Well, that's too bad because that's why we brought you in. We thought you did. <laughs> but I speak 12 languages. <laughs> exactly. So please have patience with my pronunciations, doing the best I can. All right. We are certainly well underway here in the uh, Joan Ward Cup here, the youth quad second level final. And out there it looks like Maritime in lane two having a clean race all the way down the course. Sitting tidy in the yellow hull, white blades there. Again, coming out here, sometimes crews share if they come from a long way, share equipment. So the equipment doesn't necessarily align. So as soon as we get a handle with our eyes in the sunlight, we can give you the best that we can. But it does, Maritime staying nice and tidy there in lane two. Uh, they seem to be our leaders as we come into the closing quarter of this race here. Uh, and we'll look for them for the blades to just be going very direct to the water. Nice tidy sculling and um, just seem to pick up the rate, right? Elevate the rate, blaze go, blade goes in, body sits back a little bit, make sure you're nice and stacked, blade goes straight to the water, then you just give it more of a push, brings you to the line a little bit quicker. That black flag in the bottom left of your screen, that's going to be your last 250 meters. Again, orange flags are 500s, black flags are 250s. Great overhead shot here of our leaders that have clear water. We might have had something occur a few hundred meters ago with uh, Utah in lane one. Not quite certain. We'll give you more information on that once we have it. But what we do know is that Maritime, you can see the hull just moving ever more, ever more per stroke as these young guys smell the line in the Joan Ward Cup Youth Men's Quad second level final. Give these guys a hand as you see them come into your picture. Give them, they can hear you out on the course. It'll certainly carry across the water. Elevate it, see how much speed they can get out of it. This is a Cox-less quad, so it's just them out there motivating themselves. But if they hear the energy from the crowd, they might even be able to get another inch out of it, which would be great to see. So in lane two, coming across hot, it is Maritime from the East Coast here. Coming across, maintaining composure too, not collapsing there. That's another sign that... Uh, Okay, that was hard, but no one's going to know how hard it was <laughs> staying composed. In the lane next to them, in lane three, does appear to be Community Rowing San Diego. Coming across hot as well, maintaining composure. Plenty, lots of distance between them and the next crew behind them. They put a lot of distance, one push at a time, uh, between them and the rest of the field as well. In the lane next to them, it appears to be Casitas.
Correction here, that was Ikaika in lane five. Lake Casitas coming across now, followed by Utah in lane one. Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Camp Land is celebrating 46 years on Mission Bay. Camp Land has a full marina and a complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. paddle boarding and biking. Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. We are back up to the start. We are now with the under-17s. This is the women's U-17 quad. This is the second level final, and it is a three-boat final, and we, were, we are already on the course early in the start, off of the start. Uh, Holy Names in lane one is just has a, a hair in the first couple of hundred meters over uh, Casitas in lane two and Zlack in lane three. So our three boats here are lane one, Holy Names, Casitas rowing in lane two, and Zlack in lane three, very close between lanes two and three, uh, very close between all lanes at this point, but in the very early phases of this racing. And one thing we do want to keep an eye on as we come down the course is these are straight quads so these athletes are steering these hulls with their feet sometimes you know in, but with their feet that means that there is a wire attached to the shoe they move their foot that moves the rudder so they're doing it while they're rowing and that can be pretty uh, challenging you know and so you know as a coach I always recommend turn, turn it at the finish and just do real quick you know keep sight it like a gun use the two buoys at the end of the course keep the hull to keep the stern deck right in the middle of those two things and as soon as it starts to waver just a little bit give it a tiny little kick because if you have to make a huge correction in the race all you rowers out there know that a huge correction means the boat might ride on rails and tip a bit and then it's just going to make it even harder to correct sometimes sculling boats people choose not to use steering and just use the length of the length of a side uh, rather than strength, I always recommend not using strength of a side. Use the length, because when you're already at max, how do you go over max? <laughs> there is no 110%. Yes, you know, yes, you yes. Not in reality. <laughs> not, not in reality. Not how it works. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, um, us coxswains are out of jobs, you know, in these, in these coxless, coxless boats. So we... Uh, you know, we get to sit on the shore and watch you guys use your toes and like you <laughs> these other steering mechanisms, and it is quite impressive. How's that um, for, for banter? I can do your job with my foot. Exactly. While exactly. I'm rowing. We hear that a lot. You know, we could be replaced by a sandwich, by a toe no, clip, you know, no, whatever it no, is. No. All sorts of things. But you yeah. see, 
we've actually seen a few little steering glitches out here. It is pretty challenging to yes. do that. You know, yes. I have a lot of admiration for these blind boats. Yes. And, um, you know, as you were just describing, you have obviously been in both. Sometimes you don't want to hear a coxswain telling you what to do. <laughs> well, and, you know, that was just all that whole conversation was just to say that the amount of respect, especially as a young athlete, uh, being able to manage all the things that are going on in a quad, eight oars, four people. They're very fast, very quick. Sometimes you bonk your hands on the recovery and that that's just a good reminder. Got to move the hands a little bit faster um, to make sure I don't hit myself. Yeah, uh, we don't like bloody knuckles. Me. Yeah, yeah. But to be able to steer as well and keep everything going while your your brain is dumping out of your ear because you're also pushing and breathing and maintaining everything else that is going on. So all three of these crews doing a fantastic job uh, getting themselves down the race course here. And this is actually one of the tighter races that we've had this morning. We've seen a couple of runaways with some of the crews, especially on those inside lanes. But that's not the case here. Um, we do have some spacing, but it's not, you know, hasn't been a massive as massive of a walk away for the inside lane crews. Holy Names does seem to be the crew in control from where they are, but it's not the many, many boat lengths that we've seen again with some of the earlier races. Zlack appears to be in second place over third place Casitas Rowing in this three boat second level final of the women's U17 quad. I believe that's the orange flag there. You can see just above the tree in the right side of the picture there is the orange flag, which means it's about 500 meters to go. Depending on the speed of the hull, that's a handful of tens. If you can get your speed up and going, again, you can't. it's never exact. Conditions change things. Size of hull changes things. Stroke rate changes things. So there's an approximation. It always impresses me when you work with those coxswains that know, and it is spot on or within a stroke or two, how many strokes it takes until you get to the end of the course. And, you know, at this point, they might just be counting a handful at a time. <laughs> but out there in Holy Names, you can see they do have open water over the, the rest of the field. Um, we have seen those crews on the inside take a little bit of, take the leads and just kind of steadily step themselves away from the competition. That didn't happen until that third 500. It was pretty close until that point. And that's when Holy Names, where the efficiency from the first part of the race certainly paid off when they crossed that thousand. Absolutely. And you certainly don't want to be wrong when you're saying, mm. when you're calling those last few mm. tens, mm -hmm. you, know, you really mm -hmm. want to be accurate as you're coming in. And um, yeah, it looks like we just with a few minor steering issues here, a little bit of separation now, but overall, this has been a pretty great race. And with only three boats in the race too, it's also a little bit quieter, mm. like a little mm. bit less chaotic than just eight lanes across. So a little bit quieter. The weather has been beautiful. Mission Bay has really been yes. kind to us this morning. Gosh, so they don't even have to go out there and deal with the wake and the you know the jet skis that get out there and yeah. the wind through the bridges so it's really it seems like a just a very quiet scene out there you know they can just focus on the rowing and you can see uh, holy names is about to come into your to your uh, line of sight if it's if they aren't already give them a hand even if you don't know anyone in this race right now give them a hand because they're all out here doing a solid doing solid work this morning it's only 9 45 in the morning and here we are a bunch of races already and a bunch of people already feeling that 2k cough i love that you bring up the quiet being in a boat without a coxswain, so especially when you get into the doubles, pairs, singles, those boats, it's nearly dead silent, and you just hear the plop of the blade in the water. It's, it's such a different experience in terms of sound audibly. When you're in a, a boat without a coxswain, when you're in a boat with four or fewer people, you can hear what people are saying on shore. You can hear things. You can hear someone bellow your name or your team's name, and you can certainly hear that horn at the finish line because you are thinking about it halfway through. So, start to finish, Holy Names, followed by Zlack in lane three, with Casitas rowing in between them, rounding out this field of three in the women's U17 second level final of the quad.
Faster Masters Rowing is your partner for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Faster Masters proudly sponsors the new Intermediate Masters 8s at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. For more than 40 years, JL Racing has been designing and manufacturing technical training and racing apparel for rowers. JL builds the highest quality technical garments in the industry with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. We make custom art for your team easy with free art and quick turn creative designs. At JL, we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing, building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge. Call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. Orboard, the ultimate fitness, fun, and adventure product. The Orboard rower converts any paddleboard into a sculling boat that's fun and excellent exercise. With a convenient Orboard travel bag, you can transport the rower anywhere, meaning you're no longer bound to row only at a club. Enjoy the freedom of getting out on your favorite lake, river, or ocean, or even take it along when you head off for vacation. Orboard, row anywhere for fitness, fun, and adventure. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination and is vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. SDTMD is pleased to support the San Diego Crew Classic in 2023 for its 50th anniversary.
And ladies and gentlemen, we're just about five minutes away from the start of our first collegiate race of the day. And this is a big one. It's the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. And we are going to see seven boats on the course. We'll be back in just a minute with the race call. Up next, we will have the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational will be the first level final. This is the first collegiate race of the morning. This cup was first awarded in 1983 uh, as it inaugurated. This was the first uh, Invitational Women's Varsity race, and it was brought in to match the Men's Copley Cup. So this race has been here since 1983, and the name has since been changed to the Jessup Whittier Cup, updated for that. Um, So again, this cup was first awarded in 1983 as the inaugural Women's Varsity Invitational event to match the Men's Copley Cup. And setting the field for you here with this seven-boat final. We do have one ex exhibition crew in this event, hence the seven-boat final. In lane one, you will have Texas, who won their heat to arrive here. Lane two, our other heat winner, Stanford. Lane three, Oxford Brooks one of two international crews here. Lane four is California. Lane five, Washington. Lane six is USC. And in lane seven is Rowing Canada. That is our exhibition entry in this seven boat final. In our current standings with the CRCA, the Collegiate Rowing Coaches Association polls, that's the women's NCAA polling in the ranking, Texas is currently ranked number one early season. Stanford is currently ranked number two. They placed one and two at last year's NCAA champion, championships. In lane five, we have Washington. They were set as uh, placing in ranking, currently ranked fifth, with Cal currently ranked in seventh, and USC currently ranked in 16th. So among these seven crews, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five that are in the top 20 in the women's NCAA standings. That's right. And, you know, here we go. Early season racing. This is going to portend what the rest of this racing season looks like for a lot of these ladies. This is the start. This is a lot of high pressure. And having side-by-side -side seven boats, we're not going to see that much of that throughout the regular racing season. It's going to be stocked with a lot of duels, and uh, this is sure to be an exciting race as we head down the course. Texas looking to retain the trophy from last year, and of course, the start of that season uh, saw an undefeated streak that culminated in an NCAA championship. But also, looking at the times from yesterday, really quite close between Texas and Stanford, and then quite close between Washington and 
California with Oxford Brooks and Canada in the mix and then close uh, to them is USC rounding out the field. So taking a look from the start, Texas is not known for a super, super fast start, quite patient actually. So looking out um, at the field, it does look like Stanford as well as Rowing Canada have popped out to those first two spots with California mm -hmm. also in the mix. And as we've seen through the second 500, we'll find crews that aren't necessarily first off the start, or if they are, they'll get out into that base rhythm and then just allow that to, the, to keep them efficient as they move their way down the course. Still very tight among all crews. Contact, at least for the first few hundred meters, among all rowing Canada out in lane seven there, off to a much better start than they had yesterday, maintaining s solid contact among the leaders on those inside lanes. But it was, you know, at least five or six of these crews all had fantastic starts off of the line staying well within one another how do you stay composed at 40 45 plus strokes a minute and then lengthen out from there to keep on motoring for what's really going to give you the 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 meat of the of the race that's going to make the big difference that's this right. middle thousand yeah and i went ahead and clocked stanford at 37 and a half strokes a minute that's a pretty good base rate very very solid right now stanford looking at about a six seat advantage over texas texas i would say more of a slow burn crew so you know not having to win it in the first 500 but really coming on strong a little bit later so we'll keep an eye on them but right now Texas looking really strong here trying to pull their coxswain up to the deck of the Texas boat and really establish a solid lead and Stanford there our early leaders they have broken open water over Oxford Brooks and they want to break clear of California rowing Canada is another crew out there on that outside that's up there with Stanford and Texas those are the three boats in lanes one two and seven who are out among the leaders right now with a very close race happening between Oxford Brooks California and Washington Cal is just an edge slight advantage yep. to California right there just yep. by about two seats over Washington yep. Washington with maybe one seat over Oxford Brooks and then back by a bit of open water, it will be USC. But take a look at these two top crews. As we come into 750 meters gone, it is Rowing Canada and Stanford almost side by side. I'm going to give a slight advantage to Rowing Canada for the lead spot and Stanford still maintaining about a half a length which Texas seems to be eating into that half length over Stanford uh, so through this third 500 of the race as they get across that thousand we'll see what happens will both of those crews maintain their speed because again it's not necessarily the crew that picks up speed as you go but the one that gets up there stays up there and maintains without tapering down so can they find that extra gear is this enough all that I need right now and then click hit this point and off we go see if we can find another level because it may be April it's April second now no april fooling here today on this one this is sunday this, <laughs> this is our final this is day the of the season <laughs> this is absolutely something we haven't mentioned yet about this race this is a race that people across the country are looking at right now that's right. because there is other racing happening at the collegiate level in the ncaa but they're going to look at this and know a you have texas you have stanford you have cal you have washington you have usc five of those crews in the top 20 here but you also have these international crews that are incredibly fast so this is no joke racing yeah here we go and this is also the first time with all Oxford Brooks showing up. This is the first time that a European crew has competed in the Jessup Whittier Cup, which is just really cool. I mean, what an opportunity uh, for these ladies to be able to compete against some of the best in the world. And of course, they're with Rowing Canada as well out in lane seven. Rowing Canada doing quite well as we come into the last half of this Jessup Whittier Cup final. And it is not common for these crews at the collegiate level to get six let alone seven boats across and have the racing be this tight this pressure filled so it's interesting coming to a regatta like the san diego crew classic very reminiscent of the head of the charles all the things going on the festivities the different layers of rowing that happen here but these collegiate crews i can imagine come down do their race go home recover do the work come back maybe practice on their own we saw texas go out very late last night with their whole crew so really staying in their bubble in their pocket so that they can take care of what's going on and it looks like texas has worked their way through stanford here and wants to take it right back and just continue to extend one stroke at a time. I think this is going to be tight all the way down to the wire. Looking at, at uh, Rowing Canada all the way out on lane seven, but right now I want to focus on lanes one and two, Texas and Stanford. And just like I said, Texas is a bit of a slow burn crew. So the important thing, of course, is what happens at the line. And I think that right when they hit that thousand meter mark, that's where the jump was taken. It was just like kind of an explosion of power there as they took off. And that's where you see the fitness, the depth,
depth and the experience. There are a lot of returning athletes from last year. Stanford, Stanford as well with, um, with a lot of returning athletes from last year. So these two crews going after each other and a ton of firepower and experience. As we come into the spectator area, get down on the beach and watch some of the best rowing in the country right now, if not the world, happening today. And you can see Texas still has the advantage there, that black flag hit. You know that the Coxon called it well before there because Stanford took an early jump. They wanted to sprint and go because they needed to take a seat back. It's still very close rowing. Canada's on the far side, but both Texas and Stanford still have the edge over them. So they're going to be able to, as long as they keep revving it up one stroke at a time, go, go, go for that line. All that you feel here, you can't hear a thing. All that you feel is push one at a time, go, go. Texas with just under a half boat length lead over Stanford as they come through the horns. Listen to them. It'll be very close. Rowing Canada on the far side is going to come across in third unofficially with Oxford Brooks coming across in fourth next to them. And Washington and USC battling it out to the end. It looks like USC was able to nudge over there. Or excuse me, Washington to nudge over California with USC rounding out the field of seven. That's correct. Fantastic composure there by all crews coming across the line to be in contact like that. That was a big race. That's a race that is great set up for the remainder of your season. You know, as a coach, you go, okay, this is how fit we are at this point. We can gain a little bit more, but how can we get cleaner? Where can we find small amounts of speed? What is one thing that we can practice? Go back and just continue to hone. Certainly, all of these athletes are going to get off of the water and do the best that they can to begin the recovery process because they just did the work taking apart the house. The hurricane just came through the system. Now they need to go get some good nutrition, take care of their muscles to refuel and rebuild so they can get better and be ready for their next day of training. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. And up next, we are on the course up at the start. We're going to pull the crews for you for the Men's Collegiate Varsity. This is the Copley Cup Invitational, your first level final. In your three-boat final here, we have California in lane one, Oxford Brooks in lane two, and in lane three is Rowing Canada. Again, another exhibition crew out there in lane three. Very fast start for all three of these boats off of the line. Looking for all of them to get these hulls up and running. And it's going to be a barn burner all the way down the course. It is, absolutely. I was taking a look at the finish times from yesterday. And California uh, won their heat, or won, won the first round, I would say. Not a heat. Um, this is essentially a, um, a round of racing. The, so the first, uh, first event was yesterday. 
yesterday. California won that in a 550, and then Oxford right behind them in a 551. So this is going to be super fun to watch as they come all the way down the course here. Okay, and doing a little bit of a flip of the script from yesterday, it does look like, you know, California is out there. California is out there in front, and Oxford Brooks just kind of lurking there off of the middle of the boat. There is about a half a boat length lead for California. Looks like it's a very similar in terms of, uh, of overall time between those two crews, and then back by a bit of open water, it, it will be rowing Canada. And you mentioned that the, that the finish times were about a, a second apart from one another yesterday. Correct me if I'm wrong. And once you get in these bigger holes that are moving this fast, it is about a half a length-ish or so yep. that creates that second or so of, of distance. And that's about what we were seeing there in that last picture of that half a length margin, which is very similar to what happened, what came down yesterday. But now that these crews are side by side like this... Yeah, and tightening up, actually, as they come down to the line. Oxford Brooks holding tight to that lead that California has and trying to eat into the lead just a little bit. But California Solid winding pressure. it up and really with a ton of horsepower, no sense of, of really urgency or franticness as they just continue to hold off and keep Oxford Brooks at bay. Back by a bit of open water. Finishing now will be Canada. We've set records in Wintech. We really felt the King was the most efficient, effective, and fastest shell out on the water for us. Wintech King is the perfect boat to rep. All hail the King! Yeah! All right, and we are awaiting the start of the Women's Collegiate Varsity UCSD Health Cal Cup Final. We've got six boats on the course. In lane one, San Diego. Lane two, Stanford. Lane three, MIT. Lane four, UC San Diego. Lane five, Loyola Marymount. And lane six, MIT B.
We're going to set the field here for you, but we are already underway and on the course with the Women's Collegiate Varsity UCSD Health Cal Cup. This is the final. It's a six-boat final. We're going to pull it and then pick it up where they are on the course. Lane one is San Diego. Lane two, Stanford again. Lane three, MIT. Lane four, UC San Diego. Lane five, Loyola Marymount. And in lane six is MIT's second entry. Again, these athletes are already underway here, so we will give you an update when we have more. They should be at about the 750 mark um, as of right now. So what we're looking at on the screen is a replay of the start and that first 250 meters where you can see crews jockeying for position. Getting out to a good start of the race is really important because it sets the tone for the whole rest of the piece. So as we pick these guys up, they'll be almost halfway through the course certainly a confidence builder and you know you can never be far enough ahead at that point just set your rhythm set your pace and breathe All right, what we're looking at early on is a lead coming out of lanes two and five, so Stanford and Loyola Marymount with a really good starts. And then as they come in just a little bit closer, we're going to look for some speed from, UC, from San Diego, University of San Diego in lane one. They look to have established themselves in the second half of the race, so pulling themselves up to a lead right now over Stanford with MIT right next to them. So again, we are already within the third 500 approaching about 600 meters to go. Very tight with Stanford and MIT in lanes two and lane three. San Diego was off the pack a little, off the pace a little bit in the beginning of the race, but they were able to come back up and, and give themselves an edge over the rest of the field. So good patience on the part of that crew there through the middle of the race. You keep hearing us talk about the middle of the race. Sometimes there's a little bit of a gap there in the timing. And so we go, and in the middle of the race, a lot of stuff unfolds. So mm -hmm. if you miss it, if you blink, you're going to miss who does what through that minute. Right, because the moves can be a little bit different, you know, Again, we've talked about some crews that race plan is the get ahead, stay ahead plan. Everyone loves that one because you <laughs> just leave nothing. There is no mystery. <laughs> but uh, you, San Diego did uh, not have the, the fastest start. It really was Stanford um, and Loyola Marymount with really hot starts. But now U University of San Diego, the Toreros coming up to a full length lead over Stanford. Stanford with maybe two seats over MIT. That's MIT really, really hot here as they come into the final stroke and then moving over to lanes four and five, UC San Diego and Loyola Marymount quite close to each other. A uh, little bit of an advantage to Loyola Marymount for the uh, fourth place position and then MITB in the sixth place spot. But here they come into 250 meters to go. San Diego, good, good patience for them through that middle portion and they are certainly about a length ahead over the rest of the field right now. Still very tight in those two red holes between Stanford and MIT in lanes two and three. Who's going to find another gear in these last 10 to 15 strokes of the race? But it is San Diego ahead of the field by a solid margin at this point in the race with the final strokes coming down to it and it is MIT taking the edge. It looks like they want to take the edge over Stanford. Still very close between those two crews with another tight race happening between UC San Diego and Loyola Marymount. It looks like UC San Diego certainly has a couple of seats over Loyola Marymount. MIT's second entry on the outside, the only one with a little bit of water back. Wow. I'm not even going to call between Stanford and MIT. Yeah, not even going to call it. Even to my eye, and I'm sitting directly across the finish to watch that, is I'm not going to take a guess till we see those official results. But University of San Diego, the Toreros, really great to win here at home right in front of your biggest fans on the shoreline. With UC San Diego taking the edge over Loyola Marymount and MIT's B entry on the outside lane in lane six, rounding out this field in the Women's Collegiate Varsity UCSD Health Cal Cup 
first level final. And it does look like MIT squeaked out that second place, fin uh, second place finish just by about a tenth of a second uh -huh. over Stanford. Yeah, yeah you can. Amazing. All right. All right, and here we go. We are right back at it with the men's collegiate varsity active and fit now Cal Cup. Uh, this is eight boats across. So right now we're looking at UC San Diego out of lane one, Gonzaga out of lane two, San Diego lane three, UCLA lane four, Purdue in lane five, UC Davis in lane six, Southern California in lane seven, and UC Santa Barbara in lane eight. And it is UCLA currently right now who has just a nudge of an early lead. All the crews, especially in those middle five lanes, one, two, three, four, five, UC San Diego, Gonzaga, San Diego, UCLA, and Purdue are sticking with one another. No one wants to give an inch. It's, it's eight boats across. Why am I saying five? It's eight boats across. Everyone's well within contact. We're only about a minute, not quite a minute and a half into this race, but UCLA setting that early pace. It looked like Purdue in the black hole right next to them wanted to go along, which is doing them a favor because it's helping them maintain contact with lane one. You see San Diego who is taking Gonzaga along with them. There are these two boat races, two boat races, two boat races, and it's it's keeping the boat that maybe is the third boat back in contact with other crews that are all going very fast. This so far is the tightest race of the morning, at least through the first five, 600 meters. Yeah, definitely. So UCLA with that hot start, Purdue also right there. So Purdue now taking the advantage to the lead position to get there, excuse me, UC San Diego taking the lead um, to uh, take over that lead from UCLA. So coming on a little bit later, so in, la in the first half of this race, it was UCLA with their nose out in front, but then UC San Diego just maybe a little bit more patient. So they are now your new leader. And then we're gonna look to Gonzaga and Purdue to round out the top three crews. Very tight with Gonzaga and Purdue, or San Diego and Purdue in lanes three and lane five as UC San Diego, Gonzaga and UCLA are now the three crews that want to assert themselves very tight between Gonzaga and UCLA. So we've seen all morning, all weekend, all sport that the middle thousand is the difference yep. maker. And you can watch that right now as there starts to become a little bit more separation between crews, opening up a little bit more water. We've got University of San Diego rowing out of lane three. They are in the fifth place position. And then in sixth, it's going to be UC Davis, USC and UC Santa Barbara, but really tight here between UC Davis and Southern California for that sixth or seventh place spot. Just a little bit behind by about four seats, it will be UC Santa Barbara currently in eighth. But the hot race is up front, and now it is between UC San Diego and Gonzaga. Those two crews closest together, UCLA falling off the pace just a little bit and coming back into a third place position, but still sitting bow to stern over both University of San Diego and Purdue. And the race that's happening in lanes six and seven between Southern California and UC Davis is also quite hot. They are neck and neck. You can see a little bit of steering happening over there in those lanes six and lane seven. But that race there, because that is so high pressure, a maturity needs to happen out there. But because of the high pressure happening on the outside lanes, that could put pressure on the middle lanes, which will then kind of nudge them up. So having all these crews in the lanes that they're in with Purdue, UCLA, San Diego, Gonzaga, that, that helps this whole field, the way that it's laid out to really maintain contact, just as you mentioned, the things that were happening in the outside lanes. Southern California looked like they took a move. They maybe picked it up a little bit. You could see the boat taking a little bit of distance with UC Davis. But again, still San Diego out in, you see San Diego, excuse me, out in front in that inside lane, mm -hmm. taking a few of those crews uh, along with them between Gonzaga and San Diego. And we've talked about it all morning or all weekend, really, is how crucial the coxswain is. In an eight-boat race, there is so much action. And a lot of these crews, you're not going to see this again throughout the season. Uh, maybe a couple of times at, at, you know, some of the bigger regattas, but this is probably the only time that they're going to see eight boats across, and this is one of the few venues that can actually support that. But UC San Diego, again, a hometown team, get down to the shoreline to support these guys as they continue to hold off Gonzaga. Gonzaga trying furiously to take away a little bit of that lead and pushing themselves so hard that they've now opened up open water over UCLA, and 
and University of San Diego and Purdue. So close, really tight here between Purdue and San Diego. And this is one of those moments as a coach and as a coxswain. Have you had this conversation? I always wonder when coaches and coxswains, maybe, maybe the coach pulls the coxswain aside and says, if this happens, this is the back pocket plan. Will any of these crews sprint a little bit earlier mm -hmm. to gain that margin that maybe was taken away or vice versa? Can we sprint a little bit earlier to get a jump on everyone else, surprise them, take a little more distance to make the final closing 250 meters? Rather than waiting for that black flag, can we go a few strokes sooner to take whatever we can get as we sprint? But here we go, UC San Diego. The Tritons moving through their final 250 meters. They are extending their lead out now about six to seven seats over Gonzaga. Gonzaga from Washington, the cold northwest. They come down to sunny San Diego, and here they are making a statement, trying to chase down UC San Diego in this men's collegiate varsity cup. And UCLA looking to make a charge here and see if they can get back and get some margin here with San Diego, put pressure on them. Side by side racing when you're sprinting. How do you stay where you don't even know where you are? Out of your peripheral vision as an athlete you could be a boat ahead and not even realize it but right now from where you see San Diego sits they probably know and their coxswain has certainly told them that they're nearly a length ahead of her second placed Gonzaga it right is now. looking tight though between UCLA and University of San Diego UCLA has got to get that sprint in if they want to hold on to that third place position it is so tight here between those two crews keep your eye on that finish line UCLA, UCLA over San Diego and unofficially. <laughs> it is that Couple is of seats. as close as it's going to get. Followed by Purdue in the black hole there. UC Davis in the next lane, lane six coming across the line and getting tighter and tighter between Southern California and UC Santa Barbara there. Santa Barbara having a great last quarter here to nudge back up into them. Just a couple of seats behind Southern California, rounding out this magnificent field of eight in the men's collegiate varsity active and fit now Cal Cup. And I do want to point out while we have uh, time, a little bit of time between races that this is such a great sec cross section of programs right here. We're looking at varsity programs, again, sponsored by the university, and then a, um, a, a club program like Purdue, Davis, uh, Southern California, student-run programs. They really guide the direction of the program. They are very instrumental in deciding what the, um, what the race schedule is going to look like. They're doing fundraising. They're coaching. It's just so much more than just mm -hmm. showing up at practice in the morning. So, you know, just hats off to them um, to be able to come in here, be so competitive. That was such a tightly packed field that mm -hmm. I think it's important to note, no matter what your finish is, um, how far you've come to get to this point. Okay, and we are looking at uh, getting ready to start the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four. This is the Karen Plumley Courtney Cup. Karen Plumley Courtney was a local resident who passed away at a fairly young age, and her family dedicates this trophy to her. This is the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four. We have eight boats on the water. This is sure to be a, another hot one. In lane one, we've got Texas. Lane two, Stanford. Lane three, California. Lane four, Washington. Lane five, USC. Lane six, Notre Dame. 
lane seven, San Diego, and lane eight, Washington State. And here they go. All right, and very early on in the race, we're going to take a look at what you're looking at right there with that black flag. flag. That is the first 250 meters, and um, early, early on, Notre Dame jumped out to an early lead, but and they are still in the mix. But right now, we're looking at Stanford, California, and Washington with Notre Dame as well. Those are your top four crews. In the outside lane, Texas is also kind of crawling their way into the mix. But Stanford, California, Washington, top three crews. Moving over to lane six, Notre Dame also still in contact. All these boats within contact to each other. You know, you brought up Notre Dame. They had a great showing in their fours in previous races at Cardinal Invite, that sort of thing. So uh, will their four vie with these top crews, which would be a great kind of uh, booster for the program in terms of confidence of, okay, let's see where we are compared to the rest of the field. Some of the top in the country are here in this event across these, you know, not just perennial powerhouses of Tex Texas and Stanford and California and Washington. You've got USA, all these crews. Um, but this year as well. It's one thing to be perennial. It's quite another to be like, okay, where are we this year? All yep. right. And very similarly to what we saw in the eights, it's Stanford right now as your early leader, but just by about a bow ball over California. California looking for a slight lead over Washington. All right, and Texas and Washington side by side in that third or fourth place position also doing well. Notre Dame out there is a little bit tough for them. They've got a little bit more distance between themselves and the, the top three crews, but that coxswain taking a look across. It looks like Texas coming up to take over from Notre Dame for the fourth place position. And Texas certainly looking at this point, the ha you know, they're past halfway of the race at this point, seeing them have these late, not surges, but late just consistencies. And so it looked like they were maybe starting to move on Stanford. Uh, we had Stanford and California out ahead of them, and it looked like maybe they were trying to take a little bit of edge back here late in the game, which is, you know, that that's, exactly that's the prime time to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're looking at right now. So that little bit of jump in time, that is where Texas took off right at that halfway point. And now you can see where they're at live in this race. They now have open water over the field. So there is Texas. Again, they had been sitting in fourth or fifth place and then just slowly chip away at the competition. And here they are occupying that first place position. Behind them, it's going to be Stanford. Stanford looking at about a stern advantage over California. California, two seats over Washington. And then uh, it does look to be Notre Dame still in the fifth place spot. If we can take a look uh, out a little bit. All right, we're going to look at San Diego in lane seven for sixth place, followed by USC, and then finally Washington State. And with this one with Stanford and Cal, you have Texas that overtook the lead. With It looked like Washington was looking to make an earlier sprint, see if they could get back into California and Stanford. Those three crews were looking pretty consistent, and sure enough, Washington is making a move. They are crawling up ever so slightly, even though they have taken back some of the margin that California had on them. They are definitely putting pressure on. They haven't overtaken California yet, and the race between California and Washington has not allowed them to overtake Stanford. Stanford still has a solid margin over them, but it is still Texas who has a solid margin on Texas. the rest of the field as they cross the line. That's right, Texas with their bow first across the line. California Stanford. inching back up. They're about to trade places potentially all the way across the line. That one's going to be too close to call. Stanford is there for second unofficially, and Cal may have nudged out Washington. Not quite certain. Fantastic, valiant effort by Washington to surge a little bit later in maybe 300 meters to go. Next across the line. Notre Dame followed by USC again unofficially. Over on the far side, Washington, t Washington State and San Diego rounding out the field. Amazing sprint. You know, I got to give it to Washington. They sprinted early. They knew where they were, and they needed to get a little bit more a little bit sooner, maybe, maybe 
pulled a card out of the hat and said, we need this now on the fly. That's oh. maturity. Well, in looking at these unofficial times, of course, that was a really tight one. And to be honest, that was whoever's blades were in the water yeah, as they yeah. crossed the finish line. And it did err on the side of Washington taking that third place position by two tenths of a second. Believe two until two, you hear the horn. I don't know my math. What is that? That's uh, two one hundredths of a we second. We don't do math up here. I don't it's do too math. Many yeah, it was very <laughs> close. Let's just say it was very yeah. close. Seven thirty four oh one. Fantastic racing across the entire field. Yeah, and really great showing here um, by Notre Dame in the four. Again, that's going to be their strong suit throughout the season. Sponsored by the James S. Copley family, the Copley Cup is considered one of the marquee races of the Crew Classic. This coveted prize recognizes the longtime support of the Copley family since the first Crew Classic in 1973. Since 1975, the Copley Cup has been presented to the winner of the Invitational Race for Top Men's Collegiate Varsity Crews. The San Diego Crew Classic is grateful for 50 years of support from the James S. Copley Family Fund. We are already underway in the Women's Collegiate 2V Jackie Ann Stitt Hungness Trophy. This is your first level final. Again, an eight-boat final here with some serious competition. Laying it down right now out here on Mission Bay this Sunday morning. Lane 1 is Stanford. Lane 2, Texas. Lane 3, California. Lane 4, Washington. Lane 5, USC. Lane 6, Washington State. Lane 7, San Diego, and in Lane 8 is Notre Dame. So we have a cross-section of conferences across the women's collegiate uh, picture uh, across the nation right now. Again, people are watching these races this morning here on Mission Bay. Our early leaders in the race uh, earlier on were Stanford. Washington was going right with them. But, of course, in the early stages of the race, it's anybody's game. It's get the hole up to speed. It's a lot of load to get up and moving. But once it's up and moving, that's really where the game-changing uh, strokes happen. That's right. And so we're going to keep our eyes on lanes one, two, three, and four because they are the closest together, just separated out by seats. And that is exactly what we're looking at right now. It does look like Stanford has held on to the lead in the second 500. They've got Washington in the second place spot, followed right very closely by California with Texas in fourth. But we'll see in that third 500. That's what's happened all day long as we've watched the race plan take off. Texas wants to defend that title. They want to go home with this Jackie Ann Stitt trophy again and indeed it is a tight race still between Stanford, Texas, California, Washington. It's in even maybe a slight advantage going to be going back to Washington for that lead. Washington challenging Stanford for that top spot. Certainly challenging over California for that. Those two boats going back and forth. We just saw it in the four and, and right now at least through the middle portion that we were seeing a few moments ago, Washington had, had edged up on California. Too tight to call at this point in the race because there's so many strokes left to take. But all those crews, just like Adrian said, lanes one, two, three, and four, so tight between them. And knowing how some of the crews have had fast starts getting off from there, taking through those middle portions of the race, sometimes we're seeing large lead changes happening mm -hmm. in that third 500 of the race. And remember, USC out there as well, a very strong Pac-12 crew. We've got USC in that in that that fifth fifth place position with Notre Dame in sixth, San Diego in seventh, Washington State in eighth. A lot of speed happening in the middle of the course this morning, this midday that we're having here on in sunny San Diego. It is still tight between Washington and California, certainly tight on those inside lanes cru lane crews with Texas and Stanford as well. All of these athletes are believing every single stroke down the course until that those finish line horns blare, and they are about to get past. You see that black flag if you're here on shore. That's 250 meters to go. That's that critical point that isn't necessarily where they're going to start their 
their sprint, but you know that every crew is at least within their sprint there. It is still in lane two with an edge over lane one here coming down the line. Again, you said that slow burn that's happening there uh, where the, the, the speed really just starts to steamroll and pick up. Snowball is a better word for it. It just mm -hmm. continues as they ramp it up through the whole full 2,000 meter piece. So Stanford and Texas on those inside lanes. Again, your teams one and two out of last year's NCAA championships and the year before. So they are certainly used to competing with one another. They probably aren't just looking at each other. They're probably looking at let's do something no one has ever done before. Let's find new speed. That's Can right. they find even more right now? And as we come to the line, it does look like Texas. Here they come. They have pulled themselves. What an amazing sprint and what a change around in that last 500 between these top four crews. And so Cal and Washington Texas just edging out Stanford for that lead. It's going to be really tight here as we come into the final strokes. Texas just by a few seats over Stanford and then California, Washington duking it out just as they did in that previous race. But California holding on to that third place position just a seat or two over Washington. And now here comes USC, USC occupying that fifth place position with a bit of open water over Washington State. And then finally San Diego and Notre Dame to round out this women's collegiate 2V. And we are just getting underway in our next race, the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Cup. This is your first level final, another eight lane across eight boat final here. In lane one is California. We saw California yesterday all weekend so far with many, uh, many lineups out here on the water, many eights and doing very well across the board in all of them. So in lane one is California. Lane two is California 3V. Lane three is UC San Diego A. Lane four, Gonzaga. Lane five, Purdue. Lane six, UC San Diego's 3V. Lane seven is UCLA. And in lane eight is UC Davis. Again, this is the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Cup first level final. That's right, and California 2V and 3V well out in front here. So behind them, that's where the real battle is going on right now between UC San Diego and Gonzaga for that second or third place position. Those two boats pushing themselves so much that they already have a full boat length plus over the remaining field. So nice racing as well between Purdue, UC San Diego, 3V, UCLA, and UC Davis. And it looked like just in that moment that UCLA was trying to take the edge. It's very tight between UC San Diego's 3V and UCLA uh, because Purdue is the crew that's just ahead of them. And that race that is happening, that race that is happening among those three crews is helping them push up into our leaders. California's 2V and 3V certainly going head to head. Abs for sure, they're seeing each other in practice. So is this the 2V that wants to beat the 3V, the 3V and vice versa? Are those guys, Absolutely. We, we talked about not defending your seat, but earning your seat every single day. Is this earning someone a seat right now? There's a lot on the That's line, right. no matter where you sit in any of these seats. That's right. But Lindsay, I want to take a look at the fifth, sixth, and seventh place position because that is tight between Purdue, UC San Diego, 3 and UCLA. I'm going to give the very, very slight advantage right now to UC San Diego 3V over UCLA, but it's like bow ball to bow ball. It's just whose blades are in the water at what time, and it's just going back and forth. Sliding off the pace just slightly is Purdue. UC Davis continuing in lane eight, but well out in front, it is California 2V and 3V. The 
the margin between those two boats really hasn't changed, but what has changed is the distance between them and the rest of the field. And the margin that, that is this between those two California boats is very similar to the margin that UC San Diego A has over Gonzaga, and that then that three-boat uh, race that we have going on. UC San Diego's 3V is the one that's in the middle. It's a mini Chevron happening over there where you have UC San Diego flanked by Purdue and UCLA. UCLA, uh, Purdue, excuse me, in the black boat, uh, UC San Diego in the red boat, UCLA in the yellow boat. And those three crews, they reset themselves to that San Diego, UC San Diego, Purdue, and UCLA. And they've kind of been sitting with similar margin ever since. It's like through this middle portion of the race, whatever margin was taken about 500 meters ago is where everyone's kind of sitting. So who is going to choose to make the move? Or are they all making moves? Are they all dialing it in? And they're just that even of speed. That's right. And, you know, for a, a lot of these crews, I would say, you know, when you're well out in front, like California is with their two boats, you are looking at this as a test. Let's say that you're sitting in that 3B boat and you want to be in the 2V, you want to be in the varsity, you know, vice mm -hmm. versa. These guys are testing their metal against the best in their program. And it is a buy-in from top to bottom. So whether you're or not you're in that 6V boat or you're in the 1B v boat, you are trying your best every single day, testing yourself. And that's exactly why we put these two California boats out there on, on the course is to test each other within the program. It's really just a phenomenal testament to their depth um, and, you know, pushing themselves this far up. We're going to take a look at these times. They're going to be fast and, you know, they are going to be competitive even with their varsity boat. And it does look like for that, for the uh, two boats, UC San Diego and Gonzaga, they're still battling one another. UC San Diego still ahead of Gonzaga. Maybe they've taken a few more seats. And through that three boat race at Purdue, UC San Diego's 3V and UCLA, you know, it looks like maybe uh, two of those crews are starting to slip away a little bit. Purdue may be slipping back from them. But, you know, you're talking about, you know, California's 2V, 3V. Well, you see San Diego A and you see San Diego their 3V is out there too so maybe That's those right. folks are out there doing the same having the same thoughts in mind of right. where are we earning what are we doing for our whole program yeah and I love seeing 3Vs on the water you know with that Maybe there are novices in there. It's quite possible. It's not impossible, especially at this level that you have, depending on how deep the program is. Uh, so, again, shows Look depth at this. and speed. Yeah. Look at this race up front, <laughs> though, between the two California boats. Again, the margin between these two boats really has not changed. But I, it, it doesn't mean that like they're just one sitting seat there. smaller. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they are not sitting. I mean, that has got to be a if race. If you're not on shore right now, <laughs> get down there because you're going to see the last 30 strokes of fire come out of those two inside lanes That's and lanes right. one and two. Can the 3V overtake the 2V here it in is, this race? You know, and they uh, they have moved up a little bit. They've taken some inches away from lane one. That's grit. That's gumption. That's determination. Sit back. The stroke gets a little bit shorter with the body, but stays long in the legs. Nice, strong shove, showing just a little bit of quickness. That way, blades go straight to the water. Can we get the hull moving just a little bit more lightly? They have certainly taken away that lead that was t taken by the 2V on the inside lane in lane one. So it is a very small margin. It is still lane one ahead. So California's A versus B, so 2V versus 3V here, but just by a few seats, you know, maybe a third of a length or so. And then we still have this similar margin maintained between UC San Diego A and Gonzaga about a half length lengthening out. Uh, UC San Diego seems to be lengthening out from Gonzaga here as the line comes. They're trying to pull it at their one stroke at a time. And then it still is over on the far side, that three boat race within this race that we saw with UC San Diego's 3V. Purdue did just slip back from that th that race. Uh, and so now UC San Diego has open water over them. But UCLA is still maintaining a just overlap as they come down to the line with UC San Diego. UC Davis still on the course here in this men's collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Cup first level final. And important to note that this trophy is sponsored by Sharp, which is one of the main sponsors of the San Diego Crew Classic. They have been a supporter uh, since 1982. And so we thank them for their continued support of the Crew Classic. And they are also sponsoring this lovely brunch that's happening right next to us. There's some music and good food. Um, and you know, thank you so much to the, the sponsors of the Crew Classic. We couldn't do it without you.
All right, and here we go with another grand final. This is the Women's Grace Rett Memorial Collegiate Varsity D2, D3, and Club Final. In lane one, Purdue. Lane two, Clark. Lane three, Trinity B. Lane four, Trinity A. Lane five, UC Davis. And lane six, UC Santa Barbara A. And we do want to call out uh, the dedication of this trophy is to Grace Rett, a really tragic loss of an athlete in the sport of rowing. This trophy named in honor of Grace Rett, who was a rower at Holy Cross College. Um, she was killed, unfortunately, in a car accident during a winter training camp. And Grace actually had a world record to her name for the longest time on an indoor rower at 62 hours and three seconds. I can't even imagine uh, the strength and uh, fortitude of that young woman and just such a tragic loss. And Clark University here from Worcester, Massachusetts, they are dedicating this race to Grace. So we will look for them to have uh, an excellent showing. And that's exactly what's happening right now as we see Clark is your leader Second 500 of this race, they have about a length lead over Purdue. And at least earlier on in this race, it looked like Trinity B's lineup was a, uh, had an edge over Trinity A's lineup, but it was Clark that had the early lead at least through the second 500 or so of this race. Purdue was a little bit back of them in that in that lane one, but it is Clark that was ahead, uh, as you mentioned, dedicating this race to them. So perhaps that's giving them a little bit of extra fire here in the the Women's Grace Rep Memorial Collegiate uh, Varsity Eights here, the D2, three, and club. And that's, you know, what we're seeing with this field is a good cross-section of those, uh, those represented categories. We've got um, club programs in UC Davis and UC Santa Barbara. Clark is uh, a D3 program. Purdue also that student run, um, Purdue that student run club program. Trinity B and Trinity A, those are your D3 programs as well. And it looks as, th as though Trinity A did some work through the middle portion of that race. It does look like they're sitting in second place at this point. Clark A still out our leaders currently at this point in the race as they approach the last 500 or so. Again, the orange flags are your 500s. The black flags are your 250s. And so no matter where you are, again, whether you have someone in this race or not, get down to shore and give them some ears. They can probably hear the music occurring if they can still hear at this point. But uh, you'll hear the cheers echoing across the waterway, certainly getting into the last 500. From where we sit here by the finish line, we can see just that little bit of the black flag waving for that 250. And once they hit that, maybe even before that, you'll see the crews start to rev up their stroke rate just a little bit. But remember, the stroke rate itself does not necessarily correlate to more boat speed. you got to do it with the legs. you got to do it with a little bit of more technical dexterity so you can maintain some quickness to get the boat to move along better as you rev up the rate. You want those blades to keep going to the water. Oops. And the two boats up front that we're going to take a look at will be Clark and Trinity A. I had both of those crews clocked at 35 strokes a minute. And then looking on the inside, I am looking at um, a really nice showing here from UC Santa Barbara A out in lane six. Purdue falling off the pace just a little bit, um, with, but really tight between Purdue and UC Santa Barbara as we come into these final strokes. But Clark still trying to hold on to that top spot, being pushed very hard here by Trinity. Clark made a, got almost a length over the rest of the field early on, and it was enough to get them up ahead, but is it enough to keep them up ahead? Because Trinity A has had a great middle of the race, and they are certainly doing some work here in the last 15 strokes of this race to eat away that, le that lead that Clark has had since the beginning. It is no longer the better part of three quarters of a length. It's just a matter of seats, maybe a half a length or less. And as we say that, Purdue and on the outside, you mentioned a moment ago, you see Santa Barbara A having a great race. Those two crews are very, very close. Purdue may have edged back ahead of UC Santa Barbara here and it looks like they have but again everything from the tent is unofficial but those are the first four crews across the line Clark A, Trinity A, on the inside lane Purdue in the black hole and on the far side of the race course UC Santa Barbara following them is going to be Trinity 
Trinity's B boat in the yellow hull coming across the line, hearing that horn for them. And UC Davis rounding out our field of six here in the Grace, the women's Grace Rat Memorial Collegiate Varsity Division Two, Three, and Club. This is your first level final in that event. And what a great way to win that race when you have dedicated uh, your season and this race to the woman who the trophy is named after and you get to take that home what an inspiration for your season two things you mentioned a moment ago adrian 62 hours on the machine the other thing i mentioned this yesterday clark you know in conversation with them most of those athletes are walk-ons and um so to be able to hop in a boat i shouldn't say hop in a boat to find a sport that is life-changing come together and do some really special things to connect to something like this trophy to have another layer of inspiration to uh, carry you down the race course just you know those are just really special moments that you'll never forget i know rowing entered my life and has since changed it and i'm sure i'm not the only one who can say that with absolute certainty All right, and a quick update from the course. We are already underway, uh, well underway, in the B-level final of the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. We've got just two boats on the course with Notre Dame and Washington State side by side. So this is really more of a duel, a little bit different than eight boats across. Uh, so the mentality is different. But again, Notre Dame's had a really great regatta, and we're looking at that right now as they take the lead early on over Washington State. All right, and we could not have two more different programs out on the water right now between Notre Dame and Washington State. Notre Dame, an ACC team. Uh, again, they had some early season success at that Cardinal invite where they faced teams such as Tennessee, Yale, Louisville, um, Alabama. There was a good cross-section of racing for them. So then extending that challenge by coming all the way out to the West Coast to race Washington State, a Pac-12 team um, from the strongest, I'm going to say the strongest conference in the nation. Put myself out on a limb and say that. So Washington State here um, with a very strong and historic program. But right now Notre Dame taking the upper hand as they attempt to break free of Washington State as they come down to the last 500 meters of this race. Again, this is just the B-level final for the Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup.
All right, and Notre Dame coming into their final strokes here in the spectator area. Again, this is Notre Dame's uh, first time at the Crew Classic since 2009. So hoping to make that a regular part of their season. It's been really fun to have them out here and competing with the likes of Stanford, Washington, California, and now Washington State. So moving ahead of Washington State with a bit of open water over the Cougars. Washington State doing a nice job. Both bo both boats clocked at about 35 strokes a minute through the body of their piece, but here they are winding it up for the sprint phase and wrapping up their weekend in this varsity category. In 1996, the Chapman brothers, Ron and Rick, opened a brew pub in their hometown of Coronado. Today, Coronado Brewing Company stays true to its San Diego roots, brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales. Coronado won a bronze medal at the 2019 Great American Beer Festival for its Weekend Vibes IPA, a silver medal for its Salty Crew Blonde in 2020, and a gold medal for its Palm Sway IPA in 2021. Coronado Brewing Company, stay coastal. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years, thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking, Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. And we are already on the course underway with the next race. It's the Men's Collegiate Varsity Active and Fit Now Cal Cup. This is the second level final. It is a three boat a final. So on the inside lane closest to shore, for those of you who are, who are here viewing on the inside closest to shore, is going to be lane one, Loyola Marymount. Lane two, Colorado. Lane three, San Diego State. Again, the Men's Collegiate Varsity 8. Active and Fit Now Cal Cup second level final already underway on the course. Early on in the race, in the first 500 meters or so, uh, it was Loyola Marymount, Marymount with, or sorry, excuse me, Colorado, with an early lead on the other two boats, kind of flanking them to the sides. But as we've seen all morning long, a lot develops through that second 500, and certainly in the third 500 of the race, the biggest changes occurring through the 
m kind of middle, exact middle of the race as they cross over that thousand uh, between 750 and 1250 meters. And we've talked before. How do you how do you make that better? Well, that's that's called December. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is better in December. Exactly that second 500, the third 500 when you make cross it that line. Day. It's it's almost like it's that imaginary line at the halfway point where you're like, okay, we can do anyone can do anything for a thousand meters, but it's what happens after that that really makes the difference. And we have been watching that all weekend. So that fitness it really is showing right now in that third 500 but look at this race this is actually pretty exciting here between Colorado and Loyola Marymount so the Lions of Loyola Marymount and Colorado the buffs uh, pushing each other so hard um, and it looks like Colorado taking the upper hand as they come into the final 500 meters San Diego State the Aztecs um, just a little bit off the pace back by a bit of open water that is a club program here probably buoyed by the um, men's basketball team that has done so well in the final four we are all paying attention to that <laughs> sure super exciting but that's got to give you a little bit uh, more adrenaline a little bit more pride Especially being local, that was pretty special to see on the news. I had no idea coming from afar. But uh, it was Colorado with an early lead, took about you know a quarter length, something like that, early on in the first 500 meters of the race. And they have maintained that. They've maintained their control all the way down through the course. They haven't continued to extend too much. They have extended a bit, but they haven't you know taken quarter length, quarter length, quarter length every 500 meters down the race course. And certainly as we come into the closing stages of this, that's when the horses to the barn, you can smell the finish line, that little bit of gumption maybe picks up and you're like okay now I can go whenever I work with athletes at this point and they uh, they run out of time to go fast I say all right well that just happened you can't change the past next time you go out sprint five strokes sooner and that'll get you a little bit more speed and speaking of a little bit more speed that uh, Loyola Marymount does appear to have come back into Colorado a little bit here even though they have been off the pace them just a little bit through the first 1750 meters both of those crews are passed into less than 200 meters to go and so what can you do in 200 meters a lot of boat speed can happen in a very short period of time especially if you decide to sit back a little bit off of your legs and open your eyes and decide to go because this is a big race, dueling it out, duking it out to the line, Loyola Marymount and Colorado. Colorado is still ahead by just a few seats as Loyola Marymount has done a fantastic job eating away at that lead, but will they fall just a sh hair shy at the finish line? Colorado still with a couple of seats, still maintaining that lead. What they did early has helped them as they come across the line unofficially, a deck plus two seats, so maybe bow ball over two seat or so. Uh, so Loyola, uh, Loyola Marymount's bow ball was right at maybe two seats seat of Colorado as Colorado unofficially came across in first with San Diego State rounding out our field of three in the men's collegiate varsity active and fit now Cal Cup that was your second level final here you know I, I gotta say this whole weekend you know people were looking at the weather in terms of rain and this and that rain is rain it is what it is it is an outdoor sport one of my favorite comments about this sport it's an outdoor sport it is what it is but this sunny Sunday the weather has just got gotten better and better and better it is beautiful it out is here. the true celebration of rowing here and what a better uh, we can't think of a better time to make that happen than the 50th anniversary of the san diego crew classic Lest what a way to we celebrate forget, yeah the 50th anniversary
All right, and we are underway already um, in the B-level final for the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four, the Karen Plumley courtney Cup. In lane one, it's UC San Diego. Lane two, Loyola Marymount. Lane three, Santa Clara. And lane four, MIT. In the early stages of the race, that is exactly as it is uh, unfolding early on, very, very early on in this race. You see San Diego in lane one having a little bit of an early lead over Loyola Marymount and Santa Clara, who are very close. Santa Clara possibly a little bit over Loyola Marymount. But um, we will see if they can continue to extend that, see if they can then vie with UC San Diego for the lead through the middle portion of the race. MIT uh, rounding out in fourth currently, uh, seeing if they can use the middle portion of the race to their advantage, claw back into what's going on with the two that are vying for second place right now, which is Lo Loyola Marymount and Santa Clara. But UC San Diego, our current leaders, the leaders that got out, to, or the, the crew that got out to a little bit of an early lead, still contact among those top three. Can MIT crawl back in and regain contact with Santa Clara? That's right. And yesterday, one of the things that we talked about while we were going through the heats was how do these crews come out of the heats and then come back and have an even better race? So what is it that you learn from going through the heats and how can you come back and make it even better? So UC San Diego doing a really nice job here deciding early on, like, hey, we wanted, we, we don't want to just win this. We want to take this substantially and we want to, you know, again, we've talked about let's make a statement. Stay tidy and just extend one one story that we always you know people refer to that take it an inch take it an inch from you know now i forget the movie but get <laughs> one inch per stroke all you need you don't need to even be 100 strokes or 200 strokes faster than the other crew you just need to be one stroke faster than that's the other crew right hundreds of a second faster that's <laughs> all you need <laughs> Val ball blink you might you might miss it <laughs> uh but you know talking about those small changes that you can make with true speed gains there are trust me <laughs> there are those light bulb moments where you could create such an increase in efficiency without the fitness being the game changer at that point. You have this level of fitness, but there are certain technical things that once you discover them can really make the boat sing. And uh, that is something that can certainly happen, not just from one day to the next, but in a single warm-up. You know, your warm-up when you shove, by the time you get to the start line, you're 30, 45 minutes faster. You have an opportunity to have a short practice on your way to the start line to find even more speed. Mm -hmm. Crazy things can happen. Crazier things have happened for sure. But through the middle portion of this race, so UC San Diego was looking to extend a little bit more more of their lead. Uh, Loyola Marymount just had a little bit of contact. UC San Diego was about to break contact with the rest of the field right around the 1,000 meter mark if they hadn't already. Loyola Marymount and Santa Clara still had a hold on, or Santa Clara still had a hold on Loyola Marymount there through the middle, but um, it looked like Loyola Marymount was, was moving pretty well as well, so they may have broken contact as well with Santa Clara. But let's keep our eyes also on the outside lanes, MIT and Santa Clara. MIT, the engineers all the way out here from Boston, they've got a good open weight program. They also have a storied lightweight program, and uh, great to see them here testing their metal um, against some of the best in the nation in all of these categories. Santa Clara, a fairly uh, smaller program rowing on Lexington and Reservoir, same place that Los Gatos rose, and uh, their women doing doing well here and um, enjoying the beginning of their racing season. But UC San Diego, you know, let's make this a good one, and let's see a lot of open water. That's what that coxswain is asking for now. Let's see how much more open water we can get between ourselves and Loyola Marymount. You know, and being a coxswain and a bow loader, that coxswain might not have exactly a clear picture on how much water that is because I, from what I hear, from what I've been told, you know, it's a, when you're that low down in the hull, your eye is almost at water level. And so your perspective, your distance vision is kind of gone. Your peripheral vision is a little bit gone too. So you'd have to get up and out of the boat. But that coxswain doesn't want to mess with the boat's stability, doesn't want to get moving around too much because she doesn't want to impact the crew. And, you know, in doing so, just ask for more and then realize where you are when you cross the line, how much distance you've taken by staying incredibly internal. Yeah, exactly. And that, that coxswain, like you said, is, is key. Obviously, they don't want to make, um, they don't want to move the boat around at all, so they do have to stay quite, st 
quite still and use their peripheral vision, uh, use their other senses. Maybe it's hearing. See if you can, you know, if that coxswain's getting farther and farther away, well, you know that you're doing your job. Um, <laughs> so UC San Diego well the out sound, in front maybe. here as they come into the final 250 meters well over Loyola Marymount with MIT occupying the third place position and then finally Santa Clara. So MIT, as we talked about earlier in the race, did take advantage of those that middle thousand meters, you know, expressing their uh, capacity through what they've done, perhaps through their winter training to allow them to have a solid middle portion of the race to put them back into uh, the top three positions rather than being a bit behind. But it is still UC San Diego on the inside lane. If you're down there on the shore, less than 200 meters to go, maybe 15 or more strokes left in the race as they come down to the final portions. Can they find a little more speed? That's the intrinsic motivation. You can see what's going on behind you. You know that as long as you stay clean across the line, that it is in your favor that you will be the first ones to earn the horn as it as you cross. But can you find a little more speed? Because that's going to help you be faster for the next race. Okay? So continue to push, find the speed, and then reassess after you cross the line, figure out how can we find a way to push a little bit more by internal motivation? How can we find a little bit, uh, another way to bring ourselves together as a crew? So that first horn from start to finish, it was UC San Diego with the early lead and extending their lead across the line as they stay together and stay composed. Next to them in lane two, it is Loyola Marymount. With MIT in the red hull there, in lane four. Followed by Santa Clara. That was the, that was the women's collegiate varsity Cox for Karen Plumley Courtney Cup. The second level final, UC San Diego coming across unofficially in first. And we are underway and on the course with the Women's Collegiate 2V, the Jackie Ann Stitt Hungness Trophy. This is your second level final. It is a three-boat final. In lane one, you have MIT. Lane two is Loyola Marymount. And in lane three is UC San Diego. These are second varsity eights for each of these crews. And so now we go from the fours back to the eights. Slightly bigger, well, slightly much larger boats and certainly faster speeds as they power their way down the course. And all three boats across. It does look like MIT in the red hull is our early leader with UC San Diego as we get past the first 500 and through the middle portion of this race making a surge from the outside attempting to overtake Loyola Marymount who had a lead on them and that race there where UC San Diego is the most assertive crew right now uh, is push putting pressure on MIT through the middle portion of this race you know at least earlier on in the middle of this race it's it's anybody's race I don't want to say anybody's game that's going to be the slip of the tongue anybody's race here it is very very close three boats across What's the math on that? 27 athletes on the water right now, and you could probably just drop draw lines straight between all of them. That is super cool. That That's a really fun place to be, actually, when you've got boats side by side, neck and neck, coxswains looking across. Um, it's almost just an overload for the senses as you have the adrenaline moving through your body. You're trying to listen to your coxswain. You're trying not to listen to the other coxswain. And maintain <laughs> your cool while one team might be cruising a little bit more, you know, a little bit faster. Okay, they're inching right. up. Maintain your cool. That's cool. It's no big deal. They can take their inch now. We're going to take it back in just a moment. 
and look at the beauty of the water. I mean, it is just absolutely ideal conditions right now uh, coming along the shoreline. This is, you know, really taking a look at the beauty of San Diego and, and what Mission Bay has to offer. What a great encircled shot there to catch all the crews full, all the boats. You can see everything that's happening from one side to the next. And now the view that we have, it was, you know, those two crews, uh, UC San Diego was the most assertive through the second 500. And then Loyola Marymount answered that call. They said, okay, you want to take it? Well, we're going to go with you. And that, that race between Loyola Marymount and UC San Diego on those outside lanes two and three, it put pressure on MIT, and both of those crews have now set themselves apart from MIT, and MIT has since dropped back to open water behind those two lead crews who continue to trade places in terms of lead. It's just a few seats that separate them, currently Loyola Marymount, ahead of UC San Diego, but with the aggression that they had earlier on in the race, will they have another aggressive move, and will there be more lead changes as we get into the last, you know, 400 meters or so of this race? Mm -hmm. That's right the Lions pushing themselves now to see if they can take a couple of more inches away from UC San Diego the Tritons mm -hmm. as they put the oars in the water as they put the blades in the water it is a little bit of a surge for them as they continue to take seats on UC San Diego but we'll see what kind of sprint do the Tritons have as they come into the final strokes here it will be the L LMU Lions holding on to that lead but with UC San Diego chasing MIT in third. All three crews well within the last 250 meters here. Now we say, you know, rowing never gets easier. It just, you just go faster. So Ken, in the last 250, you just find more speed because it's gonna hurt no matter what. Push, 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 find a little more speed because there's still contact, plenty of contact between Loyola Marymount and UC San Diego, but it is Loyola Marymount with the edge over UC San Diego. So if you're down on shore, give them a yell. It's gonna bring them across the line with a lot more adrenaline, a lot more gusto. About a half length, maybe breaking out uh, Loyola the Marymount walking on uh, UC San Diego at this point, taking inch, 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 seat by seat, seeing if they can get a little bit more. It's almost to a length. There is bow to stern overlap as they come down to the closing couple of strokes here. MIT in lane one, still open water back of that hot race that was happening in those middle two lanes, lanes two and three between Loyola Marymount and UC San Diego. Well raced by all three crews here in the women's collegiate 2V. Jackie Ann Hungness. Uh, Jackie and Stitt Hungness Trophy. This is your second level of final. Loyola Marymount unofficially coming in first over second place UC San Diego followed by MIT. All right, we have a little bit of a break in the schedule. Not much. Um, I am sure we're going to play a bit of catch up here, um, but we will head back up to the start here uh, in just a minute for the grand final of the Women's Collegiate Novice Laurel Korholtz Perpetual Trophy final. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? This challenging time of life can be confusing. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Faster Masters Rowing has a pre-recorded webinar available right now at fastermastersrowing.com slash menopause. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Sharp Healthcare congratulates the San Diego Crew Classic on five decades of rowing excellence and is proud to sponsor the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Hospital Cup. The affiliated physicians, nurses, and staff of Sharp Healthcare have provided quality health care to the San Diego community for more than 65 years. This tradition of service excellence and caring is further demonstrated by Sharp's support of the San Diego Crew Classic since 1982.
And we are awaiting the start of our next race, the Women's Collegiate. This, this event makes me smile for many reasons. The Women's Collegiate Novice Laurel Corhols Perpetual Trophy. This is your first level final with this five boat final here in lane one. We have Washington, lane two, British Columbia, lane three, UCLA, lane four, UC San Diego, and in lane five, Crosstown, uh, San Diego. That's right, crosstown rivals between Thank the University you. of San Diego and UC San Diego. <laughs> the word I yep. glitched on momentarily. <laughs> yep, and then, um, but with British Columbia in here, the Thunderbirds traveling all the way from BC, they are uh, really quite an amazing program. Mm. Talk about them just a little bit as they are uh, perpetually atop the Canadian National Championship um, podium. So both the men and the women with quite a deep program. A little bit of a different system here um, with uh, with the ca Canadians, but um, I remember when I rode at Cal back a thousand years ago, we would occasionally travel um, up to the Northwest and race against uh, UBC and UVic, and just super fun to have them down here um, racing against the best in the United States. And here we are, Washington in lane one, British Columbia in lane two, UCLA in lane three UC San Diego lane four and University of San Diego in lane six and or lane five and that's pretty much how you will find them biggest challenge right now is between Washington and British Columbia so those two crews pacing each other but advantage is going to go to lane one University of Washington certainly maybe just bl just under a half length lead that they've been able to take from their start sequence definitely taking British Columbia with them as they're lengthening out British Columbia is maybe taking back a seat or so UCLA and the rest of the pack has slipped to open water from those top two lead crews, but there is still a decent, solid amount of overlap between UC San Diego and UCLA. Those two crews, we're going to look for them through the second 500 to uh, jock it, to use each other as leverage, to keep each other motivated through the middle of the race, goad them along. You know, it's a, that's a true test of confidence, true test of maturity, you know, to have a crew jump up on you in the start and not get ruffled by that and be able to be okay with being behind for a little bit, uh, to, to let the rest, to let your fitness, to let your practice, to let the middle of the course really take care of itself and stay within your own mindset, within your own hall, that bubble of focus uh, to keep you as efficient as possible down the course. Right. And, you know, with this category, with the novice category, um, again, these might be athletes that have years of experience coming out of high school. They could be brand new and walk-ons first year in college. Uh, we do know that they are in their first year of competition for their college program, uh, not necessarily without any experience, um, mm -hmm. but it is the first year of competition for, for all of these athletes and here we see Washington taking full advantage of the depth of their program we've talked about it before but they do um, they have a, an amazing recruiting program but they do have a heavy emphasis on those walk-on athletes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I bet you that yes. there are some that are sitting <laughs> in this I'm boat biased. right now um, and it probably yeah. for any of these programs so Washington right now extending out bow to stern mm -hmm. over British Columbia mm -hmm. British Columbia looking at about a half a boat length over a uh, half a boat length of open water right now over UCLA and UCLA sitting half a seat or so, a seat of open water over UC San Diego, and then finally University of San Diego. And it was maybe in the second half of that first 500 that British Columbia pushed back in uh, to Washington, so it's quite possible that they just maintained their start their start sequence for a few extra strokes to keep that level of contact. But ever since then, Washington has moved out from British Columbia. They haven't broken contact yet, at least. We, we may have broken contact at this point. We don't know yet. Uh, but they were looking to. It looked as though they were moving in such a way that they might break contact with British Columbia. It also looked as though UCLA would be about to break contact with UC San Diego if they continue to move as they have been down the course. You know, the um, you know being novices, if uh, as these lineups have you know come come together, whether they're new or lineups that have been together since the fall, uh, depending on how you run your novice programs through your through your through your teams, it is possible that they've really focused on the middle and haven't necessarily done a ton of work on the start and the sprint. And so those are maybe places where they could gain more speed throughout the season. So mm -hmm. once the last 500 unravels, I, I personally am going to be interested to see how clean and tidy and, and, and intentional and stepwise they can be on their sprint sequences to just kind of have the cherry on the, on the, was it on the Sunday on a cupcake, the icing?
icing on the cupcake, <laughs> <laughs> right? Through the, the middle, <laughs> <laughs> through the middle of the race, you've done all this work. That's the meat of it. That's really the thick of it. That's the body of it. That's the bulk of it. But um, can you really cap it off with a great sprint as well? That'll be delightful. To that's watch. right. And we, you know, and we've talked about that. It's like if you're well out in front, how do you want to finish this race off? You're not just going to sit. And we know that Washington is not going to do that. Certainly not. I'm actually thinking about the fact that the names on that trophy are probably mostly Washingtons. Yeah. I um, have uh, just over, I don't know, the past many decades, Washington I, I having such yeah. good strength in the novice um, and first year category. I know that they were the team that we were vying for to win this, you know, 20 plus years ago when I raced the novice category here at the San Diego Crew Classic back in <coughs> 2002. <laughs> and Washington I was the team that, <laughs> that took us. <laughs> uh. And it still is Washington out ahead of British Columbia, extending their lead here in lane one. As you can see them coming into the picture there, not quite at just inside 500 meters to go. Uh, sorry, just about to approach 500 meters to go. That orange flag is your last 500. Once you see the black flag, you're going to get into the last 250 meters. So for any of those athletes that have just come down through that third 500, once you click over into that last 500, there's just a sense of like, okay, here we go. I meant I said horses to the barn a few moments ago but mm -hmm. as soon as the coxswain kind of announces all right last 500 you know what is coming and the faster you go the more that you pour out onto the course the sooner it's done well fun to watch the competition here on the center we know washington is is well out in front but you know looking at uh uc san diego ucla british columbia to see if they can maybe inch a little bit closer to each other um, so again we talk about strategy and how difficult it is sometimes to be out there all by yourself and all of these boats um it, it just is like a parade of boats coming down the course. We've got Washington out in front, tons of open water on either side. Same thing for University of British Columbia and now UCLA. Also, plenty of open water behind and in front of them. So the strategy is just keep pushing. Don't let them walk away anymore. Hold tight. And then if you're in front, it's let's keep pushing away. Let's get more distance between ourselves and the crews that are behind us. So British Columbia in the second place spot. Again, UCLA in third. They have a substantial lead now over UC San Diego and then University of San Diego holding up that fifth place position. And Washington is certainly within the last 250 meters here. I know they have a lot of teammates here, so get on out there and give them a holler because they are the future of your program. Zero gaps, right? Encourage one another. It's all about everyone on this team elevating every year from one to the next because novices can end up in the varsity eight. Stranger things have happened. Uh, give, them a, give them a yell. Here they come. They're coming down toward the final stages of the Women's Collegiate Novice Laurel Corholes Perpetual Trophy. This is your first level final. Washington from start to finish early leaders and now extended their lead to more than one boat length of open water over current second place British Columbia who also has a few boat lengths over UCLA followed by San Diego and or UC San Diego and San Diego look at that staying up to speed and going all the way through the line no question as to whether they have crossed maintaining composure and in the red hole is British Columbia Followed by UCLA in the blue.
If you want to stay active and fit these days, you need flexibility. We get it. Active and Fit Now is a new fitness program that gives you options. For one low price per month, you get access to thousands of fitness centers and studios nationwide, so you can easily find your perfect fit. With no long-term contracts, you can switch your gym or cancel anytime. And stay active at home with thousands of workout videos included in your membership. It's super easy to enroll online. Just get active and fit now by going to activeandfitnow.com. Get it? It's in the name. As we await the what's on, happening on the course already, I will set the field for you for what you are about to see. It is the Men's Collegiate Novice Derek Gwelker Memorial Cup. This is your first level final. It is a seven-boat final. You will have seven boats on the course coming down. So look for some exciting speed here uh, as we have in lane one, California. In lane two, Orange Coast. Lane three, Southern California. Lane 4, UC Davis. Lane 5, UC Santa Barbara. Lane 6, Colorado. Lane 7, UCLA. And it's important to note that, um, again, this is a trophy that is a Memorial Cup. It's named after Derek Gwelker. Derek was a uh, local uh, San Diego rower who was unfortunately killed in an automobile accident in the 80s and his parents dedicated this cup to him and his memory and his love for the sport but always with a reminder to be safe. It is a way of also encouraging first year rowers and uh, encouraging them to stick with the sport. It was so important to their son that they want to pass on that legacy to the next group of athletes. You know, what we were seeing coming out of the, the original race uh, from yesterday, that was yesterday, uh, California and Orange Coast were the two crews maybe that uh, uh, had great races yesterday. What we saw from the speed, the early speed, but of course the final is now. So this is, once you make it to there, now anything, it's anyone's game. And that's kind of what we're seeing out on that outside lane with UCLA. We have California slipping away from the pack, creating a little bit of uh, open water, potentially lengthening that out through the middle portion of the race once we catch up with what's going on here. Orange Coast has taken almost a length uh, and looks to break open from Southern California. Davis, UC Davis and Southern California were very close through the first 500 meters getting into the second 500, but Southern California lengthened out to about a half a length lead in the second 500, potentially looking to get a length. The question is, is will UC Davis in the middle portion stop that advance that mm -hmm. Calif Southern California had on them and be able to dial it back in but again over on that outside with UCLA they've done a nice job of staying in there and staying connected with what's going on in those middle four lanes that's going to keep them up there with the top five crews but California is the crew that's out on the course right now doing the majority of the uh, uh, distance taking they have several boat lengths of open water on the remainder of the field Orange Coast has what appears to be uh, open water on the rest of the field as well Southern California and UC Davis still very close together you see Santa Barbara and Colorado there in lanes five and six were also duking it out in their uh, in their lane. UCLA had slipped away from them in the meanwhile, but those kind of dual races going on within this seven boat race makes for uh, interesting and creative second and third five hundreds. Um, which we will see as we watch a little bit more closely what goes on in the last 500. Well, that's right. And as California hits the tents in that spectator area, this freshman boat, very fast crew. And Lindsay and I had been talking about the importance of a novice program or a freshman program. We know that there's no more freshman races at the IRA. And few novice um, races. But yeah, and very few side. novice races. But, you know, the importance of keeping those first year rowers together to help to build the culture of the program. They are the back backbone, the future of their program. And they're the ones that are pushing the varsity athletes and for sure we can see that in this California crew uh, these gentlemen in the California boat super fast been looking at the times that they have developed over um, just in the last they, they just really only had one race um, earlier this season but then coming out of the heats uh, we can compare between the varsity 3v 2v and you know just uh, really really strong here and then Orange Coast we talked about them yesterday that is a junior college that develops oarsmen that move on to go up into 
through Division One, two, three program, varsity programs, and have always been so strong. They were so strong at Acras last year, and here they are chasing down California in this Novice Memorial Cup final. Here's California for the win. Orange Coast behind them, a little more than a length of open water back, but quite a good showing for Orange Coast. Followed by Southern California, USC. That is a true club program, student run. They really develop the vision for the season. Great race, great middle fouls by UC Davis to take back some of the lead Definitely. that Southern California. Yeah, uh, they had extended that lead to about a length or more, and then UC Davis came back to make it about a half a length by the time they crossed the line. UCLA in that outside lane, not quite enough to get back into contact with that race, that duel that happened in the middle lanes, but it was enough to keep them well clear of the next two crews. Between that, that other kind of duel race that was happening between UC Santa Barbara and Colorado, that broke away such that UC Santa Barbara has since walked away from Colorado through the middle portion of the race to bring them home clear ahead of Colorado. All right, and just a quick update from the course on the uh, race that's currently in progress. They are well into that third 500, but this is the B-level final for the men's collegiate novice eight. Um, sorry, this is the men's collegiate novice eight B final. Just two boats on the course. It will be Orange Coast in lane one, and then UC Santa Barbara in lane two. So really a dual race out here. Uh, not a whole lot of entries, um, but Orange Coast taking advantage of that and uh, already with about three lengths or so of open water over UC Santa Barbara. We saw how strong Orange Coast novice program is in that previous race, and here they are showing that again. Uh, again, good depth in that program.
go ahead. And on the inside lane, we have Orange Coast coming across ahead of UC Santa Barbara in the men's collegiate novice, the, in men's collegiate novice eight. This is the uh, the novi the B novice eight. This is your first level final duel between Orange Coast and UC Santa Barbara. All right, and we're going to set the lanes here for you. This is a B-level final on the course right now for the Women's Grace Rep Memorial Collegiate Varsity D2, 3, and Club Final. So uh, Varsity 8, D2, D3, and Club. In lane 1, Clark B. Lane 2, Colorado. Lane 3, Pacific Lutheran and lane four, UC Santa Barbara B. In the grand final, we did see Clark, then their A boat, take that race and take home the trophy. And so here they are with their B boat um, in lane one, looking at a good race, good start, but Colorado with their bow first in front and taking about a length on the rest of the field early on. And that was in about the first first 500 or so, second half of the first 500, where Colorado was leading over Clark B, who is in lane one. Uh, Pacific Lutheran a little bit over UC Santa Barbara B, but those two boats still well overlapped with one another, and UC Santa Barbara B looking to take back into that lead, and it looked like maybe in the early portions of the second 500 that they were able to walk back up just a little bit into Pacific Lutheran to maintain that contact. And as those two boats, we see this quite often in a lot of racing, where that pressure, that sense of urgency that occurs, when you have someone pushing you like that, there's just that little bit of extra. It's different being on the course next to someone than it is being on the erg in the winter, let alone by yourself, something like that. So that right here, that sense of urgency that's being created between lane three and lane four with Pacific Lutheran and Santa Barbara there is putting pressure on the position that Clark has. Clark V had a solid second behind Colorado early on, but the race that's happening, again, in lanes three and four is creeping up ever so slightly into the advantage that Clark does still maintain over them, but it's going to be close between those three boats as we get closer to the finish line. 
Yeah, really nice showing here by Colorado as they have uh, extended themselves out to an open water lead over the rest of the field. Colorado, a club program. They practice on a reservoir just outside of mm. Boulder um, and just a beautiful environment, but I can imagine quite a wintry uh, place to row this last this last season. So, you know, I this don't know how much, how much water time they've had, but they, um, they look to be pretty fit. So here they are coming down to sea level and putting themselves out with a great showing here. Um, against the rest of the field. Clark B. from Worcester, Massachusetts, also doing a nice job. Their A-boat, again, took home the trophy in the grand final. And then Pacific Lutheran, a Division Three Northwest program, they are uh, perpetual competitors at the national championships, often uh, near the top for the Division Three programs. And then UC Santa Barbara B, a club program um, that it has uh, quite a bit of depth. They have had a huge, huge program, both on the men's and the women's side over the last few years. And here they are doing a fine job um, in this Varsity 8 final. Just over 250 meters left to go for all four boats here, uh, particularly the, the two lead boats between Colorado and Clark B. They are about to hit that, that, that black flag of the last 250 meters, those buoys that will change from one color to solid red, signifying that you are solidly in the last 20 to 30 strokes of your race. And as they cross into it and rev up into their, their sprint sequences, you know, it's always interesting to watch when crews do those sorts of things, whether they hit right at the 250 or a little before, a little after, depending on what they need, whether they do it at all um, throughout the weekend of racing, depending on their position relative to other crews. Oh, it looks like there's a little bit of steering happening here with the Colorado crew. They need to make sure that they maintain uh, their lane, see what's going on. If they interfere with that Clark B boat, then that's going to be up to the referees to, to tell us what's going on here because they have veered out of their lane. They've been ahead this whole time, uh, but then they did go from lane two to lane one here, and now they're recorrecting to get back into their lane to cross that finish line. Meanwhile, uh, out in lane three, Pacific Lutheran has stayed just on the charge and uh, maintained position right down the middle of their their lane. And have even though Clark is about is has broken open clear water with them, they are trying to inch back to tighten that gap, tighten that margin. <laughs> As oh, Colorado, a little bit more adrenaline than you'd wanted to uh, <laughs> wanted to thread uh, the needle. Have in yeah, have in your system there in the sprint. You want to have like a natural adrenaline, but not because uh, you know something is happening with the rudder. So good on Colorado for being able to maintain and getting back into their um, into their lane and finish cleanly. So. fallen in love with this FLX design. Everyone I put into the boat uh, kind of raves about it and I've just seen good jumps in speed. The FLX especially, it just feels great as it moves through the water. It's very responsive. It reacts to what you want it to do and runs out really nice in between the strokes. Sharp Healthcare congratulates the San Diego Crew Classic on five decades of rowing excellence and is proud to sponsor the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Hospital Cup. The affiliated physicians, nurses, and staff of Sharp Healthcare have provided quality health care to the San Diego community for more than 65 years. This tradition of service excellence and caring is further demonstrated by Sharp's support of the San Diego Crew Classic since 1982. How confident are you about rigging for Masters? Get the inside track from Volker Nolte, Mike Purser, and Mike Davenport on the webinar recording Rigging for Masters, available exclusively at fastermastersrowing.com slash rigging. And we are awaiting 
site of the next race that's already underway on the course. We are two Masters athletes now. This is the Women's Masters 8. This is the club champ Talia Kelly Considine Cup. This is your first level final. And as the sheet reads, it is an eight boat final. We are looking to secure that uh, for you, but I'll read them as they are. Lane one is Wimble Ball. Lane two is Toronto Sculling. Lane three is Bayak Bear Island. Lane four is Texas Center. Lane five, Sammamish C. Lane six is Sammamish A. And in lane seven is Sammamish B. And in lane eight is Portland. All right, and to talk a little bit about um, this event. So this is a club championship for Masters. So we'd mentioned yesterday that, that is, it's kind of an open age category for Masters. There is still a handicap, but it is open to uh, any, it's not a, an age categorization where you go by decades. It is just um, anybody. And that actually makes it um, even more difficult because you've got some really, really strong ladies that are in their 60s, in their 50s, that yes. are bringing up that handicap. Fast as fast. A super fast, yeah, exactly. Fast as fast, and as a Master, it does not get any easier. But right now we are looking at some really beautiful footage. This is what eight lanes across looks like. And right now it is Toronto Sculling and Bayak A. We saw them really strong out of the heats. Um, and we're looking at that here as those two crews are side by side for the first and second place position. In third, it's going to be Texas Rowing Center. Um, but also tight to them will be Sammamish C and uh let's see sammamish c and yeah exactly sammamish c and <laughs> sammamish <B>. a <laughs> well it's on those outside lanes we have portland on the way outside then you have three boats from sammamish c a and b which tells us that maybe through the heats there was some differentiating yeah. of speed and that sort of thing so sammamish's c and b lineups have are flanking on either side of the sammamish a in between them and lane six and so then uh, those two boats are fighting with one another eh, a few seats separate them and that's pushing them up into the texas center Boat. And Wimble Ball there in lane one. They are also in that mix. So in the top, uh, looks to be in the top five or six. So we have to keep an eye on all of these boats as they jockey for position. Um, but right now it does look like Bayak taking, um, uh, pushing their nose out in front by a couple of seats over Toronto. Toronto um, coming all the way, obviously, from Canada. Bayak from the port of Redwood City in the Bay Area. They have really built up quite a strong master's women's program um, and men's program, but good to see them here um, being competitive in this Masters Women's category. And right now, now with open water, actually, over, over Toronto. And we'll keep an eye also on Wimble Ball as they progress down the course. Looks to me as if Wimble Ball might be coming up to challenge um, that, let's see, it looks <laughs> as if um, Toronto Sculling is is taking up that lead spot. And then Wimble Ball and Bayak A um, are challenging each other. And as we see in the dark hole there, that does appear to be Bayak that's out in front. It is Bayak, yes. yeah. It was and then the two, <laughs> the two crews that are flanking them on either side, it is Toronto Sculling and Texas Roaming Center. Texas Roaming Center having a great second half here looking. Uh, okay, that seems to be a theme with Texas. Let me stop myself here. But yeah. <laughs> whether you're the, the university or the, the program itself. But they seem to be taking a few seats back from Toronto Sculling as we get into the last three, four, five hundred 500 meters of this race course. So yeah. as they come down the course with about a half length separating those two crews for second place, Bayak still clear ahead, yep. clear water ahead yep. of the other two crews. But let's go back to what you said just a moment ago about Masters Racing. There are handicaps still in play here. Right. So there is as the eyeball sees a finish, but then there are some handicaps that will change some of those gaps. So you can never certainly in Masters Racing be far enough ahead. That's right. And so here they come down to the line. It does look like Bayak holding on to that substantial lead. Toronto and Texas, uh, Texas Rowing Center challenging each other for that second or third place position. Again, these are going to be in raw time. And then we're going to move out to Sammamish C for fourth place. They uh, look to have a, a bit more of a substantial lead now on Wimble Ball than they did a little bit earlier on. Then Sammamish B rounding out the competition. Um, and Portland, Portland on the far side, lane eight. And, the, and Texas did look like they were taking a few seats on Toronto Sculling as they came through, but Toronto Sculling was able to maintain a, at least a deck, maybe a deck you know, up to bow seat, a few more seats there uh, over Texas.
Wimble ball coming across the line now. Followed by some Amish A. With Portland to round out our field of eight. In the Women's Masters eight, this is the club. This is the uh, Talia Kelly Considine Cup that was your first level of final. Master Masters Rowing is your partner for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Right, Faster Masters proudly sponsors the, the new Classic Intermediate Masters 8 at the, ready for the 50th start Anniversary the San Diego eight. Crew Classic. We are again looking at eight boats For more than course. 40 years, in JL one, Racing Wimbledon has been designing and manufacturing two, technical training lane and racing Cambridge. apparel for rowers. Lane JL four, builds Kent the Mitchell. highest quality technical lane garments five, in the North industry Dakota. with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. We make custom art for your Eight, team easy with free art and quick A. turn creative designs at jl we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com Okay, and you're looking at that beautiful overhead start here of eight boats across. Doesn't really get much better than that, but the boats are still very tightly packed in this shot. Um, they are actually already um, in the meat of their piece, so we will let this shot show what the start looked like, and then we'll catch up with them um, as they progress down the race course. So there's a lot that still has to happen, a lot of contact right here early on, but as the race gets a little bit longer, and again, remember, Masters are generally racing 1,000 meters, um, and so uh, really a treat to be able to come out here to San Diego and row a full 2,000 meter course. You know, and coming out here as a Masters athlete to race the 2K is a really great segue. It's a great stepping stone to make sure that you don't peak too soon because those Masters National Championships, if any of these athletes choose to go there, that's later in the summer. You know, Youth Nationals happens in June, Masters Nationals happens in July, sometimes August. And so to continue to race slightly longer races before you make that real shift toward that 1,000, that much more anaerobically dominant race, it's a great stepping stone coming off the winter. Yeah, and this is interesting as we watch these crews progress down the race course. We're looking at San Diego Rowing Club out of lane eight in your lead. So behind them, there's still a lot of contact between boats, but we've also got Riverside A in the mix. They're followed by North Dakota. North Dakota, we talked about primarily an indoor program um, for probably Obvious pretty reasons. good reasons. <laughs> 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 but hey, that's doing them uh, a lot of favors here. Obviously, mm -hmm. the fitness is there. Just behind North Dakota, it's going to be Kent Mitchell, followed closely by Wimbleball. And then finally, San Diego and Cambridge with Texas Rowing Center in the eighth place position. But a lot is going to happen between now and that 500 meter to go line. So we will be back with the race call as these teams come further down the yes, course. I was about to say with San Diego, uh, you know, having that outside lane there on lane eight, being a leader, that might be a little bit of a surprise. And something that's happening next to them is it's taking Riverside's A lineup along with them. So Riverside is looking to move right along with San Diego since they are side by side there, San Diego Rowing Club A. Um, and as a result, that actually has given Riverside at least through the second 500. We'll see what happens now when we jump back to what's going on at the and on the course farther down. But that uh, was able to pull Riverside along with them and put them up in contention with some of the earlier leaders that are farther toward the beach, toward those inside lanes. 
Yeah, and the top four boats still do look like they're San Diego Rowing Club, followed by Riverside A, and then on the inside, uh, North Dakota, and then uh, Wimbleball. All right, and breaking free with a bit of open water, it is San Diego Rowing Club. you got to look for them out there in lane eight. That is far across, so they're really going to need your cheers to make sure that they can get through that final 500 meters in good form. But I think that they are looking super strong here as they come into the spectator area. So San Diego Rowing Club with a hot finish here by open water over Riverside A. Riverside A looking for a bit of open water over North Dakota. North Dakota really great showing here as they have pulled ahead of Wimbleball and Kent Mitchell. Now behind Kent Mitchell, it's going to be tight between Cambridge, San Diego, um, which I believe is an alumni boat, and then Texas Rowing Center. So all these crews coming hot towards the finish line, but San Diego Rowing Club, they are your leader as we come into the final strokes of the men's Masters 8. This is the Coronado Keys Realty Club champion final. And by virtue of uh, Riverside being out there next to San Diego, that kept them in the mix, which has allowed them to put pressure on and potentially overtake North Dakota here in the last few strokes. So if those guys out there in those striped jerseys rev it up a little bit more, they'll give themselves even more of a solid handle on what North Dakota did early on, which it has. It's given them the advantage. They haven't broken contact, but they are lengthening what they have, and it is a few seats over. And North Dakota has responded with a little bit to make sure that they don't continue to slip away, but it is Riverside A unofficially over North Dakota. And look in the middle of the field. This is very close between Wimbleball and Kent Minchel. Great middle of the race by Kent Mitchell to put themselves back in the mix for the top five spots here and the final three too close to call. Very tight racing, eight boats across, lots of quick horns. That means we're not going to have any say on what happens. Everything again unofficial out here. All right, and we are actually already underway in the next race, the Women's Open 8. This is the Carly Copley Cup, also very hotly contested. Again, um, because it's an open race, it is open to anybody. Of course, we've got the collegiate crews here, but um, we don't know whether it's a freshman boat, it's a 2V, it's a 3V. Um, all we know is that they are fast. So looking at seven, excuse me, six boats on the course, in lane one, Texas. Lane two, Stanford. Lane three, California. Lane 4, Washington. Lane 5, USC. And Lane 6, Washington State. And just as that was read in lane order, that is how they are, are currently falling uh, in terms of placement. It looked like California, even though they were off the pace of Texas and Stanford in that first couple, you know, couple hundred meters there, they looked like the ones that were making the move to continue their start to be a little more effective for a little bit longer. Uh, was that because they lengthened early and their base is a little bit more effective than their start or vice versa? Did they hold it for five or ten extra strokes to keep them up in contact with what is going on in the lanes inside them? Right now it is Texas out in front by just a couple of seats over Stanford, but California did come back into the lead that both Stanford and Texas had on them right away. Washington next to them still maintaining contact with California. Look for Washington, of course, to come through with a, a, a solid middle thousand of this race as well. Uh, they are still there, still in touch, still with what's going on. USC next to Washington still well overlapped with them and Washington State still, still maintaining contact with USC. 
And that's right. Texas is the reigning champion from last year. Um, they are sure to want to go home with that uh, that trophy again. Carly Copley was the daughter of uh, a local couple that um, are honoring their, their young daughter who died from leukemia in 1996. And uh, the motto of this cup is in giving her in giving life her best effort, Carly remains a winner forever. And that is what the cup is all about. So it's a reminder to share your talent and your achievements with those less fortunate. Yes. So really on, awesome to be able to race in, in her memory. And there is some fine racing. There is a lot of speed out here on the course, but right now, um, early on it does look like Stanford has a slight lead over both California and Texas flanking them um, just behind it is Washington in the fourth place position and then finally USC and Washington State so as we come to the halfway point we're going to keep our eyes on lanes one two three and four we've seen Washington all day with a really uh, really good sprint really effective sprint California staying very very consistent Stanford fast all the way through and Texas again turning it on in the last half of the race so a variety of of different um, speeds being shown out on the water. You know, speaking of best effort, just as you said, best effort, it was Stanford. Okay, California had their early, you know what, I'm going to take back some of those seats that Texas and Stanford took on us, and you could see the aggression that they created. And then it was Stanford who was who said, it was almost as if they heard you say, give best effort, and they asserted themselves and took over the lead from Texas. It's California and Stanford who are pushing one another to kind of trade places first and second as we come down through the middle uh getting across this thousand approaching the the opening for the second bridge there knowing that you're well pat you're getting into past halfway of this race course so who is going to uh kind of have the gumption to make the decision to pick it up now we've seen uh, you know you use the the phrase uh slow burn there with texas so in the third 500 keep an eye out for them to then take their turn in terms of best effort mm -hmm. to see if they could retake that lead away from stanford yeah, but we'll see Stanford and California there looking looking pretty hot, looking very, very consistent. Um, Texas and Washington on either side of them. A little bit off the pace will be USC and Washington State. And I think because these top four boats are pushing each other so so hard, you know, that there is um, they are, are pushing themselves a little bit farther away from USC and the Cougars of Washington State. All right, and we're going to get an update straight from uh, Lindsay looking out at the water and a really strong finish here by Texas, Stanford, California, Washington dropping back just a little bit to fourth, USC continuing in fifth, and Washington State in sixth. Lindsay, what's happening here out front as they come into the spectator area? You know, every time I watch these start sequences unfold and then lengthening out and what happens in the second 500, I want to go and talk to the coach. What's your race plan? I wonder if that was, you know, just because to see, you know, who's going to who's going to take the first five, then 10, then 20, is how long is that sequence going to be? But to see where the intentional, the emotion, you can see the emotion in the holes. And so California, you saw the emotion come out of them, and then you saw the emotion come out of Stanford. And then in the middle portion, it, it did look like uh, Washington was able to stay in there with California, but they've slipped off that pace just a little bit as Texas slipped back from um, Stanford and Cal as those two crews kind of injected a little bit of energy in the second 500, but Texas has since regained the ground on both of those crews, and so these are the three uh, leaders that are separating themselves from the rest of the field. That third 500 definitely put some heft in the legs and um, it caused Washington to drop off the pace just a little bit, either as is kind of the separating factor. Once you cross that thousand, that really is the difference maker in these crews, especially at this point in the season when we are starting to show what all the winter work is doing and That's the right. efficiency. And these top three crews right now getting upwards of 40 strokes a minute in their sprint phase. They are coming in in Texas. Every time they take a stroke, that boat surges forward. You can kind of see the lift as it comes up out of the water. Stanford uh, also length. really trying right now to hold off a, a late charge here by California. California looking very solid as they have continued 
continue to pull a little bit farther away from Washington. But it is all about Texas. It looks like they will go home with just a boatload of trophies today as they wind up here in the Carly Copley Cup looking for a full boat length, not quite open water. And here they go. It's Texas for the win, followed by the Cardinal of Stanford, and then now California in third. Washington will round out the top four here in just a few strokes, you know, and in, in those last 10, 15 strokes, it did seem as though Texas went from maybe a half a length to the better part of almost a length, not quite. So that's kind of a lot of boat to be able to take at that point in the race. It shows efficiency upon your part at those higher rates in the sprint sequences. So following Washington is USC, and Washington State will round out this field of six in the women's open eight. This is the Carly Copley Cup. That was your first level final great race by all crews, and fun to see those lead changes through the first 1,000, first 17, uh, 1,500 meters of the race between Stanford, Texas, and California. Well, you talk about race plans, and I'm willing to bet that the race plan for all of these crews is we want to win. <laughs> Keep it simple. All right, and we are going to uh, take a look at uh, the start again with the men's open eight. This is the Anderson Borthwick Trophy for open category boats. We could have some master's boats in here, some open age post-collegiate uh, rowers, but then we do have the three collegiate boats from Cal and then one from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, club boat here from Riverside and Dolphin Club, two from, from the Dolphin Club. Um, but let's go ahead and set the lanes for you. In, Cal in, in lane one, it's California A. Lane two, California C. Lane three, California B. Lane four, Riverside. Lane five, Dolphin. Lane six, UC Santa Barbara. And lane seven, Dolphin and Friends of California Crew. I'm going to make sure that I have the right information here before we progress further down the course because there's not quite as many crews on the water as what's on my heat sheet. All right, what we do know as we follow this race down the course, California A, that is their 2V8. Um, right next to them, California C, that's the, th the 3V8. And then California B, that would be the freshman boat. But look at these boats straight across. I'm looking at those three beautiful m Pockers with their stern decks just evenly matched, almost stroke for stroke as we push through this second 500. Behind them by open water, it's going to be Riverside. Um, and then... Um, Let's make sure that we know who that fifth crew is out there. My, my guess is that that is Santa Barbara. Apologies for that. Um, we don't have that information, but, um, but we, we think that it is that UC Santa Barbara crew um, that is uh, in the fifth place position. You know, and, and talking about the energy that comes out in that, in that second 500 of the race once you lengthen, you still have the adrenaline going. You know, the legs don't feel quite so heavy, but that California B boat in lane three seems to be the most kind of emotional, aggressive, energetic That's one right now. That's the freshman right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, which is what you might expect to see out of freshmen. Yeah, they're going to go, they're going to go after those boats with the uh, maybe more experienced uh, oarsmen. And, and that's the way that it's always been generally at Cal and at Washington. The freshmen come in and they have a really good recruiting system, obviously. And so they're going to get a lot of really, really fast kids that are going to then fill out um, the top the top uh, boats in that program. Yeah, so those B and C lineups out of California are pacing one another right now. So these three crews are coming out of a program. The last time we talked about this yesterday, California was here was 2019, and now they're here in full force with a lot of crews all doing very, very well. So, uh, you know, Adrian, you've alluded to depth of program. Uh, certainly, if you have that many people and that many people going at those uh, speeds, it's wonderful to watch. These right now, it does look like uh, Lane Three, California B, is has overtaken California C. They were going stroke for. Stroke four stroke pacing one another for quite a while it was literally like bow balls sitting with the b boat just a hair behind the sea and now they have overtaken them with that energy which it hasn't allowed either of those crews to really take back much margin on the a boat but they have taken 
maybe a little bit. So we'll see what happens. If that momentum continues, they will be able to take more and more, unless the A-boat decides to turn on the afterburners once they cross 1,000. You know, and it's it, it's funny because I um, sometimes forget how fast some of these crews are, but coming to the 1,000-meter line in less than three minutes, I was like, wait, no, that's not right. Yes, actually, yes, it, it is, is right. Yes, it is right. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. These uh, are it. <laughs> but right now, that B-boat from California, the freshman boat pulling just ahead of their uh, competitors um, in the middle there, and uh, just ahead of the 3B8, but the 2B8 walking out to a full-length advantage um, over their other teammates. So behind them, it is Riverside Club Crew, um, and with a great showing here, probably um, a, a, a group of younger younger athletes, maybe a mix of Masters athletes as well, and then UC Santa Barbara um, taking up that fifth place position. Do you want to point out that this is a uh, an event where there is another memorial trophy? This is named after Anderson Borthwick. He was a very influential member of the San Diego community and a longtime member of the San Diego Rowing Club and joined the club at the age of 17 in 1916. So that San Diego Rowing Club, we've been around, they've been around for quite a, a long time. And Anderson remained a member of the rowing club his entire life. He went to UC Berkeley uh, for one year, and then he returned back to San Diego where he worked in the banking industry and helped build out the city of San Diego. So a lot of legacy in that cup. And I, I know that these young men, they take a look at what that, that trophy means, who it's dedicated to, and it means something to them, to the greater uh, world of rowing. We are certainly inside 500 meters to go. You can see that black flag waving again signifies the last 250 meters. And as the three lead boats from California rev it up for their sprints, I can imagine they're going to sprint early as I can already see that that boat, that th lane three California B lineup looks to be very quick and sprightly toward the water with their blades. They look like they want to sprint early. And can they take even more back on that A lineup who is still out in front by just a bit here? Uh, so again, three boats from California are your leaders on those three inside lanes and those three yellow hulls B lineup clearly ahead of the C uh, with the B lineup coming at the A lineup pretty quickly. Oh yeah, look at the sprint here by lane three, California B. They are putting it all on the line to see if they can catch up with their teammates. They do this every day in practice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, there's some more mixed boats, but um, sure, surely a lot of lineup changes that happen throughout the season. That's what's fun about watching um, this sort of fleet of California boats as they come down the race course. And that in lane three, they've nearly broken contact with lane two. And, and still in lane one, still ahead, California A coming away clear water ahead of California B in lane three, who is clear water can the sea line up regain it to have overlap it does not look like there was clear water between those first three crews lane one lane three then lane two just a hair of open so just a couple of seconds separate those three crews over this 2000 meter race course next crew after that is riverside out in lane four followed by uc santa barbara I do want to just mention one thing, Lindsay, and um, as, someone <laughs> as someone who uh, loves to study the physiology of the sport of rowing, I just want to point out that the that freshman boat that just took second race less than an hour ago um, to take home the trophy in the novice category. Ah. So that was a quick turnaround for them. They had they had their warm up and then they went back up to the start and um, just did overrated. another piece. <laughs> keeps Must going, be keeps nice. Going. Yeah. <laughs> well, just wait till the later in the season when they don't have to do uh, that. <laughs> We've set records in Wintec. We really felt the King was the most efficient, effective, and fastest shell out on the water for us. Wintec King is the perfect boat to rev. All hail the King! Yeah!
As we catch you up with what is going on on the race course, already underway is the women's eight, open eight, the Carly Copley Cup. This is the second level final. It's going to be a duel between lane one, UC San Diego, and lane two, University of San Diego. Already underway in this two boat second level final of the women's open eight Carly Copley Cup. Once we have more on the water, I will come back with an update. Right off the start from the very beginning of the race, it was San Diego who had the early lead over UC San Diego. And it does appear to be that they have maintained that lead and continued to extend it through the middle portion of the race. So they got that jump off of the start uh, about a quarter of a length, half a length for the through the first 500 and then were able to extend it from there. So it is as we come down to the last 500 meters or so, uh, San Diego ahead of UC San Diego by a bit of open water between these two crews. You know, for, for those of you who are out here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon enjoying what you see on this eight-laned buoyed course down here on Mission Bay, you know, to give you some perspective here, we have many, many volunteers out here helping this whole production occur. So if you see a volunteer, be sure to thank them, certainly. Uh, the idea of what's going on the race course, if you aren't certain of how a race course gets put in, they use scuba divers and free divers to install the course, and it takes three or four days. So the production that, of course, itself as an event takes all year to come together and many years to improve from year to year there is a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on from people that work you know for the crew classic people that volunteer for the crew classic stewards that have been involved just all sorts of people are involved in taking care of this between the volunteers the referees the families the teams everything that it takes to put a regatta of this scale together is pretty significant so be sure you take a look and savor what's going on around you it is a unique experience that you get to have here in beautiful sunny san diego and again still in the lead of the women's open eight carly copley cup this is the second level final is san diego they got out to that early lead they took it took it from the start so they've shown that in the first 500 second and third 500s all the parts through the race that they have been more efficient down the course uh, they've continued to extend their lead over uc san diego all the way down can they elevate their entire skill set by leveling it up one more time even though they do have clear water and are well ahead of their uh, single competitor here, UC San Diego. Last couple of strokes here. I can only imagine what the coxswain is saying to keep them internally motivated because that's really what's going to help them throughout the rest of the season. Find more speed now. What can we learn now? You know, that's always the question, right? As a coach, as an athlete, how can we assess ourselves and truly give ourselves a an honest opinion of how we did without letting the result dictate how we feel about how we did 
Did we lay down the best four quarters that we could? Are there 20 things that we could adjust? Maybe there are. Well, pick one or two and work on that the next time in practice. But, you know, to be able to go, okay, what did we just lay down? Are we, can we be proud of that regardless of what's going on around us? That's the true key. Not always the peer comparison. Now getting underway up at the start line is the Women's Masters. Back to Masters athletes here. Women's Masters 8 Club Champ, the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. This is your second level final, the final two. Final one, of course, um, already contested er a little bit earlier today. And I'll set the field as these athletes are underway at the start. Lane 1, Sacramento. Lane 2, College Club, Seattle. Lane 3, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane 4, Vancouver. Lane 5, Los Angeles. And Lane 6, Bear Island.
All right, and as Lindsay and I uh, await some good footage so that we can give you an update from the course, it does look like College Club Seattle rowing out of lane two, as well as Vancouver rowing out of lane four are your leaders with San Diego Rowing Club right there in the, in the mix. Uh, Sacramento, the Sacramento Aquatic Center in lane one, a um, little bit off the back there, followed by Los Angeles, and then Bayak B. So crews coming uh, into vision here a little bit better, but yeah, definitely College Club Seattle. They are rowing in some dark uniforms, but bright red boat blades with a couple of red stripes on it, so you could see them from afar. So take a look out and Take a look at that College Club Seattle boat. They are really rowing really quite well. They have been consistent and now opening up with a bit of open water over the remaining field. Closest to them, it will be the crew from Vancouver. Vancouver, just a few seats over San Diego Rowing Club, rowing out of lane three. And then it looks to be tight between Sacramento Aquatic Center and Los Angeles with Bayak B in the trailing position. good challenge here between College Club Seattle and Vancouver as we come into the beach area. College Club Seattle has held a pretty significant lead for a majority of this race, but then Vancouver has been pretty tenacious and tried to take away a little bit of the lead that College Club Seattle has had. Also coming back into the mix um, with a, a closer race than it had been previously is San Diego Rowing Club. So those three crews well ahead and then really close here between Los Angeles and Bayak B and uh, the Sacramento Aquatic Center slipping back to that sixth place position. So all crews coming in to the spectator area. Again, this is just the B-level final, super competitive here for the club championship, the Talia Kelly Considine Club Championship. And crossing in our two leaders there, College Club Seattle and Vancouver, are now getting into those last 250 meters, having raced this morning. I know that at the Masters level, when you hear that 250, you're ready for that. <laughs> so these last 250 meters, rev it up, because it is quite close between those two crews all the way down the course it has been. And so now with just the sprint portion left, we do have little puffs of wind now that may be helping them along just a hair. It's gotten a lot tighter here, that is yeah, for sure, yeah. in these last few strokes yes, between College has. Club and Vancouver. And so as we get into the sprint, stay clean, first of all is the first thing right make sure that you aren't losing ground once you do that once you stay clean then you can ask for a little bit more and step it up and it does look like college club seattle is the crew that is stepping it up a hair over vancouver here they've stayed a little bit cleaner especially in about 250 meters and right now they are staying a lot cleaner they are just much tidier the blades are going straighter to the water much more directly and so they're inching away almost to about a half a length by the time that they cross this finish line if the pace continues maybe just over a half a length over vancouver the other red hole in between those two crews is san diego rowing club it, so it will be san diego rowing club unofficially uh, in between those two crews at least as the eye sees and there is a tight race over on the far side of the course between bayak and los angeles los angeles still maintaining the edge about a deck maybe a couple of seats beyond the deck over bayak with uh, the inside lane of sacramento rounding out the field now of course this is a masters event or if handicaps are involved and that will dictate you know from here it might change uh, how things work. I remember the first time I raced a handicapped race, my teammate said, we can do this at a 26. I said, the race is a thousand meters. We must win by 45 seconds in a thousand <laughs> meters. This is not easy. The reality of Masters <laughs> racing crept in very not quickly. <laughs> easy. <laughs> makes Masters racing makes me love watching people who also love this sport that I love. There is some serious <laughs> dedication by Masters. I have a Masters athlete that I love working with. She literally will car top her single and take a ferry for two hours just to get to just row to sometimes. get on the water. And yeah. sometimes more just to be able to row with other people, you know. So that's the reality of some of these crews that we see as composites come from all over the place. It's the beauty of being able to find common ground, common <laughs> water to race on, to row on, uh, because there aren't always clubs available. Well, and it's a hard it's a hard sport to let go of. <laughs> <laughs> it's got its hold on you, and then it's hard to let go of. Yes. And again, here we are. This is final number two, or the B-level final for uh, the Men's Masters 8 Coronado Keys Real Realty Club. I almost said reality. Realty Club. And we have, um, we have eight boats on the course. So um, I will be back with the 
uh, with the lineups here in just a second. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis. U.S. Rowing is a nonprofit membership organization recognized by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee as the national governing body for the sport of rowing in the United States. U.S. Rowing selects, trains, and manages the teams that represent the U.S. in international competition, including the World Championships, Pan American Games, and Olympic and Paralympic Games. U.S. Rowing serves and promotes the sport on all levels of competition and reflects the spectrum of American rowers, youth, collegians, masters, and those who row for recreation, competition, or fitness. Learn more at usrowing.org. To defeat the unpredictable threats that our nation faces, you must be able to adapt. U.S. Marines train tirelessly, both mentally and physically, to be able to overcome any scenario, be it land, air, sea, or an evolving digital landscape. In the battles for right, America's future, there is one constant. Let's go ahead and set the here for this final number two, or Marine the pre-level final, the Men's Masters that. 8 Do you have the mindset to protect our nation's future? In lane one, future? Lake Union. Visit the lake U.S. Two, Marines tent Sammamish. on vendor row lane or marines.com to learn more. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club B. Lane five, my favorite name of a team, Crimson Death Barge. Lane six, Riverside B, and lane seven, Sacramento Aquatic Center. I did a little quick Google search on the Crimson Death Marge. I, I knew that it had something to do with Harvard, Harvard alums, but um, it alludes to that boat that everyone, every oarsman um, at one time or another has to sit in that's like the fourth or the fifth boat and, you know, is just something that you suffer through in order to make it up the ranks. And I just, I loved that because you stick with it no matter what. At some point, you hopefully get out of that, of that boat. And you you make mean it the up. hull itself? It's, it's not, not just, the barge. It's the boat. It's the experience. Kind of it's, the, it's the whole thing. Okay. It's just, it's the death barge. <laughs> <laughs> Early leaders in the race were Lake Union in lane one, jumping out to about a half a length on the rest of the field. But it's still pretty tight. And there are some, some um, spread across this are across the course as Riverside has showed us earlier on in the race that they've been able to do some good work there on the far side of the course so they're maintaining uh, a good challenge for the lead out there on the far side of the course with a couple of boats in the middle of the field Bayak and San Diego Rowing Club also doing a nice job buying for the lead so Lake Union, Bayak, San Diego and Riverside are some of the early crews that are um, at least in the first half of the race, very tightly packed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Riverside doing a nice job with their start. Um, but again, early on. So um, the levels of fitness, expertise, and experience are probably all over the map here. And uh, we'll see how that plays out um, as we progress down the race course. But Riverside right now, very impressive as they uh, continue to stretch their lead out a little bit over the rest of the field. On the inside, um, it, is, it is going to be San Diego Rowing Club B doing a nice job. Um, and then looking over to lane one, that's Lake Union as being a very, comp very competitive to both San Diego Rowing Club B and Riverside.
Still quite tight among those early leaders that we mentioned, Lake Union, San Diego B, Bayak, Riverside. Riverside's still doing some work out there, and they're taking San Diego along with them. The Crimson Death Barge has dropped well off the pace uh, in between them, so there is a dead lane kind of in between those two crews, and Riverside is certainly uh, about to take a, a lead, a length lead, um, over San Diego in that red hull, and some of the inside crews, Lake Union had that early lead, and they dropped back. Bayak has dropped off of the pace that San Diego set as well. Sammamish is now working their way back in there. So Sammamish never lost contact there in lane two. And they've been in between Lake Union and Bayak. So Sammamish and Lake Union, maybe there's some rivalry there coming out of a similar portion of the country. Um, and they look like Sammamish on, in lane two, close to shore, look like they're trying to take back seats on lane three. Bayak, who was, again, one of those early crews that was trying to take in a lead. But Riverside, again, over on the farther side of the course, is about to break open water. If they haven't broken yet, they want to break open water. I can imagine the Coxon might be asking for it with San Diego in the red hole. That's right. Final 150 meters here for Riverside as they take home this B-level race, holding off San Diego, staying just ahead of San Diego with Bayak right there in that third place position, followed by Lake Union and then Sammamish. Crimson Death Barge in sixth and Sacramento Aquatic Center in the seventh place position. But here they come. Here's Riverside all the way out in lane six, taking this final B with a bit of open water over San Diego. And now here's Bayak, Sammamish. And then uh, there is Sammamish right here. <coughs> and then Crimson Death Barge right down the center of the course there in lane five. And rounding out our field of seven, in the men's Masters 8, that was the Coronado Keys Realty Club champ. That was your second level final. And we'll have a short break before picking back up with some collegiate racing just after 1 o'clock. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. How confident are you about rigging for masters? Get the inside track from Volker Nolte, Mike Purser, and Mike Davenport on the webinar recording Rigging for Masters, available exclusively at fastermastersrowing.com slash rigging. At WinTech and King Racing, we are passionate about rowing. It empowers individuals, teaches them unshakable discipline, and gives all who endure its trials the strength to take on the world. However, rowing still struggles with broad accessibility. WinTech seeks to break down these barriers by making affordable shells for elite athletes, recreational rowers, and everyone in between. WinTech, fair price, unfair advantage. Orboard, the ultimate fitness, fun, and adventure product. The Orboard rower converts any paddleboard into a sculling boat that's fun and excellent exercise. With the convenient Orboard travel bag, you can transport the rower anywhere, meaning you're no longer bound to row only at a club. Enjoy the freedom of getting out on your favorite lake, river, or ocean, or even take it along when you head off for vacation. Orboard, row anywhere for fitness, fun, and adventure. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. 
SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination and is vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. SDTMD is pleased to support the San Diego Crew Classic in 2023 for its 50th anniversary. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Sharp Healthcare congratulates the San Diego Crew Classic on five decades of rowing excellence and is proud to sponsor the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Hospital Cup. The affiliated physicians, nurses, and staff of Sharp Healthcare have provided quality health care to the San Diego community for more than 65 years. This tradition of service excellence and caring is further demonstrated by Sharp's support of the San Diego Crew Classic since 1982. U.S. Rowing is a nonprofit membership organization recognized by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee as the national governing body for the sport of rowing in the United States. U.S. Rowing selects, trains, and manages the teams that represent the U.S. in international competition, including the World Championships, Pan American Games, and Olympic and Paralympic Games. U.S. Rowing serves and promotes the sport on all levels of competition and reflects the spectrum of American rowers, youth, collegians, masters, and those who row for recreation, competition, or fitness. Learn more at usrowing.org.
All right, and we are back in the racing action here. Up at the start, this is a B-level final for the Women's Collegiate Four. We just have three boats on the water. Um, this is actually not a B-level final. I am sorry, I'm gonna correct myself. It is the Collegiate Four B, so uh, second tier fours uh, for these colleges, but we do just have three boats entered. In lane one, Notre Dame. Uh, lane two, University of San Diego. And lane three, USC and that is exactly how you'll find them in that order Notre Dame uh, with the early lead sitting right now about a stern just about a, a minute into the race they already have that full boat length lead just behind them is University of San Diego and then a little bit off the back uh, with a bit of open water is USC we'll come back in uh, just a minute with an update from the race course And we are well underway here in the Women's Collegiate Fours. This is a Coxed Four. This is the second four, and it's the first level final. It's a three-boat final in lane one. Notre Dame out in front at one of the lower stroke rates of the boats on the course here. And we've seen Notre Dame do pretty well in their fours uh, so far. Notre Dame representing the Atlantic Coast Conference coming from over on the other side of the country. They are out in front with clear water over San Diego, who has clear water over USC, as you can see in the picture. I'm telling you what you can already see. But uh, their stroke rate is a few beats lower than the other two crews that are out on the water. So their efficiency is there, which is which is great to see, you know, um, having tighter races later in the season, whatever, uh, whatever their schedule has in store for them up next. You know, it's important that they practice their rates, find their efficiency at these rates, and then see what they need to do um, to be able to increase speed from here on out. Regardless of who's next to you, how can you find more speed every time that you have a chance to go to an actual start? line because a lot of times these collegiate crews don't have the opportunity to get to a buoyed course they're actually sometimes doing floating starts and things like that coached races scrimmages things so coming out here and having um, this type of preparation for the bigger races as the season ramps up is is great so what can you learn every stroke down the course that's right and it's funny because you know the season <coughs> a lot of for a lot of crews the season starts
starts here at San Diego, and then it just screams by pretty fast yeah. because then the championship season comes up to them at the beginning of May, and then you've got you know NCAA's. If you're if you're a woman, you've got NCAA's at the end of May. For the men, it's the IRAs, and it just happens so fast that you know we joke about it as rowers that the amount of training that you have to put in uh, to do the amount of racing, if you calculated <laughs> yeah. it up, is the hours just, per it's stroke. just better not to yeah. think about yeah. it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, well, you know, and, and as you say that, too, we talk about the race season ramping up. I know you mentioned this yesterday, but we didn't get into this portion of it. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that these are student athletes. These mm -hmm. are collegiate athletes. And so not yes. only is their race season ramping up right now, but their academic season is right. ramping up right now. So they're going to come into finals sometimes in late April, early May. And so all of that is going to overlap. So to be able to manage all of what's happening you know, in the classroom, on the books versus what's happening out here. That's a lot of pressure and two very different things. Nice thing is I always found that sport may be more organized, you yeah. know, having you have my to teammates. maximize your time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not Absolutely. to mention that, you know, I'm going to drop some science here. Exercise helps your brain grow. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Look it up. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then it makes you sleepy. So you got to go to sleep. you got to get more sleep. Yeah. So, uh, But Notre Dame, I mean, a top-tier school, um, the Fighting Irish, uh, really having a good season so far. We talked about them previously and the other events they were entered in. They were entered in the Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational, uh, the first time for them back at the Crew Classic since 2009. So uh, welcoming them back to the shores of San Diego. And then University of San Diego here in the second place position. This is their home course. Uh, they get to row on Mission Bay every single day. And so mm -hmm. they know it like the back of their hands. But again, also a top tier school, really tough. They are, U University of San Diego always does quite well. They are in uh, the West Coast Conference. Um, and amongst in that same conference would be Gonzaga, Loyola Marymount, St. Mary's. Um, and so really quite a tough conference and they'll be coming up with their championships at the end of April. So it's going to be here before we know it. And Notre Dame having a row of it coming in toward the closing bits of the race here. I'll step out and see if I can see them with my eyeball, which I should at this point in the race, see if they ramp it up a little bit for a sprint. It seems that maybe they're picking up just a little bit, but nothing nothing uh, excessive here as they aren't really being pushed. They're having, well, they're having a row of it compared to the other two crews in this. There is a medal line, a medal on the line. This is the collegiate B second four. Uh, Cox second, Coxed four, and uh, it is a first level final, so that means there is a medal on the line here as Notre Dame start to finish just has lengthened their lead over San Diego and USC. And here comes San Diego in lane two. With USC rounding out our field of three here in this first level final for the women's collegiate coxed four uh, B. Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? This challenging time of life can be confusing. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Faster Masters Rowing has a pre-recorded webinar available right now at fastermastersrowing.com slash menopause. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis. Okay, we are back in the racing action here with a, a grand final in the women's collegiate D2, D3, and Club 4. We just got four entries on the course. 
Um, but that is enough to create a very, um, oh, the, we have three entries here. That it should be enough to create a very competitive um, competitive event. And out of the gate, it is Orange Coast College in lane one, followed by Colorado in lane two, and then Pacific Lutheran in lane three. And hot off of the starting blocks, it is gonna be Orange Coast College. Um, again, this is the only fours race that the D2, D3, and club category is hosting. Um, so Orange Coast deep enough to, um, to field a four, Colorado and Pacific Lutheran as well. At the NCAAs in Division Three, Pacific Lutheran um, is used to, they only, um, they only race two eights. Um, so not a whole lot of, of fours at that level. I'm sure that that's what they, how they train. Um, but here they are doing a great job here out on Mission Bay as Orange Coast has really established a clear lead very early on, already a couple of lengths of open water for them over both Colorado and Pacific Lutheran. So at the start that Orange Coast had, uh, the lead that they took in the few first start in, the, in their starting sequence right from the beginning of this race is any indication of what they've done through the middle portions of this race. They've done nothing but extend their lead over Colorado's A entry and Pacific Lutheran here in lane three. Colorado and Pacific Lutheran still relatively close to one another, but certainly trailing Orange, Orange Coast, who is in lane one with clear water over both of the other crews that are in this field of three in the... Women's Collegiate Division 2 and 3, Club Cox 4. All right, and as we wind up the final strokes here for the Women's Collegiate D2, D3, and Club 4 final, we have seen Orange Coast continue to extend their lead out over Colorado and Pacific Lutheran. So with a strategy here that they have to make sure to keep that intrinsic motivation, we've talked about that, 
uh, is very, very important, and the coxswain to communicate to make sure that they don't just sit, and that's not something, of course, that a lot of athletes are going to want to do, but they have to be reminded that, hey, if they've got this much length between themselves and the next competitor, what can we focus on to keep driving ourselves forward to get faster as we move down the race course? And to me, as a coach, it would be about execution, making sure that you have the best race of the day right here, feeling really good and knowing that, you know, this is this is practice, of course, for the next time you get out on the race course. Hey, no, you. You mentioned practice for the next time that we get on the course. We talk about the number of hours, the number of hours that you spend per stroke of the race. You know, it's 2,000 meters. There's somewhere between, you know, 200 and 220, somewhere around there, uh, give or take, depending on the speed of the hole and the conditions and all that kind of stuff. But if you think about the number of strokes that you take in a single practice, let alone over the course of the season, I remember way back when I first started rowing, the, the novice group calculated it out, and it was something over 1,000 hours per stroke that you actually take <laughs> in a single race. Uh, you know, and compared to other sports, Pacific Lutheran coming across the line in second over Colorado A. Uh, so uh, the number of, uh, of competitions in rowing compared to other sports, you know, there are certain sports out there that will, you know, have 50 or 55 competitions in a single season, and that's what we see with, you know, game sports like basketball and, and baseball and, you know, and, and you find yourself, you know, especially in those sports where you see multiple, if you do better through the late season, the postseason, you're going to have even more, whereas in rowing, you know, you have only a handful of times maybe that you get to go to the line against other teams, let alone people from all over the country, and that might be a complete rarity. So in situations that you have an opportunity to line up with the start gate, the start block, that's... You've got to take full advantage yes. of the opportunity yes. that's given to you. That's right. Next up, our next event will be the Women's Collegiate D2 and 3 and Club. This is the Novice 8 final for the Division Two and Three and club teams. And awaiting the start of the next event, the Women's Collegiate Division 2, 3, and Club. This is your novice first level final. So there is a medal on the line in this race here. It is a five boat final. So we'll have five lanes across, starting with lane one is Orange Coast. Lane two is Colorado. Lane three, UC Davis. Lane four, UC Santa Barbara A. And in lane five, UC Santa Barbara B. One thing I just realized as we are looking at these D2, D3 club programs is that um, we haven't had any D2 programs here this weekend. So it's either, it's a good mix, mostly club programs um, and then some D3 programs. But the club scene is strong, especially on the West Coast. Um, last year I had the opportunity to go out to the club national championships and it was so impressive with the number of programs that are running really high level rowing programs. It was, it was super fun to see the number of kids that are on the water. Um, and we're looking at that right here with Colorado, Davis, and UC Santa Barbara, big, strong club programs. Orange Coast is a varsity program, mm -hmm. Division One. You know, and Division Two is the smallest of the divisions in terms of the number of teams involved, at least in the sport of rowing. Mm -hmm. um, and those divisions are delineated based on the number of sports that a college or university will sponsor. Um, and so, you know, there are some Division Two programs out here in California that do quite well on the national stage at the Division Two level, having, you know, both of us have coached in D2. So knowing who, that's who some of those different crews are, but interesting to point out that there aren't Division Two programs currently racing in this event. Yeah. 
All right, and we've got Orange Coast College, the Pirates. They've got an open water lead. And then it's pretty tightly packed here between Colorado, UC Davis, and UC Santa Barbara A. So uh, advantage is going to go to Davis right down in the center of the course out of lane three. They're looking about a half a boat length advantage over Colorado and UC Santa Barbara A. UC Santa Barbara B, a little bit off the back by open water in the fifth place position. And you can see that Orange Coast, uh, the Orange Coast 8 there, this is a Division II, three club novice 8. You can just see the efficiency relative to the rest of the crews where the hole just glides out just a little bit more per stroke that they're taking, which is why you see them out in front of the trailing three crews. That it is UC Davis in the center of the next kind of cluster um, of three, which is UC Davis leading in a, a mini Chevron secondary race occurring between them, Colorado, and UC Santa Barbara A. It is UC Santa Barbara B that has dropped out of the picture and has lost contact with their teammates there of UC Santa Barbara B. And as, you know, between UC Davis and, uh, or sorry, excuse me, between Colorado and UC Santa Barbara A, there is a very little distance to be considered. So I wouldn't even begin to think or begin to call who has the, the level, the edge between those two crews and the darker holes that flank UC Davis, who is currently sitting in second place. All right, and it looks like it is actually getting tighter there in the center between Colorado Davis and UC Santa Barbara. As we come down to 750 meters gone, Orange Coast well out in front, a couple of lengths of open water for them as they can be comfortably assured that they will come across that line first, barring any sort of disaster or uh, nature impeding in their in their progress but um and we don't uh, we d we definitely don't want to um say anything because we've seen a lot this weekend a lot of things that can happen to a crew between the start line and the finish line but um, right now orange coast doing a really nice job just taking it along and looking back at the rest of the field confident that they are doing their job so behind them though the battle between davis colorado and santa barbara to kind of exert themselves is really now coming down between davis and santa barbara so colorado dropping back to fourth but santa barbara now taking the edge over davis just by about one seat. Yeah, and through that middle portion of the race, you could just see where UC Santa Barbara's A boat uh, finally started to either either turn up the next gear, take another level, or it was that the other two crews on the inside of them started to fade just a little bit. Either way, they definitely were taking advantage of that and, um, and changing where their bow ball was. They decided to make a difference in terms of where they wanted to be in this race, which at that point, making that move and making that adjustment where it was several seats, that they were able to shift, that that might give them the momentum that they need to carry them up in front to put them solidly into second place. Well, indeed, that jump was made right uh, past the 750, so I, I'm guessing that it was the 1,000-meter line jump that the Santa Barbara Coxon called for. Um, it's a good marker, that halfway point, and again, that's where you want to tap into your deeper level of fitness. Your winter training is that third 500. And as these novice eights are about to cross into the final 500, they're just under 600 meters to go. Orange Coast is just under 600 meters to go in this race. Uh, you can see just a little bit of puffs of wind over there, but they are certainly still sitting out in front of the rest of the group. Uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara A made that move through the middle of the race to try and take s away the lead that UC Davis did have over them for that second position. But Davis has certainly responded. So the race that's happening behind, well behind Orange Coast, who has several lengths of open water over the rest of the field, is very tight. So in lanes three and lanes four between UC Davis and UC Santa Barbara A is very tight. So those two coxswains 
are keeping an eye on one another and certainly goading their athletes on to find more because there is still a lot of strokes left to be rode in those two lanes in particular. Uh, and so a lot could happen in terms of lead change. Uh, are they going to sprint a little bit early? Do they know what sprinting is at this point in the season, especially being novices in these holes? I like to ask questions to the crowd. Put those seeds in your mind. What's going to happen? Never know. <laughs> All right, and here they come, the orange of Orange Coast College, the Pirates coming into their final strokes here, last uh, about 50 meters or so for them, last 10, 10 uh, strokes as they come across the line, looking very relaxed. And it is UC Santa Barbara A who has opened up to almost clear water over UC Davis through that third 500 of the race. You can see their yellow jerseys there. They're coming into the last 10 strokes or so before they hear that beep. Orange Coast College certainly did come across uh, relatively calmly as they came through the line well clear of the rest of the field. Santa Barbara A, just about a length. There's still a little bit of contact. UC Davis staying a little bit cleaner, but it's not quite enough to keep up with what Santa Barbara did during that third 500 of the race. Behind them. Behind them, Colorado, and UC Santa Barbara B rounding out the field of five in the women's collegiate division two, three, and club. This was a novice eight first level final with a medal on the line. All right, and we actually are going to jump into this race that is actually coming into the spectator area already. This is the Men's Collegiate Lightweight Secretary of the Navy Cup Final. Just two boats on the water. We've got Navy, excuse me, Navy. We have UCLA in lane one, and then UC Santa Barbara in lane two. With UCLA well clear of UC Santa Barbara and still revving it up. You can see the energy popping off those blades as they come toward the finish line here on that inside lane, lane one. You see the blue blades and the blue pants on the lightweights from UCLA coming into the last five strokes or fewer before they hear that horn go in their first level final. There is also a medal on the line here in lane two. UC Santa Barbara in the yellow will follow them across the line.
All right, we've got eight crews lined up and ready to go. Up at the start, we're turning our attention back over to the juniors. This is the Women's Youth Eight, the Youth Cup Final. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, Holy Names. Lane four, Sagatuck. Lane five, Connecticut Boat Club. Lane six, Capital Crew. Lane seven, Long Beach Junior Crew. And lane eight, Oakland Strokes. And we have a start. As we're still in the first 250 meters of this Women's Youth Cup first level final, medal on the line, a lot of crews that may see each other later in the season as they progress through their various races and advance. A hot start with those eight boats across, very tight, of course. Everyone starts even at the start line. Uh, but Marin, after the first 20 strokes or so, uh, was able to get the blades right back to the water. You can see the power coming out of that hull. And now they've just taken about a length on the rest of the field, but it does almost look like a U shape as they come down down the field with Marin out in the lead, Newport next to them, and then way on the other side with lane eight, low Oakland strokes. Those are the ones that are pushing out uh, in the in the beginning of the race, and we have uh, as well as Saugatuck and then Capital as well in lane six, looking to, okay, now as we come off of our start sequences, what does our base do for us? And that's where you start to see, okay, uh, either someone held it a little bit higher, a little bit longer, and that allows them to push up, or they lengthened out sooner, and the efficiency starts to show once you get past the first three or 400 meters of the race. All right, but let's get some lane placements here as we look at a little bit more of a spread between boats. We've got Marin already with a full boat length. I had them clocked at 35 strokes a minute. They had a great start mm -hmm. and they are just continuing to inch away from the field. Right next to them it is Newport. Both Marin and Newport on the women's side uh, won their heats yesterday, all of their heats. So those are the two favored crews. But then in lane four, mm -hmm. Sagatuck is in the third place position fighting off a charge from Oakland Strokes on the outside as well as Holy Names in lane three. Now in the, the other crews, the other four crews that we're going to take a look at, it will be Connecticut. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and change that a little bit. It's going to be Capital Crew in the fifth place position, very close to Holy Names. Mm -hmm. And then moving on the inside, it is Connecticut Boat Club and then Long Beach Junior Crew. But there's a lot of jockeying for position happening right now. 750 meters gone and already Marin and Newport with open water over the rest of the field. Sagatuck trying to as well break free from the rest of the crews. And as the middle portion of this race develops, Sagatuck is starting to separate themselves out along with the, our current two leaders of Marin and Newport. Marin uh, having a, a decent amount of, of, of length of distance on Newport, but Newport definitely still well within contact and going right along with them. It's almost as if Sagatuck kind of clipped onto the amount of open water that Newport had on them, and they've been able to maintain that distance, which that, you know, through this middle, they may be pacing the leaders, but they um, had some ground taken on them right off the start that had them drop back but oh, all the way across the field zero crews no crews are getting dropped by the group as there are multiple races happening because out on the far side with Oakland Strokes they are still in there looking to come back on Sagatuck and holy names and Lindsay you got to take a look up front though with, with what's going on between Marin and Newport Marin still solidly holding on to the lead but Newport is being very very tenacious and trying to really stick within contact like actually overlap with Marin's boat Marin is as we know very very strong they won their heats by a sizable margin yesterday so this may be the first time this season that they have been challenged this closely uh, Newport always a great competitor um, and so we we will keep an eye on that, on what's happening at the front of the pack. Behind them, Sagatuck and Holy Names close to each other with Oakland Strokes well on the outside in lane eight. Again, we've talked about this previously where it's difficult for the, the crew, difficult for the coxswain to keep track of everything that's going on when their main competition is a few four to five lanes over. Um, in the remaining field, it will be Capital Crew in the sixth place position, followed by Long Beach Juniors and then Connecticut Boat Club.
All right, there is still contact between Marin and Newport. So Newport lurking just off of the sixth seat of the Marin boat. So Marin there with a solid lead as they come into the final 500 meters, just getting ready to cross over that line and come into the spectator area. This is an awesome race. So get yourself down to the beach. Let's see these crews as they come by. These are some of the fastest crews in the nation for junior rowers. So Marin right now with that lead, Newport winding it up. Maybe they're going to start that sprint early early, but we're going to see how Marin can answer that. As they continue to push each other, there's now several boat lengths of open water between themselves and that third place crew, Sagatuck. Behind them, it is Holy Names in the fourth place position. Lindsay, what do you see for fifth, sixth, and seventh place? As we're well in, we're past that black flag, so our two leaders of Newport and Marin are the two that have, they're well within the sprint. Marin is looking to lengthen out from Newport at this point, and it is still Sagatuck. They are a length, they are open water back of the two leaders, but still Sagatuck there in third place, and it's getting closer and closer between the trailing the other five crews that are there. Connecticut is also working their way back up into the field, but it is very close between Holy Names, and then out on the outside with Oakland Strokes as well. And two lanes in, Capital is having a great late surge here to contend with Oakland Strokes out in the middle of the course. And just as Capital is, also, is looking to move back up into uh, what Holy Names has done a nice job through the middle of the course to keep themselves in a position to maybe stay in this the top four here, Connecticut is also working their way up. So listen for many beeps that are very, very close together. What is certain is that Marin and Newport were well clear of the rest of the field, followed by Saugatuck, and then Holy Names. They did it through the middle, and rather than dropping off in that second 500, they dropped back a little bit, but then were able to maintain some contact. It does look like Oakland Strokes over on the outside, Capital having that late surge to overtake Long Beach, and then Connecticut. But again, half length. Those were, that was a very, very like z small Z-shaped stagger over on the yeah. far side of the course. Definite late surges by all crews, certainly by Capital, to put themselves in a much better position than what yeah. they were in entering the third 500. Right, so those uh, lanes, uh, f or excuse me, the places, five, six, seven, and eight, really, really close to each other. The fight was definitely up front as they were well far ahead um, of the rest of the crews, uh, leaving everyone else behind to battle it out for third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth place. That's how deep junior rowing is. There are a lot of really fast crews across the country, and they're going to get faster as the season goes on. Well done to Marin to take the Women's Youth Cup Grand Final. All right, and we are going to go right back up to the start. Not a whole lot of time in between racing. We've got the Men's Youth 8, the Youth uh, San Diego Rowing Cup on the line. In lane 1, Marin. Lane 2, Newport. Lane 3, NorCal. Lane uh, 4, Oakland Strokes. Lane 5, Sagatuck. Lane 6, Pacific. Lane 7, San Diego. And Lane 8, Capital. This is an all-California uh, race here, except for Sagatuck out of lane five. So a lot of these crews are going to see each other several times throughout the season. But for Sagatuck, this is a super important race for them uh, for a number of reasons. But to be able to come across and race cross-regionally is really, really important. And it will inform them of how their season should progress as they gear up for youth nationals in June.
Well, you're not hearing that much from me and Lindsay because there is a lot of overlap here between these crews. These eight crews, as they come into the first 500 meters, are just about ready to cross that point. And there is a lot of contact. There is no one that's broken free with open water yet. We are looking at one, two, three, four, five boats that are essentially dead even. Marin, Newport, Oakland Stroke, Saugatuck, San Diego, and Capitol. So that is where they stand right now. It is pretty tight here with Marin maybe nosing themselves out in front just a bit over Newport. So Marin looking at about three to four seats over Newport. Newport looking to have a bit of a lead over Oakland Strokes and then moving to the outside San Diego Rowing Club and Capitol also in that mix. Down the center of the field, also in there, um, that would be that would be Oakland Strokes. NorCal Crew slipping a little bit off the back, um, along with Pacific, and then Saugatuck as well. So let's try and get a little bit better placement for you. Marin out in front, closest competitor to them right now is going to be Oakland Strokes. Oakland Strokes moving certainly. Yeah, through Oakland that moving. Through that, through the uh, early stages of the second 500, Oakland Strokes is asserting themselves over Newport. Newport last year's winners in this event. Marin is ahead of Newport, and so the early leaders were Marin and Newport. But in the last 30 seconds or so, Oakland Strokes has overtaken wow. Newport and is looking to take back some of the lead that Marin had on them. And with this crew that is in between Oakland Strokes and Newport, NorCal was actually one of the crews that slipped back off of the start along with Pacific. But now at this point, NorCal crew is coming back into it to a certain extent relative to the yep. rest of the field so they are among the top four to five crews here along with San Diego Rowing Club way on the outside in that red hole to the uh, top of the picture but as we are just shy of a thousand meters it does look like there's a little bit more separation it's shaken out just a little bit as Marin Oakland Strokes and Newport push themselves a little bit farther away Newport has almost broken completely clean of the rest of the field and now those top three boats with open water so Marin sitting about four seats over Oakland Strokes. Oakland almost bowed a stern over Newport. And then behind them, the next closest crew is going to be San Diego. And looking at those crews, NorCal wanted to keep pace with what's going on with those leaders, but it's just too much for them to keep hold of as they NorCal starts to uh, pace out with the uh, crews of San Diego, looking at, looking at the second wave of this race being NorCal, Saugatuck, Pacific, San Diego, and Capital. The three crews that continue to extend are Marin, Newport, and Oakland Strokes. These are such quick races that a lot really does change in a matter of 10 strokes or so. And then as we should be just past the 1,000 meter mark, there's a lot that's going to happen in this third 500. And this is pivotal. This is the moment where the training comes in. When your body starts to get tired, the technique has to be perfect because it is this tight. All the way down the course, it's going to be jockeying for position. And then who has the most energy, the most gumption? We've talked about it a little bit this weekend where this is that gut check moment is like what can I dig into what more can I ask of my body and right now Marin and Oakland Strokes well out in front pushing each other so hard we can't see side by side exactly how uh, what the distance is between them but it's pretty tight Great recovery here by NorCal. We spoke to that a little bit earlier. Newport's still in the mix. They're in third, but just behind them is NorCal. They had slipped back a little bit, and now they have come back in the picture to look at a fourth-place spot. They also have San Diego out there in lane seven that they have to look out for. Back on the inside, it's Saugatuck. So fourth place is going to be a pretty hotly contested spot as they come into the final 500 meters. Look down at the beach. It's a Marin and New, uh, excuse me, a Marin and Oakland Strokes battle to the line. Right now, I'm going to give that slight advantage to Oakland Strokes. Yeah, that momentum that they picked up through the second half of the second 500 is certainly paying them off right now as they come into the last 500. Saugatuck is also a crew that we didn't mention much early on because they were sitting a little bit behind off of the pace and then through that middle portion of the race they their pace has been able to keep them up in you know that third fourth fifth position but it is this closeness here that is happening with Oakland strokes 
in lane four, to be out in lane four and, and kind of set the pace here. You can see that they're already sprinting. They're staying tidy, staying clean. Here comes clean. Marin. Here, here comes, comes Marin. Marin. This is the battle to the line that is so common in this men's youth San Diego Rowing Cup final. Wow. It's going to come down to two horns, and Marin looks like it has the energy. You can see just a little more emotion popping off of those blades as the hole, that yellow hole, surges in lane one, and they are. They've been able to retake about a half there a length go. by the time these horns go. It was neck and neck, and now they you could see the energy shift. But valiant effort wow. by Oakland strokes through the middle, and certainly by Marin to not let it go by the end. They didn't want to give that up. Third behind them unofficially is going to be last year's winners, Newport Aquatic. And then with them, look at that, NorCal crew digging in to bring themselves back up into it in fourth place with the Red Hall of San Diego Rowing Club on the far side. And then we have Sagatuck getting themselves up in there as well, near contact with San Diego Rowing Club. And then on the far side, back to Capitol, out in the yellow hull and Pacific. You could see that Pacific also made an effort to sprint there. The blades were going a little bit quicker. They definitely brought up the rate, but it wasn't enough to overtake Capitol. Wow. That is an exciting finish when it goes back and forth like that. And, you know, you've got a, a clear leader for most of the race. And then, it, and, and then things switch positions. And then it goes back. I mean, it is... This is how fun junior rowing is in the United States. It is just as exciting as it gets, and the, the quality and the level of, uh, of rowing is just so high. Love to see it. You know, well done, Marin. That was a very patient move by Oakland Strokes. You could see it un unwinding. You could see it beginning in its infancy, you know, in that second 500, and then it was just not quite enough to overtake what Marin had left in the tank to out-sprint them in the end. All right, and we are back up and running here with six boats on the course. This is the Women's Under-17 Referee Cup LA84 Foundation Trophy. We've got Marin in lane one, Oakland Strokes in lane two, Newport in lane three, Newport Sea Base in lane four, Oakland Strokes B in lane five, and NorCal Crew in lane six. And your, e your leaders, as they came out of the heats, it will be Marin, followed by Oakland Strokes. In the third place position, it looks to be Newport Sea Base. And then back behind them, it will be Newport and Oakland Strokes B, very close to each other. And then finally, NorCal Crew. So we'll let it shake out just a little bit as these crews settle into their base rhythm. But right now, early leader, Marin. All right, and we continue to keep our eye on the race course as things develop, maybe a little bit more spacing between crews, still contact between all boats except for NorCal, a little bit of a technical uh, something going on out there in lane six. I don't know exactly what happened, but the boat did come to, uh, to slow down a bit, maybe, um, maybe a small crab, but they are rowing, they are continuing, um, just not quite sure exactly what happened. So they've fallen just a bit off the pace, but some really tight packs here going on, Marin, uh, still out in front but Oakland Strokes in contact with them so Marin just with about a stern advantage but they have not broken free behind them in that third place position continues to be Newport Sea Base with Newport chasing Oakland Strokes be also right there and whether the coxswain between the Newport and Oakland Strokes B boats are, are keeping an eye on one another, Oakland Strokes put some pressure on them in the second 500, and uh, Newport was able to answer that, which has allowed them to push back up even more into Newport Sea Base. So Newport Sea Base in lane four, who was originally one of those top three, is now catching the pressure from Newport, who is coming through inch by inch. You can just see the bow ball taking little by little per stroke, which is great momentum, great confidence builder for that crew if they could just keep it coming. Just I, I don't need all of it right now. I just to go a hair faster than the crew next to me and what that is going to cause is that that's going to help Newport 
claw back into Oakland Strokes, who was one of our two early leaders as well. Marin, though, they are still continuing to inch out on Oakland Strokes. In lane one, they are kind of shielded almost by Oakland Strokes from the rest of the field. And so meanwhile, while everyone's trying to catch back up to Oakland A in lane two, Marin is slipping away ever so slightly stroke by stroke. And it is open water for them. I took a look down, just kind of watching the coxswain, watching the body language. And you know what happens as they just continue to kind of inch forward and to kind of ticket along that coxswain asking for open water maybe she had a goal to find that open water by a specific point uh, not sure but they have it now so Marin continuing to walk away and then really tight racing here between Newport Sea Base, Oakland Strokes, Oakland Strokes B and Newport so we'll keep an eye on what happens in this third 500 of the women's under 17 referee cup. All right, and as we come down to the beach and just shy of the spectator area, Marin continuing to open up that open water lead in this women's under 17-8. Behind them, the battle is between Oakland Strokes, Newport, and Newport Sea Base. I'm going to give the advantage right now for that second place position to Oakland Strokes, but really tight to them is Newport. Newport Sea Base slipping back just a little bit with Oakland Strokes B in fifth, back behind Newport Sea Base by a bit of open water, and then NorCal pulling up in that sixth place position. But take a look at lanes two and three, Oakland Strokes and Newport for that second or third place spot. All crews are about to they're about to enter the last 250 meters of the U women's U17 Referee Cup LA84 Foundation Trophy. This is a, tr a sponsored trophy and a first level final, so there is a trophy and a medal on the line here in this race. And it's been interesting to watch the different lead changes, the different surges through the middle portions of the race. Marin, the one thing that's been certain is that Marin has been out in front the entire time. And now that we're coming into the sprint, Oakland Strokes A in lane two and Newport in lane three are going to it's going to come down to the line with those two crews. 20 to 25, 30 strokes left for those two crews as they begin to separate themselves a little bit more from the rest of the field. Newport Sea Base was up in, up in among the leaders early on, but they've dropped back to open water behind, and it is Oakland Strokes still maintaining the edge over Newport as Newport tries to make that surge to take away some of the lead. But it looks like they may run out of space as Newport answers that call. Either way, Marin is taking more and more open water and staying very clean as they do it in the sprint, which is always impressive to watch how clean can you stay as the effort goes the line comes and you can see the excitement on their faces stroke seats certainly a couple of them splashed the water got it in the coxswain's face and they are very excited by that finish because they know that in lane two oakland strokes a and in lane three newport those are fast crews as well and they were able to overtake them in this first level final here next across the line unofficially looks to be uh, uh Newport Sea Base followed by Oakland Strokes B and then NorCal to round out the field of six. But again, knowing who they're racing against, knowing the level of competition in these youth races, it certainly is an exciting place to cross the finish line. Not just knowing that you're ahead, but knowing 
whether you've had a good race or not. You know, if, even if you're clear water ahead, you and you alone, you and your teammates, you're the only ones that know if it was really the race that you wanted to execute. And it looks as though by their expressions, their reactions, that it may have been the race that they were looking to execute today. Absolutely. You always want to perform well here at the Crew Classic. Again, it's a high pressure situation, high visibility. So if you can put yourself under that, per uh, under that pressure and perform well, then that bodes well for the rest of your season. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis. To defeat the unpredictable threats that our nation faces, you must be able to adapt. U.S. Marines train tirelessly, both mentally and physically, to be Already able to overcome away, any scenario. For be it land, U air, sea, cup. This or is an your first evolving level digital final. Landscape. So there is a medal on the, the line for in America's this future, race there is as we come to the constant. finishing stages Marines, of the San Diego Crew Classic Day Do you three. have the mindset to protect our nation's Sunny future? Sunday out here on Mission Visit Bay the US in lane one on for this eight-boat field of this men's U-17 final is Marin. In lane two, NorCal. Lane three, Long Beach. Lane four, Newport. Lane five, Oakland Strokes. Lane six, Los Gatos. Lane seven, Capital. And in lane eight is Pacific. We will look for another hot start out of Marin and uh, see if NorCal crew can keep pace with them. What we've noticed so far, of course, in these youth races is that they stay tight in these grand finals. Final A, first level final, whatever you want to call it. They stay tight for a lot of the race, get off of the line very, very quickly. Uh, and if anything, you know, it, it, over the course of the weekend, we've seen Marin be pretty fast off the start. And the question is, is can they stay fast? And who else will choose to go with them from the get-go? That's here? right. And the amount of adrenaline and excitement that there is it, off of the start is just, it, it is palpable in these young men as they just blast out of the gates. But it's not just about what happens at the start. Obviously, it's what happens at the finish. It's how you sustain it. It's how you move into that base rate, how you kind of calm down because you don't want to expend all of your energy in that first thousand uh, because then you end up paying for it for the whole rest of the race. But as we saw yesterday, Marin, very quick crew out of the gates and able to just kind of tick along and extend their lead out. Right now, they do um, have a challenge coming out of lane two. That is NorCal. So right now, Marin leading by just about one seat, but with a big challenge, big push here by NorCal. Now, these two boats pushing each other so hard that we now have a fleet of boats behind them, um, almost in lane order. We've got Long Beach Junior Crew in third. They are followed by Newport and then Oakland Strokes. And it looked as though it was maybe uh, Los Gatos and Capital dropping back just a little bit. Pacific had a bit of an edge on those outer Yeah, crews. Pacific is in there as well. It looks like Pacific's in that fifth place position with Los Gatos and then Capital Oakland Strokes. And it was six and seven. It or was seventh and eighth. And it was uh, Marin with the quickest maybe starting sequence, first five, five and twenty, and then NorCal after that just kept motoring, and they have definitely put the pressure on yeah. them to overtake the lead at least through the second five hundred of this. You know, coming through the heats and everything, coming through all the racing that you've had throughout the weekend. Um, sometimes a strategy is if if you know that another crew has a quicker start than you, and you know maybe what the margin might have been by the time the race was through, you might say, okay, you know what, we're going to hold on to our start sequence a little bit longer so that we don't let them run away from us like they did maybe in the previous race. And that looked like something that maybe the Long Beach Juniors were looking to do as they looked to keep pace with those early leaders of NorCal and Marin, but that pace was just too blistery for them to keep up with, yep. um, even though they made that valiant effort right there in the second half of the first 500 and certainly in the early portions of the second 500. But as you can see, uh, they paid for it because now both of those lead crews of Marin and NorCal are asserting themselves well clear of the rest of the pack. Yeah, and what a great race here for NorCal as they have not just, you know, not just come up to challenge, but they are now pulling ahead of Marin. They look to have about a half boat length lead right now as we hit the tents and come into the spectator area on the beach. So NorCal right now with that lead, Marin in second with a significant amount of open water between themselves and Long Beach Junior Crew, which looks to be in that third place position, followed 
followed by Newport, and then almost in lane order, Oakland Strokes, Los Gatos, Capital Pacific. So we'll keep an eye on those remaining boats. But as it comes down to the last few strokes, keep your eye on lanes one and two. And with Marin, you could see that they that NorCal had overtaken them, and Marin was the first crew to go. They, you saw the emotion punch into what they were doing, and they started to sprint first, which has allowed them to kind of crawl back up in there. And of course, this is U17 men, so they are both going to go at it. You can you can sense, you can feel the adrenaline oozing off of the water right now. You can see some of the guys in the NorCal crew peeking over at Marin. That Marin this is, is the race is, of the day. is coming back at them. It certainly is. It's going to be bow ball to bow ball. Well, NorCal has a tiny advantage right now, but Marin is certainly surging in lane one, and it does. Oh look my like goodness. I'm not going to say a word There's here. No, no words here. It is too close to call. we got to wait for the official results on you, this one. You heard the two beeps that were so close, but who knows which one belonged to which. But look at what the, is. look at what that race up here in lanes one and two did to the rest of the pack. It put a huge amount of distance between uh, Marin and NorCal and everyone else. Long Beach Juniors coming across in third unofficially behind them. Newport in the blue hull. And still Pacific out on the outside has a margin over Oakland Strokes that would be the next crew in there and they it looks like they're going to keep it by a few seats next to oakland strokes is los gatos followed by capital in this field of eight all right and this is so interesting too as all the boats cross the line you don't see any celebration coming out of the marin or norcal <laughs> boat because they probably don't know what happened they don't know exactly who it was also it really hard <laughs> it was really really hard and they're extremely tired but we are going to wait for the official results most likely this is a photo finish review um, that we're going to take a look at you can see what's up on the screen uh, but we'll wait for the official results to post it was always a curiosity uh, curiosity to me was if someone could cheer immediately crossing the finish line, couldn't <laughs> we have gone faster? <laughs> oh my gosh, how are we able to do that? Uh, these boats yeah, are they fast. spent it. They spent it. Men's they under 17 um, with times that are this fast in probably not the fastest conditions. Wow. If you want to stay active and fit these days, you need flexibility. We get it. Active and Fit Now is a new fitness program that gives you options. For one low price per month, you get access to thousands of fitness centers and studios nationwide, so you can easily find your perfect fit. With no long-term contracts, you can switch your gym or cancel anytime. And stay active at home with thousands of workout videos included in your membership. It's super easy to enroll online. Just get active and fit now by going to activeandfitnow.com. Get it? It's in the name. I've like fallen in love with this FLX design. Everyone I put into the boat uh, kind of raves about it, and I've just seen good jumps in speed. The FLX especially, it just feels great as it moves through the water. It's very responsive. It reacts to what you want it to do and runs out really nice in between the strokes. All right, and we are already underway in the next race of the day. This is the Women's Youth B Zlack Rowing Club Cup Final Number One. So this is a final only. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, Holy Names. Lane four, Sagatuck. Lane five, Capital Crew. Lane six, Oakland Strokes. Lane seven, Los Gatos. And lane eight, NorCal Crew. And uh, we'll await coverage to come back with the race call in just a minute.
All right, early on in this race, out of the gates, really quick start here from lanes two, three, and four, Newport, Holy Names, and Sagatuck. Right now, the leader with just about a seat over the rest of the field, and remember, there's eight boats out there, is going to be Newport. Newport coming out of lane two. Closest to them, it's going to be a Holy Names for the third place position, sitting just half a seat above Sagatuck. Marin over in lane one, maybe half a seat down to Sagatuck, and then for positions five, six, seven, and eight, it's going to be Capital Crew, Oakland Strokes, NorCal, and then Los Gatos. But very early on, we're not quite at a thousand meters yet throughout this race, so we'll come back with a race call when we have a little better positioning. All right, coming into, uh, just coming past the long bridge here. It's that second bridge that's on the course. It does look like Newport and Marin, along with Sagatuck being pulled along and uh, Holy Names right there. Those are your top four crews. So we've got two different races kind of going on. We've got those first four lanes and then behind them by open water, your fifth place crew will be Capital right down the center of the field, followed by Oakland Strokes, and then finally NorCal and Los Gatos. But for the lead, it is gonna come out of lane two. That is Newport. Newport right now with the lead over Marin and Sagatuck. Holy Names slipping back to fourth. All right, and as we come towards the beach and get into the tent area, it is Newport right now. They've got open water behind them. It's Marin, Marin having clawed their way back into contention and moving right now, but Newport with open water. We've got Marin in the second place position, challenged most closely by Sagatuck. Back to them, by, back to Sagatuck by a bit of open water. It is Holy Names in the fourth place position. And then we move to the inside, Capital Crew in fifth. Oakland Strokes in sixth, and then NorCal Los Gatos for seventh and eighth. But keep an eye on Newport. What a great race for them as they continue to inch forward and take this race by storm with a great start. And they really, in some ways, have led almost wire to wire, but continuing to not get rattled by the other seven crews that are chasing them down. Newport doing a nice job as we come into the final strokes. But between Marin and Sagatuck, who's gonna take that second or third place position? We'll keep an eye on lanes four and one towards the line. But right now, it is Newport holding on to that lead position. And Newport certainly found something in this race, whether it was an efficiency, and you know, something that they did in their race plan, it certainly paid off for them by taking open water, definitely clear water over Marin, who answered that call of Sagatok. Sagatok did a lot, valiant effort in the middle of the race, but Marin saw it, and you could just see the energy that was left in the Marin hull to be, make sure that they stayed ahead of Sagatok in third place. Over Holy Names next to them with Capital on the outside, on the opposite side. Way on the outside, NorCal in the blue hole after them, followed by uh, Oakland Strokes and then Los Gatos. So great race from start to finish out of Newport. They, there was a quick start by those two inside crews, and then they just inched away from there until it was too much, and they had open water and then just maintained it all the way across the line. That was the first level final. That was the Women's Youth B uh, Zlack Rowing Club. Zlack Rowing Club Cup, final one.
and just getting underway at the top of the course is the men's youth B Jean Jessup Hervey Cup. This is the final one, medal on the line here and trophy on the line here for another eight boat final looking to be, I'm sure, another tight one as all crews are still well within contact as we're only about 30 seconds into this race as you might expect. But again, lots of crews already jockeying for the lead all the way across these lanes. As So let me set it for you before we begin to tell you what's unraveling on the course. And lane one is Marin. Lane two is Newport. Lane three is Sagatuck. Lane four, Oakland Strokes. Lane five, another Newport entry here. Lane six, Los Gatos. Lane seven is Pacific. And lane eight, all the way on the outside, is San Diego Rowing Club. Early on as we get into uh, just the first, first half, just passing the first 250 meters of this race course, our early leaders are Marin and Newport, but those two, only a few seats separating those two crews. But after maybe 250 meters or so, those are the two crews that started to separate out from the remaining six that are, are are in this pack but again still very close among those remaining six and once we can see more we will give you more and let you know who is moving where and when but there is speed happening all the way across this race course All right, and as we progress down the course, Marin and Newport out in front. Marin with about four seats over Newport, and then next closest to them would be Lane's uh, would be lane four and six. That would be Oakland Strokes and Los Gatos. So those are your top four crews. Back in the fifth place position, it's going to be Newport B. And then over on the inside, Sagatuck and Pacific, or excuse me, Sagatuck and San Diego Rowing Club closest to each other. And then in the eighth place position, it is Pacific. But Marin now coming out to about a seven seat advantage over Newport. Newport looking for open water over Oakland Strokes. And we do have a quick announcement if you uh, can lend an ear here. It looks like we're missing a trophy. We're putting a call out for the men's F category, men's master's F category. The Orlock trophy seems to be missing. We believe that it w had been returned, but it is not there anymore. So if you have a, uh, the Orlock trophy, if you can please return it to the finish line tent, that would be great. Thank you. Or to the trophy area. As you can see from that previous shot that Marin and Newport were still out our leaders, but out in lanes five and six, Newport's B entry here in this event and Los Gatos, who had maintained uh, the uh, fourth place position off of that early portion of the race. Those are the two crews that are kind of trading Dukes at this point. They are trading, trading strokes and bow balls to push themselves back up to see if those two crews, now Newport, who was out of the top four, is looking to find a place in the top four. So for Newport to have just won the women on the women's side and then to come out here with two uh, two boats in this on the men's side for this cup trophy to have two crews that are vying for the top four here that shows a lot of strength across the both sides for that program yeah both really big programs of course with Newport um, boasting hundreds of kids that go through that program same thing with Marin with Oakland Strokes um, just you know really really big programs but right now Marin doing a nice job out again uh, lane one right up against the shoreline looks to me as if they might have a bit of broken uh, of open water and bro broken free of Newport Newport looking at a challenge from Oakland Strokes but Oakland Strokes just not quite able to stay in contact with Newport fourth place does does continue to be Sagatuck, but with a challenge by Newport B. Newport B doing a nice job here over in lane five. Closest to them would be Los Gatos, so we'll keep an eye on the Newport B and Los Gatos uh, battle for placement. And then San Diego Rowing Club from lane eight, they are in the seventh place position, and then Pacific in eighth. 
And as to be expected, that third 500 was a deciding factor because Marin and Newport had pretty close contact early on in the race. But ever since then, Marin has walked out uh, utilizing their efficiency and their strength relative to their neighboring crew there in lane two of Newport. And they are extending their lead, which will give them a, just a hair of comfort um, as they rev up for their sprint. We've seen a lot of good sprints out of all of their crews so far. And keep an eye out on the water and see if you as a spectator can eyeball which crews sprint sooner? Can you notice if their stroke rates go up? Can you notice who has more energy? Look at the body language of the athletes and see if they're doing it together. Can you spot that as we do here in the, well, I would say tower, but we're not in a tower as we're here on the shoreline as well. Newport's still well clear now. You can see that energy carrying them well ahead of, uh, sorry, excuse me, we're in well ahead of Newport here on that inside lane in the black hall and then two lanes over still maintaining their position. Oakland Strokes, who was also one of our earlier, uh, they weren't one of our earlier leaders or they were one of our earlier leaders have maintained their third place position and Sagatuck has they put themselves up there they were also among the the they were not among the top four early on but they certainly are now but it is clear water for Marin over Newport who has clear water over Oakland Strokes who has a little bit of clear water even though Sagatuck wants to take it back they will come across with clear water over Sagatuck who has almost a length of open water over Newport's B entry who almost broke free of Los Gatos with San Diego Rowing Club in the red hole on the far side ahead of Pacific. So nearly a length separating each one of those places as they came across. That's between two and three seconds, depending on the speed of the hole from uh, place to place to place. In this uh, men's youth B, Jean Jessup Hervey Cup final one. So a trophy and a medal on the line there. And it was Marin who will be taking that home this year unofficially. All right, and coming up, this is a B-level final for the Women's Youth Cup. But again, we have eight boats on the course, so it is sure to be a good one. There's no trof trophy or medals on the line here, um, but a lot of pride and then placement. Placement and um, how you can compare against the other crews that have raced today. So in lane one, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane two, NorCal Crew. Lane three, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane four, Sammamish. Lane 5, Mount Baker. Lane 6, Pacific Rowing Club. Lane 7, TBC Racing. And Lane 8, Texas Rowing Center. So crews good off the line, past the breakage point. They're still in their high rating portion of the, of the race, and they're about to settle down into their base rate. But still a lot of high strokes and a lot of contact between crews. All right, and just a quick update from the course. In this tightly packed field, we've got all boats still within contact to each other, a lot of overlap, but what is clear is that Marina Aquatic Center has jumped out to a lead. They are crossing over 500 meters gone first. So Marina Aquatic Center rowing out of lane three. They are looking at a full boat length advantage over San Diego Rowing Club and NorCal Crew in lanes one and two. Next closest crew to them is going to be all the way over in lane eight. That is Texas Rowing Center. So that is your fourth place boat. And then we're going to move back inside to Sammamish. Sammamish currently occupying the fifth place position. And then just still shaking out between Mount Baker, Pacific, 
and TBC Racing. Slight advantage going to uh, t to Pacific for the uh, sixth place spot. But back to the leader, Marina Aquatic Center, looking to have a substantial race here and make a statement against all of these crews. We've got a couple of Northwest crews with Sammamish and Mount Baker. We've got TBC Racing, that's all the way from Washington, D.C., and then, of course, Texas Rowing Center from Austin. So this is really great cross-regional racing and a great way to test your speed. And early on out of the start, there were several crews there that seemed to have some great pieces of their start sequences. So Marina showed some speed early, San Diego showed speed early, Texas showed speed early, and all those things are paying off now. Interestingly enough, NorCal wasn't one of the original crews that jumped out but they're certainly pacing San Diego Rowing Club there and and uh, you can just see ever so slightly that their bow ball is taking literally like an inch, literally an inch <laughs> uh, per stroke and so it's allowing them to pace and maybe just eat into the pace of what San Diego Rowing Club is doing to them so they're in lane two moving quite nicely uh, by virtue of being next to Marina Aquatic Center they're in touch with the fastest speed that's on the course right now so that coxswain is intimately aware of the speed that they need to put them in a position that they want to be in to come across the line among the top three and Texas Rowing Center all the way out here on this other side, kind of in no man's land because they have not quite dropped all the crews that are next to them, but Sammamish Mount Baker, Pacific, TBC, they're well behind what Texas is doing. So for that coxswain to stay aware of the inside three lanes from lane eight is quite the job that that uh, young athlete has in store for them. But again, stay internal so that you can lay your best speed out on the course. And then when you get down to that, you know, last three, 400 meters, that's when you really uh, got to let the crew what's know what's going on and then go, okay, let's relay this. We can do this in this many strokes. We can take this much speed, this and much distance back on them. That's right. And Marina Aquatic Center, um, always a very solid, deep program. Um, they have done a really nice job throughout this piece, just putting it all on the line. I think that's what you have to do when you have a packed field like this with so many strong uh, so many strong boats and this is a b-level final i mean i'm looking at the uh, who the crews are out here and it's it's tough it's tough no matter what so wanting to get yourself out early wanting to hold on to that top spot marina doing a really nice job um, trying to do that and hold off san diego holding off norcal and then all the way across in texas rowing center All right, so as we come a little bit further down the course, we're going to take a look out with our eagle eye and get a little bit better placement for you. So Marina has held on to that top spot, but they are being challenged mightily now by NorCal and San Diego. It's almost a three-boat race up front between those top boats, San Diego, NorCal, Marina. So if you are on the beach, get down there. This is going to be a race to watch all the way to the finish line as it is bow ball to bow ball for those top three boats. Back to them by a little bit of open water. It's going to be Sammamish Rowing Association, and then we've got a good amount of open water back to the remaining crews. But right now, take a look. Marina, NorCal, San Diego, really close here between those boats. Hmm? Texas is way... And it was NorCal with that patience through the middle, and they did. They were inching, inching, stroke by stroke, uh, to keep them in, or uh, to keep them in contact with what was going on on either side of them. Uh, as as they are now looking like they are in the lead, you can see a little bit of energy coming. Okay, it looks like Marina Aquatic Center is the crew that started to sprint a little bit early. They owned so much of that race that they do not want to give it up. Maybe it was the start of that third, five, or fourth, five hundred that got a hold of them. But now that they can smell the finish line, you can see them just trying to rev it up. And and you can also see the energy coming out of NorCal because after they overtook the lead, they also do not want to give it back up. And here comes San Diego Rowing Club as well in that red hull. They are moving to the water a little bit more quickly, and it is allowing the boat to slide out a little bit. But that is as that pushes NorCal, they are still our leaders currently as the line is fast approaching, even though they are hotly contested by Marina and now San Diego as well. Those three crews, as they sprint together, are separating themselves from the rest of the field. Texas was up there with them, but Texas has just fallen off, and they are doing...
duking it out with Sammamish, and it's very tight between Texas and Sammamish. And I will certainly not call that everything we say, of course, is unofficial. Unofficial. <laughs> but from, as the I would say, NorCal is the crew that was able to come across a few seats ahead of the two crews flanking them, San Diego and Marina. But it was certainly yes. close among them. And look at the three boats that came across between Mount Baker, Pacific, and TBC. That ended up being a race in and of itself as well with potentially Pacific coming on ahead of Mount Baker and TBC. Those are going to be some close times among those races within this race. Yeah, and early, um, an early look at the times does say that Texas Rowing Center took that fourth place spot just by a tenth of a second over Sammamish. Um, so we will, again, await the official results, but it was close. And a quick announcement here. We have two lost credit cards. So Hannah Hajibi, we have your credit card. Uh, come on up to the finish line tent. And then Nikhil Ramaraju, Nikhil and Hannah, if you are at the Crew Classic and you're looking for a credit card, um, then come on up and we will got to show some ID and then we'll hand those off to you guys. At WinTech and King Racing, we are passionate about rowing. It empowers individuals, teaches them unshakable discipline, and gives all who endure its trials the strength to take on the world. However, rowing still struggles with broad accessibility. WinTech seeks to break down these barriers by making affordable shells for elite athletes, recreational rowers, and everyone in between. WinTech, fair price, unfair advantage. And as we come back to racing, we are already underway in the men's youth San Diego Rowing Cup. This is your second level of final. Uh, let's set the field for you before we give you any updates. It's lane one is Marina Aquatic Center. Lane two, Mount Baker. Lane three is Newport Sea Base. Lane four, Long Beach Juniors. Lane five is Sammamish Rowing Association. And lane six is Cathedral Catholic. Okay, in the early part of this race, it does look like lane three, Newport Sea Base has pushed their nose out in front, uh, but just barely again. There's a lot of overlap here in this race. We're looking also at a good start here by Marina Aquatic Center, as well as uh, Sammamish Rowing Association. So Sammamish with a nice start um, and being challenged though by Mount Baker. So top four crews right there. And then we'll move back to Long Beach Juniors and Cathedral Catholic to round out this Youth Cup, Youth San Diego Rowing Cup final. This is a B-level final. And again, just as we saw in the previous race with the girls, just as competitive as a grand final.
And in this early portion, the first half of the race, you know, it is uh, Newport Sea Base that went out to an early lead, and they have slipped to almost a length on the rest of the field. But as the finish line, Marina Aquatic can smell it. As that finish line gets closer and closer, they are looking to inch back into that lead that Newport Sea Base had. Uh, the three boats that trail Newport Sea Base are Marina Aquatic and Mount Baker and Sammamish, and there is very little to be determined between those th three crews. So as they come into the sprint portion of this race, it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun one. The Coxons are going to have some fun with this because they're going to have to make the decision on the fly if they need to sprint a little bit early. As you can see, another one of those flags tick by. We aren't quite into the last 500 meters yet, but you are certainly well deep into the race. Their lungs are burning. Their legs are burning. If their rate is over 32, 33, 34, their lungs are certainly burning at this point, and you probably aren't thinking that much. You can't, you can't, can't, you don't have the mental acuity at this point as a rower. You are just listening and letting your body flow with what you got. And right now, it is the two crews out of Washington, Mount Baker and some Mamish, who are the closest as Marina Aquatic fell off in that third 500 from their pace, but neither crew has been able to take anything back on Newport Sea Base. They still have the better part of a length. Yeah, Newport Sea Base, you can see that stern deck just pushing forward, inching away from Mount Baker. Mount Baker really making probably the biggest threat to them as they come into the final strokes here along the shoreline. But Newport Sea Base doing a nice job asking for open water. Are they going to get it by that finish line, that coxswain looking across her port oars and asking for that open water lead by the finish line? Newport Sea Base holding on to that top spot with Mount Baker chasing off to the lane five, it's going to be Sammamish as your third place spot with Mount Marina Aquatic Center in fourth, and then Cathedral Catholic High School and Long Beach Junior Crew. But take a look here, Newport Sea Base trying to get that open water lead by the line. That is a source of pride. Can you break free and just barely? Still looks like they had a bit of a little overlap. bit of overlap there with Mount Baker. Uh, followed by Sammamish over on the outside and Marina Aquatic on the inside with Long Beach Juniors and Cathedral Catholic rounding out the field here. You know, one thing I love to see when I look out over the water and I'm looking for sprints to happen is that even as you get fatigued, that these athletes have the maturity not to let their bodies fall forward. They're staying stacked on their seats, which is allowing their blades to be more effective in the long run, which is helping the hull scoot right along as the rate continues to come up. So those are great technical adjustments by these young athletes out on the water. Yeah, well done in these young, uh, these young boats here with the men's youth eights. All right, and we are underway in the next event. This is a B-level final for the Women's Under-17 Referee Cup, the LA-84 Foundation Trophy. So with three crews on the water, we've got Holy Names in lane one, Marina Aquatic Center in lane two, and Cathedral Catholic High School in lane three. And already the boat from Marina Aquatic Center in lane two asserting itself in the lead, but just behind them, Holy Names, again, still super early on here, not quite 250 meters gone and then Cathedral Catholic High School in the third place position. And we have one quick announcement for you out um, if you are an athlete or a spectator, Derek Yang from Wichita Collegiate School. Derek, we've got 
your uh, wallet, your entire wallet. So, um, oh, yep, Kansas. If you're from Kansas and you're out here in sunny San Diego, come and get your wallet. We've got it at the finish line tent for you. Derek. And as we get into the second 500 here of the Women's Under-17 Referee Cup, the LA84 Foundation Trophy, the second level final, the early leaders were Marina Aquatic Center with that quicker start. But as we've gotten into the meat of the race here, uh, Holy Names has retaken the lead, and you can just see how they're pushing the boat along. You're getting a little bit more run out of it. So as they get through the 750-meter mark, they are almost clear water ahead of Marina Aquatic Center. And so if I were that coxswain in that Marina Aquatic Center hall, which, again, never been a coxswain before, but if I were there, or I were the rower I would want to have a moment of, of technical collection let's figure out what can make us a little more efficient maybe coach have you get him in the back pocket uh, to make that correction mid-race make it on the fly that's one of those things I had a trainer when I was in college who actually thought okay who takes turns when when do you take the break in the race no there is no halftime in this you have to make all of your adjustments on the fly it happens in the moment so I know as a rower I'm kind of allowed to let my brain dump out of my ear but the only, I can only imagine what the pressure is like as a coxswain to not be able to let your brain no. dump out of your ear with all of that pressure to make those those uh, those calls in the middle of a race as it happens and the word break does not enter into any uh, scenario and not at all we do not take so. turns <laughs> <laughs> yep and you and you've got to be sharp you've got to be sharp on every stroke um, it is a long weekend to come out to a you know a full weekend regatta now extended out over three days um, there's a lot of travel for some of these kids so it's really um, something that where they can learn about how to control their energy systems how to get enough rest how to eat right Sleep, 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 <laughs> sleep, 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 and how to be on when you need to be on. So right now, Holy Names doing a great job rowing out of lane one. Marietta Aquatic Center behind them. And then Cathedral Catholic, we've mentioned it before, but they are a scholastic program here in the San Diego area. Uh, started not too long ago, maybe about um, 10 years ago. So uh, running a scholastic program, very different from running a club program because the talent that you have is limited to that school. Um, but Cathedral Catholic doing a really nice job over the many categories of boats that they race throughout the season.
And here we are in the final strokes of the Women's Under-17 Referee Cup LA84 Foundation Trophy, the second level final here. On the inside lane, it is Holy Names coming down to their last couple of strokes of the race over Marina Aquatic Center, over who is going to come in over Cathedral Catholic School. Holy Names doing a nice job keeping their cool, even though Marina Aquatic had a lead on them very early on in this race. They clearly uh, did not let that get to them as they were able to row their way to this open water win in this second level final. And finishing here is Cathedral Catholic High School. This is the B final from the Women's Under 17 Referee Cup Foundation Trophy. All right, and we are already on the course with the next race. We've got three more races here to close out the 50th running of the San Diego Crew Classic. And the next three races are uh, second level finals. So we're looking right now at the men's under 17 cup. We've just got three boats on the water in this B-level final in lane one, Marina Aquatic Center, lane two, Texas Rowing Center, and lane three, San Diego Rowing Club. All right, I thought my microphone was on, so I was I was speaking, but uh, I don't think anyone heard me. So we are well underway here in the men's under 17 cup. This is final number two. We've just got the two boats, excuse me, three boats on the course. We've got Marina Aquatic Center in lane one, 
Texas Rowing Center in lane two, and then San Diego Rowing Club in lane three. And it's been pretty tight all the way from here. It's about 750 meters gone on your screen between Marina Aquatic Center and Texas Rowing Center. Texas right there in the center. And then just a little bit off the back by open water, it will be San Diego Rowing Club to round out this field. But right now, dual race going on up front between Marina and Texas. All right, and these crews coming along to the shoreline, wrapping up this race in the men's under 17-8. This is a B-level final just with those three boats on the course. It was Marina Aquatic Center and Texas right next to each other for a good majority of this race. But then with about 700 meters to go, Texas Rowing Center just kind of took off and they now have an open water lead over Marina, San Diego Rowing Club back by a bit of open water to knock off that third place spot. But here they come the boys from Texas to come across the line with the win in this B final. And now Marina with San Diego chasing. And just now getting underway here, just a little bit uh, here early it seems, is our next race, second to last race of this long, this wonderful weekend here in San Diego for the 50th annual San Diego Crew Classic out here on Mission Bay is the Women's Youth B Zlack Rowing Club Cup. This is the second level final. It's a full field, a full course full of boats with eight boats, all eight lanes filled here, starting on the inside closest to the beach, nearest the shore to the spectators in lane one is Newport. Lane two, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane three, Texas Rowing Center. Lane four, Holy Names. Lane five, Pacific. 
Lane six is Mount Baker, lane seven, Marina Aquatic Center, and in lane eight, rounding out the field of eight here is River City. We are just about one minute down, which is just over 250 meters. You can see that black flag just passed. All crews are past that. So we are well clear of breakage or anything like that. We haven't had too many issues with that this whole weekend. And as we get into 20, 30, 40 strokes down in the race, on the inside lanes, Newport and San Diego Rowing Club are the crews that are, you know, just nudging out just a little bit, but still tons of contact all the way across the field. So kind of a little bit of a similar stagger, maybe quarter length between the three leaders currently of Newport, San Diego, and Texas Rowing Center. Yeah, San Diego really had the best start of all of these eight crews, uh, but they have been... Uh, knocked out of that top position by Newport. Newport may be a little bit more patient, not uh, as explosive off of the line, and they have come up to take the top spot over San Diego. San Diego is sitting a few seats right now over Texas Rowing Center, who is occupying the third place position. We're going to keep our eye out for River City. River City on the far outside, excuse me, um, that would be Marina Aquatic Center in also one of the far outside lanes, lane seven, to take over that fourth place position. Um, and Marina sitting just in front of Pacific, Pacific in, um, excuse me, yep, I'm going to, um, I'm going to make a correction on that Marina Aquatic Center just in front of Holy Names, so Holy Names in the fifth place position. So we're now getting into two different kind of races going on. We've got the race up front with the top three boats, Newport, San Diego, Texas in that order, and then we have a tightly packed field of five with Marina leading the charge for those other five boats. And just as you mentioned, Holy Names and Marina, S Marina Aquatic Center, those two crews seem to be pacing one another as who wanted to be, you know, fourth place between fourth and fifth and kind of trading there. And if you look, it's a little bit of a diagonal on the buoy line here and Marina Aquatic Center out in that far over on the other side lane, lane seven, uh, has just taken a few seats over Holy Names. We have seen Holy Names come through in the middle, middle portion of these races. So under similar training, will they have the same effect coming down where they can then and come back into that lead that Marina Aquatic Center has taken on them. But as I'm speaking, Pacific uh, right next to Holy Names is nudging up on them and bringing Mount Baker along with them. So there's an interesting race unraveling through lanes four, five, six, and seven there between Holy Names, Pacific Mount Baker, and Marina Aquatic Center. So over the next couple of minutes where the fatigue starts to set in that starts to call to question your technical, technical dexterity, uh, that will probably be the deciding factor here between those four crews because we are deep enough into this race that you may have uh, expected to see some sort of separation occur at that point where it would be a fatigue thing but more than just fatigue alone can you maintain your your technique even under fatigue you know one of the things that i've been thinking about all weekend as we've watched the junior racing is these different categories which are still um a, a little bit new right we used to have the varsity eight we'd have a 2v8 a 3v8 novice mm. you know etc and now we have these age categories Lindsay, uh, having having uh, worked at youth nationals last year and seeing all the different range of age categories what do you think that that ha what kind of effect do you think that has on a team in terms of how they choose their boatings so this is a youth b um, that means it, it could be a variety of kids of different ages um, in the boat, but mm -hmm. you know how you categorize it in terms of ranking on a team, kind of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, in turn, in uh, when I first started coaching juniors more than 10 years ago now at this point, uh, I had never been confronted with a team meeting at the beginning of the year where the coaches sat down and said, okay, what are we going to prioritize this year? And I thought, <laughs> well, isn't that odd? At this I don't even know the team yet. I haven't seen anyone, so why are we talking about these age category things yet you know rather than looking at it that way you know let speed shake itself out but something that you just made me think about in asking that question was isn't it interesting that we're inserting age categories at the youth level but taking them away at the collegiate level true right so it's an inverse relationship mm -hmm. because we see the benefits of it you know leading into college but then what do you do with it because you know, you have the opportunity to allow people to develop rather than forcing them up. I know when I was younger and I was swimming, I would always race up because we had gaps in the lineup. Um, but uh, again, that option is there. It's not as if you have to race in your category and that's it. You can race in the varsity if you're old enough. But um, as far as age categories go, it does uh, allow athletes to develop carefully over, you know, over time. 
see where they stand against people of similar ages and potentially um, stages of growth and maturation. Yeah, and I think that's maybe what, what it is at the junior level is that it's a maturity thing and, you know, um, a 15 year old does not necessarily equal an 18 year old, <laughs> especially with the yes. growth that is happening. I may be six feet <laughs> tall, but I am still 12. Yes, but I am a baby that was giraffe. Me. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. That was me. Yeah. All right. So coming up into the spectator area, this is our last uh, final with eight boats across. So this is just really a hallmark of being able of this venue being able to host this number of boats side by side. And we've got Newport with an open water lead and a tight race here between San Diego Rowing Club and Texas for that second or third place spot. Behind them, it will be Holy Names and then pretty tightly packed still uh, between Pacific, Mount Baker, Marina, and River City. I got to say, here we are, this last eight-boat final of this long weekend, and I think I'm hearing the most cheers of, of all weekend. Well, so this is thank a good you for being on the beach yeah. and yelling for these athletes that are out on the water right now because there is some fantastic so racing happening a good representation of clubs that are down here in this um, in this final and here comes Newport they've had a really great regatta um, and has seen some nice victories this weekend but here they are looking good and San Diego surging they that don't want Texas to come across ahead of them that red hole is also feeling what's happening in the blue boat in lane one so lane two of San Diego rowing club maybe an inch over Texas but Texas doesn't want to give it up so it will come down to the line just stay clean it's not who's going more at this point it's going to be who stays clean and it does look like San Diego go rowing club took a few feet back over texas in the last few strokes which they certainly did and by feet now it seems of course with angles changing but no that was actually surge of the hole and not just angles out on the far side next to them holy names did a good job through the middle to stay up in it but they are just shy of mount baker but that is going to be almost dead coming across the line and by Mount Baker, yes, by Mount Pacific. Baker, I mean Pacific. Mm -hmm. And then Mount Baker behind Pacific from there. But three very close crews there, Marina Aquatic Center after them, followed by River City on the outside. But between Holy Names and Pacific, that was too close for either of us to call. Yeah. And Mount Baker was a few seats shy of those two crews coming across the line. Well, eight boats coming in just, you know, a mere seconds apart from each other. Um, that is what's really fun to see out here. And again, early on, a lot of these crews are going to see each other again as we progress through the season. Um, but for the Northwest crews, the crew from Texas, um, they won't see each other again and, unless they make it to youth nationals. You One know, more race up on the course, and that is the men's youth B, the Gene Jessup Harvey Cup uh, final number two. We will have four boats on the course, and we'll be back with the race call in just a minute. You know, Adrian, we've uh, talked about opportunity, practice, use your racing. We talked about those things this weekend, but uh, one thing that we... is that a, a, an old uh, co-worker of mine, I loved it, it was the first time I'd ever heard someone, I'm sure maybe she got it from somewhere was, and I believe it was a coach of hers that she got it from was, don't leave it in the hands of the judges. And when you race a mile and a quarter, and sometimes these races come down to boop boop, or simultaneous crossing of the finish line, it comes down to stretching out those photo finishes, never leave it in the, line in the hands of the judges. Get it done early on, get it done in the middle, because you don't want it coming down to the finish line. But sometimes, even leave when you get it, it no done question. in all the parts, yep. <laughs> it still comes down to that that bow ball, you know, simultaneous horns. That's right. So. Leave no question and make your mark early. Yes. All right, last race of the day. This is the closeout of the San Diego Crew Classic. We have had a blast watching all of these crews, junior, master, collegiate, um, so much fun. Para-athletes, para -athletes, racing, absolutely. mixed Three inclusions. Yeah. Yeah, super fun weekend with just a absolutely stellar weather. Yeah. It's a, a lot of what people look forward to when they come out uh, to the Crew Classic, and it definitely delivered. And as we get going here, we are already underway in the next race, which is the last race, Adrian, as you already mentioned, is the Men's Youth B Gene Jessup Hervey Cup. This is your second level final with four boats in the field. Marina Aquatic Center, kind of the early jump here. But before we get ahead of ourselves in lane one, it is NorCal Crew. In lane two is Newport Sea Base, lane three, Marina Aquatic and lane four is Cathedral Catholic. All crews that you know come out from this this coast to maybe see each mm -hmm. other throughout the season. Who knows who races one another uh, for fun scrimmages? You know, meet up meets up at different places. But as of right now, early on in this race, Marina Aquatic Center has uh, extended themselves off of their start as they just about cross into the middle portion, of, or they are into the middle portion of this race, almost a length 
But as I say that, of course, the fatigue starts to wear. And on the inside lanes, NorCal and Newport Sea Base are looking to inch their way back, NorCal in particular, um, as they uh, take more strokes down the course. And you know what? I say that again, and Newport Sea Base and is about to pull <laughs> even. <laughs> and there's some change up there. And there's a lot that can be said for the adrenaline that you feel right off of the start line. So that can really carry you far. But then, man, do you pay for it in that third 500. So consistency is super important. Uh, making sure that you dial in your energy levels so that you can stay consistent throughout the length of this piece. A mile and a quarter is a pretty long way, as you know. <laughs> feels short sometimes, but sometimes <laughs> it feels like it, it goes on forever. You know, and that's that's where the coxswains, you know, what what separates the coxswains? Who, what makes a good coxswain? First of all, logistics. Drive straight, keep us in order, all those things. Safety first, always, hands down. But the coxswains that can convince you that you have more when you are done, I, I my brain would go out, my I would literally not be able to think a thing. You hear, you know the start, yep. and then brain, all of a sudden you're at the thousand, oh, what just happened? But I, you know, being, having, I remember having a coxswain insert one time, you know, this is all I need right now. They don't know we have another gear. And I thought, well, I, I, oh, okay, I have another gear. I didn't realize <laughs> Thank that. Thank you for telling me. I wasn't <laughs> okay, I believe I you. <laughs> but for some reason, I believed in that moment that that was true, even though I knew exactly how I felt yep. <laughs> as intimately acquainted with that. So maybe that could be something that these coxswains are getting inside the heads of these young guys as they come down the course. And and Marina Aquatic Center doing a good job. They have held on to that lead. And we're looking at the shoreline there with the white tents and uh, the adoring fans on the shoreline. They have done a really nice job continuing to hold off a push by NorCal. NorCal now overtaking Newport Sea Base for that second place position, but fighting really, really hard to kind of push into Marina Aquatic Center's lead. Cathedral Catholic still continuing in fourth, but love to hear the cheers right now as Marina wraps up this race, rowing out of lane three with a good solid boat length lead coming into their final strokes, but being pushed by NorCal being pushed by Newport Sea Base. And get out here, if you know, whether you know anyone in these boats or not, help close out the San Diego Crew Classic, the 50th annual San Diego Crew Classic with some cheers for these young guys. Look at that late surge by Newport Sea Base closing in on what Marina Aquatic Center had taken. Less than a half a length there separating first to second and then second to third. Great sprints by those three crews. Cathedral Catholic rounding out the field here for our final race of this now three-day event here on Mission Bay. The Men's Youth B Jean Jessup Hervey Cup final, the second level final here. That was some junior racing, still a lot more junior racing occurring this weekend or this weekend, this spring <laughs> through the this summer. Weekend, <laughs> <laughs> but these were certainly fantastic steps for all crews that came all this way, whether high school, whether collegiate, whether masters uh, and beyond well on up because we know that there were also national team athletes, uh, retired national team athletes, national team hopefuls out there as well, a lot of alumni, all sorts of fantastic cross-section of athletes That's out on right. the water this weekend. From across the world. So across thank world. you so much for coming down to support. We'd love to thank the referees, the officials, the organizers, moms and dads, um, whoever is flying their helicopter overhead to take a closer <laughs> look at the timing. crew classic. Yes. Um, <laughs> safe travels, and we'll see you next year. And the referees, volunteers, everyone that's out here to make this event happen, the organizers, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for spending the weekend with me in the booth. <laughs>